Hmm. Hey guys, what's up? How's it going? Uh, welcome to the final Ruby Volume 4 livestream discussion uh, for Chapter 12. Just started the stream, so just give me a second. I need to make sure everyone's in and everyone can hear and see me. Can you guys hear me and see me? How's the quality? Let me know. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Aurora Blue, how's it going? Welcome back, Bio Craft Hero. I always want to say Bio Frost Hero for some reason. Thanks for joining, Michael, Dan. Oh my god, the chat's going super fast and it's in slow chat too. Oh, your first live stream, Daniel. I hope you enjoy it. Thank you very much for joining, everybody. <laughs> yeah, I quit. <laughs> Well, imagine what it would be like if slow chat was off, you know what I mean? Like, I wouldn't even be able to see how long is how long will you be streaming. I'll get to that in a second. Um, wow. Oh, my God. Oh, Barely Bacon. That's a funny username. Thank you for joining. It's your first stream. Well, I hope you enjoy. Um, first and foremost, I, I want to say before anything... Um, like, thank you guys all for, 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 like, the support of Volume 4, for the streams, for the reactions, and for everything, because this is, unfortunately, the last live stream discussion that I'm going to be doing for Ruby, of course, until Volume 5 comes back around, but, um, again, whether this is your first time joining, or whether you've been around, uh, for, you know, uh, a variety of the live stream discussions, or whether if, if I'd be surprised if some of you guys were here for all twelve of them. Uh, I do appreciate it, and I do appreciate the support and everything. And we have a lot to unpack and talk about. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's um. <laughs> Is it over? What did I miss? Start over? No, we are just starting. Actually, I just went live. Yeah, I um. It's going to be a lot. It's extremely bittersweet. Like, I, I didn't even... I almost wanted to put off doing the live stream again because it's like... I don't want it to end, you know? Like, the episode's out. My reaction's already done. I'm waiting till Saturday to put that up. And then... And then what? You know what I mean? Like... <sighs> yeah, this chat is pretty insane. <laughs> yeah, Muffin Man, you're in the wrong, <laughs> wrong volume, bro. Every time you stream, slow chat becomes invalid, pretty much. But it's incredible, it's crazy, because I already have 414 viewers, and we're not even three minutes in, so... Um, <laughs> I can only imagine what we're going to peek at for this episode, for this chapter discussion. Because it's the finale, you know what I mean? It's like, it's the last bit of Ruby canon, or Ruby proper, that we're going to get until the fall, or until RTX, or until they start promoting Ruby again. And, uh, it's like, like I said, it's really bittersweet that, uh, you know, like, I, like, where did the time go, you know, October, I, I, I remember, like, the week following Volume 4 starting, like, we got the character short, we got all four of the World of Remnants, um, you know, and, and then the first episode, like, I was so overwhelmed, like, with emotion, because it was like, we're finally back, and now it's ending, so, it's, it's, uh, it's, I'm, I'm just gonna miss it, you know, I'm really gonna miss this i'm gonna miss like the engagement i'm gonna i'm so glad that i did this this year because so many people liked it that i'm definitely gonna be following up and doing this next year with live stream discussions hopefully being a lot more consistent actually doing them on sundays but as the volumes got further and further i had a few issues in between too so i can't really say that things went in my favor when it come when it came to like setting these up and everything but uh i'm just glad that i've done so much more than i did last year like last year i just did reactions this year i did uh, news and information videos, I did uh, reactions, I did these live stream discussions, uh, I'm doing a bit more of the uh, of my Ruby shorts, like I did a, I did my first play of the game with, with Tyrion as Reaper, I have, an, I have a few more of the, uh, the Ruby short videos that I'm definitely going to be doing during the off season between now and Ruby Chibi. Uh, I mentioned to people on Twitter, and I briefly mentioned it in the last discussion, but for those of you who are wondering, uh, I will be returning to Red vs. Blue Season 4 in March. That is definitely something that I'm going to be doing and transitioning from Ruby to RVB. Uh, I'm also going to be streaming a lot more. Uh, the difference is now with streaming, the reason why my streams are so few and far between is because I almost feel compelled that if I'm going to stream, I have to stream for a long time. 
And I talked to a friend of mine, my friend Chris kind of related. He's like, dude, you're a YouTuber first and a streamer second. So what I'm going to do is I'm probably going to do like short burst streams, like streaming for probably one to two hours a day, but streaming every day. So I'll stream five days a week, but those five days a week, I'll only be streaming two hours so I can make progress on my games. I can get consistent with actually streaming on a schedule. And, um, you know, it'll be something live in the moment for people, whether it's me playing Ruby Grim Eclipse or Final Fantasy or Kingdom Hearts or wherever. So, um... I'm just kind of relaying everything else before I get into the discussion on top of that. But uh, that's something that I'm else, else that I'm going to be doing because until until Ruby Chibi in May, which that's not going to be too much of an issue, I'm just going to be doing RVB. So I kind of want to fill that time with other things like streaming and stuff like that. So um, <clears throat> I know Game Explain likes to do hours of two burst streams. Yeah, so I think that's what I'm usually going to do because I remember when I was playing Dark Souls 3, when I was playing Ratchet and Clank, and when I first started playing Final Fantasy, I would always stream for like five, six, seven hours at a time, and then I wouldn't stream again, but I felt like because I did a massive chunk, first off, I didn't know people were going to sit through like six, seven, eight hours worth of streaming like that, and second, I felt like if I was streaming for one or two hours, it was almost like a waste of time, but at the same time, I had the mentality of, I'm not a full-time streamer, I'm just a streamer, I do YouTube for the most part, like that's where all my effort goes into, that's where my audience is, that's where the content that I do on a day-to-day -day basis is, so, um, so I, I definitely have other things planned for RVB, and before anything else, we have 550 people in here, we have 550 people in here, and we've <clears throat> and I've only been streaming for about six minutes. Um, so take that for what it's worth because I haven't even started talking about the episode yet. Yeah, I under I, I, I typically tend to underestimate the internet in terms of its response, like how the internet reacts to certain things or certain people. By the way, I have three bottles of water just because I know I'm about I'm going in during this episode. I, I'm going to be rambling like you've never fucking seen, you've never heard, and I know that that's gonna derail the the idea of trying to get through this episode 27 minutes so the longest live stream discussion that i've ever done on my channel was a dual live stream discussion it was with chapters three and four and that was five hours long i think this episode this episode was uh, give or take like if you if you take out the intro and outro it was about 20 minutes it was about a 20 minute episode so i think and, but there's so much more to discuss, especially speculate based on what's going to happen in the future, especially with the uh, the pre and post credit scenes. So um, I I just feel like this live stream discussion is going to be the longest. Uh, I I typically have like a ballpark range. Like every time I'm like, yeah, I'll be streaming for about two hours or three hours. Never ends up happening. So I'm gonna go big and I'm gonna say this stream will be at least five hours long. Like I'm visualizing it right now, at least five hours. And I don't expect majority of you guys to be here the whole time. I know time zones are different for some of you. I know it's a school night. If you take that into account, my time seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. That means I'm not gonna finish until midnight. So, but that's my ballpark estimate. Like that's my. I hope I finish before that. But if I reach five hours, then that's what you guys can expect. So, um, for those of you who definitely can't join, um, just let me know when you guys are leaving. I can give you guys the time zone, uh, or the timestamp of this video so you can continue back on whenever it goes live on my channel. <clears throat> yeah, Neo. Neo was not in the volume. We didn't see any Neo. We didn't see any other teams, really. Uh, Mercury didn't get any line of dialogue the entire volume. Uh, uh, Emerald got one line of dialogue, uh... You know, it, it was like it was mainly like set up for Team Ruby and Juno uh, and Ranger. Sorry, uh, going into the next volume, it felt very much. It didn't feel exactly like Volume One because Volume One was like an introduction to the series. <clears throat> Excuse me, not just uh, not just an introduction into like the universe, but it was like the first step into the world of Remnant into the show. Volume Four definitely has like I feel like. I know the world of Remnant a lot more because of this volume, you know, I know about the world of Remnant, like, the actual world, the in-betweens of the kingdoms, how, you know, people survive outside of kingdoms' walls and stuff like that, uh, clearly we got a lot of internal development with a lot of the characters and the struggles that they've been dealing with and trying to overcome, Weiss finally left home, Yang is back in, you know, armed and ready and back heading to Mistral to Ruby, uh, Blake seems like she's being a lot more positive of how she's gonna deal with the White Fang, uh, you know, and then Ruby and Ranger made it to Mistral where, you know, 
that's where the, the you know that's where the whole series has led them to try to find a way of stopping whatever conspiracies are going on. So, um, so uh, while I can't understand why, I, while I can understand and sympathize why a lot of people feel like this episode was a, was primarily filler or. Uh, the pacing was really off, or there wasn't much uh, meat in the in the in, in you know in the finale. I I personally enjoy it because I know that this is just a setup for greater things to come, and you have to address stuff like this. You can't just weave like point A to point B, uh, you know, and not bat an eye at like, oh well, what are they doing on their travels, and how are they dealing with the aftermath of Volume Three, and you know, how's Yang dealing with losing her arm, and how's Weiss feeling back at home, and you know, uh, like, everything in between, like, I feel like characterization and development was key this volume, and it was needed because I feel, like, personally, my investment is a lot more grand with the characters now, like, I love Yang so much more, because Yang was, for me, like, whenever someone was like, name your top five characters, I'd give my top five, and I love Yang as a character, I love all the characters, but for me, Yang was missing something, she, she wasn't as, no, I guess, hardened, in, in a sense, um, but the fact of seeing what she went through, and especially seeing her in, oh my god, dude, seeing her in the finale, seeing her outfit, seeing, like, how badass she looks, and she has, like, a new head on her shoulders, and she's, she's out of the muck, she's out of depression, and she's not mopey anymore, and she seems like she's gonna fucking wreck house, uh, in the future, that made me so, that, that made me love, like, that drew so much more appeal to her for me as a character, of, of seeing her be at her lowest and then come back for that. And it wasn't like in the course of a day or a week. It took months and it took a lot of hard work for Tai Yang to kind of bounce her back and for her to realize her potential and the fact that she can do anything she wants, but she has to get out of that state. And I, I, I fucking loved it. I absolutely loved... I, I, I loved the volume. I loved the... I liked the finale for what it presented. I'm not going to sit here and be like, oh, I wish it was this, I wish it was that. Because what they gave me was something that I was very much indulged in from the beginning. So, um, so yeah, uh, I, I absolutely loved it. We're, it seems like we're going to get wind. Oh my god, can you imagine what winter looks like? Like, I wish we saw more characters, mainly for the fact that the new art style, like the new animation style kind of like makes a lot things look a lot better, like way better. And, uh... The scaling in turn, like in terms of the scaling, like Zwei looks so different from pre Volume Four Zwei, like Volume Three and Two, but it's just like it's a way more improved. Like he has a lot more detail on like his coat and stuff like that, and he just looks a lot more lifelike, especially his eyes. So like I, I'm just like fanboying right now just at the thought of seeing all of the characters that we know so far that we just haven't seen yet. Um, we're going back to Mistral, so that means we're gonna see Team Sun. That's where they hail from. Uh, we might see team. Um, we might see team Arburn because they're from Haven as well, and uh, like like Winter will be there. Uh, we'll see a bunch of new characters and stuff like that. We get to see like how the culture is and how people live and thrive there because the the terrain in the area looks a lot way way more like uh, exotic and 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 natural than 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 Haven than I ever thought actually because it like I never thought like holy shit like this is where they live. It looks incredible. Just joined Tom Hawkins. No, uh, you're right on time, actually. Uh, I've only been streaming for about 13 minutes. Uh, I've dedicated the first 15 minutes or so to people joining the stream, kind of relaying a few different things. If you're joining right now, uh, very upset, very saddened by the fact that this is the last live stream discussion. Uh, very optimistic that I'm going to be getting back into Red vs. Blue in March. I'm going to be doing some mini streams here and there on my Twitch channel. Uh, for those of you who don't know, twitch.tv slash murderofbirds is where I do my streams. I did a full stream of Ruby Grim Eclipse over there, which I will be bringing to YouTube. Uh, I'm going to be streaming Final Fantasy XV again, finishing that up. And then in April, I'm going to be doing all of the Kingdom Hearts games collectively um, in order of when they came out and then putting that on my channel because I know a lot of people want me to get into Kingdom Hearts I'm a huge fan of it uh, and a lot of people on my channel either have never played all of the games or they've never heard of it or they've never played it themselves so I have a lot of things in the future planned it's just sad that I have to close the you know close the book on the next on you know the final chapter of Ruby until uh, volume 5 but we're, we're also going to get Chibi in May so I'm not too disheartened by the fact that we just have to say goodbye right now um, actually not even goodbye, we're just saying see you later, pretty much. Um, hey, what's up, church? How's it going? <laughs> uh, 
Dude, thank you for commenting on, like, all of my videos. Um, Church in particular, just because I, I noted, like, Church is my favorite character in Red vs. Blue, and every time I see your comments in my videos, I always think, I can't wait to see Church again in, in, in Red vs. Blue, because he came back, he came back from, like, the, the, the future jump, like, he jumped to the future with them, so I think it was super cool. Wait, no, actually, it wasn't, uh, they actually somehow managed to get back to Blood Gulch, somehow like they were traveling through the tunnels and and I, I i'm remembering it now i have to re i'm gonna rewatch the first three seasons once i start rvb season four but i'm so happy that church is back with the gang so um so yeah so we're gonna get into the discussion for the finale but before that i want to talk about one more thing and it is rvb related and that well two things first off uh my reaction to ruby chibi season one episodes 21 to 24 will be up next weekend so this weekend you'll get the finale of my reaction to Ruby Volume 4. Next weekend you'll get the reaction to Ruby Chibi. And I think that'll be kind of a cool way to kind of let the, the Ruby-ness, like the Ruby content linger on my channel for a bit longer. So I'm going to be getting into that because I haven't, wa I, I didn't watch those initially when Ruby came out Volume 4 because I prioritized on stuff like the, like the New York Comic Con info, my RTX info, and then they were coming out with Ruby stuff. So I kind of put Chibi on the back burner. So that's the first thing. Um, I just noticed how great your shirt is. Yeah, this is the, uh, the Cheese Master Gus shirt that I got from, um, uh, uh, Extra Life, uh, Rooster Teeth's Extra Life 2016 that they did in November, I believe? Yeah. It was my first, it was my first, uh, my first Extra Life that I ever attended, like, as a viewer, and I was there for the whole 24 hours. I bought this shirt, I bought the community poster, like, with all the community members' pictures on it, and I also bought the, uh... The exclusive RTX, I'm sorry, not RTX, RT Extra Life poster, like, with the comics of all of them. I have, like, a ton of space on my wall, and I'm definitely going to flush out my room a bit more when I get my new setup, which uh, should be sometime next month. So, um, how far are we? Just joined. I have not started yet. But I have one more thing to announce. We have 643 people in here at the 16-minute mark. So, thank you guys so much for joining. Um... <clears throat> One more thing that I will say regarding Red vs. Blue. Uh, for those of you who don't follow me on Twitter, at MurderOfBirds underscore, uh, I made a poll a couple of days ago about Red vs. Blue and content that I want to do for Red vs. Blue besides reactions. I'm having second thoughts on it now because some people have um, relayed some concern about my idea. So, typically, like, for for Volume 4, like, it's the first time I've ever done live streaming, like, in terms of discussing discussions and reviews and stuff like that i get like screenshots and stuff like that for my episodes and everything and they're really lengthy and a lot of people enjoy the ruby side of it and i said to myself i was like i wonder if fans like R rvb fans or people who know that i'm watching the show if they would like for me to do a live stream discussion every time i finish a season so i would do a season four live stream discussion of rvb and then a season five a season six a season seven etc etc and um I felt like that would have been a really good idea, but then some people were telling me that that's a really, like, I'm, I'm not asking for it, but it's just very spoiler heavy. Like, it, it'll be very, I'll be at so much risk for spoilers if I, like, read the chat and do stuff like that. And, um, I don't want to get spoiled. Surprisingly, I haven't gotten spoiled on anything yet. Like, no one's been that much of an asshole to be like, hey, this happens. Um, so I don't, know if I want, I want to do it for the sake of, you know, I want to do it for the sake of talking about it, for the sake of discussing it with you guys, and doing what I do for RV, for, for Ruby, but for Red versus Blue, especially since I only do reactions, I don't really have, uh, like a review format to kind of summing up my thoughts and my opinions and what I think is going to happen with theories for RVB. I say a lot of that on the fly when I'm watching the episodes, or I'll usually say it at either the beginning or the end of a reaction, but um, I never really have much to go off of because, first off, I, I just genuinely like discussing it with people live versus recording it. So um, I, I really want to do it, but I think I'm not going to do it for the sake of spoilers. However, once I'm caught up with RVB Season 15, which they announced for, uh, for the summer or for the spring into the summer for the summer of animation, uh, I'll absolutely be doing those in the future or maybe i'll go back and i'll do a retrospective 
maybe I'll do that. Maybe I'll do like a retrospective live stream discussion discussion of like my thoughts or what I felt about this certain character because I feel like if I'm going to be continuing on, there's not going to be a lot of time for that, especially if I'm doing reactions. So I, I want to do something very nitty gritty and something that's very discussion worthy and value worthy for you guys to be, you know, for you guys to enjoy and for me to want to do uh, for Red versus Blue especially. So, um, I might have to wait until season 15, but, uh, I want to at least make it to season, let's see, I'm on season, okay, so we're 20 minutes in, by the way, so I'm, I'm gonna wrap this up, but I'm on season 4 right now, like, starting season 4, I have not watched episode 1 yet, I finished the first 3 seasons, I'm starting season 4, episode 1 of, of season 4, of course, so I have season, let's see, uh, March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October. We can expect Ruby Volume 5 to return in October. So I have eight months of, of Ruby. I'm sorry, of RVB. Of which two of those months are solely RVB because Ruby Chibi won't be out till then. And then news and information for RTX won't be until the summer. And then they probably won't start promoting Ruby Volume 5 until like close to its release. So I have eight months and i kind of want to do a season per month to be completely honest uh i'm gonna still try to work on trying to make a consistent schedule of okay this is the day that i'm going to record and then i'm going to edit and then these are the days that i'm going to have a reaction come out i want to do at least two reactions per week but i can easily guarantee one a week uh, because i do them in batches but then i know that they get a bit longer as the seasons progress and uh, if she is in the chat uh georgia warwick uh, if that, I hope I'm not butchering your name, thank you so much, because this girl gave me the longest of DMs, gave me the order I should watch all the episodes, and I asked, like, a special request, because I don't know what I'm watching, like, I clip the episodes together, and I just watch it, so I don't know if I'm cutting off at a certain point, I never want to cut off, like, in the middle of a fight scene, or in the middle of a, of a moment, where, when I pick up again, it feels like I lost a sense of attachment, like, if one scene go goes really well with another, I want both of those scenes in one reaction. So she went out of her way and gave me an entire template of this is what you want to watch. These are the episodes you want to have batched together so that way your experience seems fulfilled. And it's a roughly good length in terms of the episode so that way it's like a 15-20 minute reaction video so it's not too long. So she came in so fucking clutch. Thank you so much if you're in here. I've already thanked you numerous times on Twitter. I, I thanked you again this past weekend uh, because that helped me out immensely. And I'm definitely going to be getting back into that. So, um, so yeah, with all of that said and done, we are 22 minutes in. We have 648 people in the chat. I am going to be starting the live stream discussion for Ruby Volume 4, Chapter 12, the finale titled... No safe haven, which is a pun in of itself, given haven is where they're supposed to go. And I guess based on the po the pre-credit scene, I was so fucking close! I was so close! I was so close, but we will talk about that. We'll get into that, absolutely. Um, Credo Googles, thank you so much for the compliment. I appreciate it very much. <laughs> yeah, I almost want to believe that like Barbara helped them come up with the title and then even the song Armed Armed and Ready which is like a theme like Yang's kind of sporty new theme um that in of itself has a pun in it and it's like I don't picture that song being anyone else's but Yang's based solely on the title so um I was so oh what was I so close to I was so fucking close to predicting the end scene, not the credit scene, the credit, the scene before that with Watts and the headmaster. S I was on the, the slimmest of margins. I predicted the setting, I predicted how it would happen, but I fucked up one crucial thing. And I was so livid, I was like, are you serious? I was so close. But uh, I will absolutely get into that um, when the time comes for the discussion. So, <laughs> hashtag you called it. <clears throat> Blue Puerto Rican 5. 
Oh, you're going to RTX. So, yeah, I'm going to be going to RTX again uh, for 2017. Uh, for the most part, it seems like it is going to be happening. I am going to try to work in a small GoFundMe for me this year because I'm simultaneously saving for RTX and saving for a PC. So, um, if I can get what, if, if, you know, for whatever anyone's able to contribute, any help towards RTX will help, um, by proxy of me getting my PC. Cause then I can focus all of my personal funds on my PC, you know, for people who are helping me for RTX. So I already bought my RTX VIP pass, which I had to take savings out of my PC fund to get that because I got it last year and I, I, I can't imagine RTX without it just because it's such a stress reliever to know that you don't have to wait in the line for hours you're not missing out on a billion different things and it's very much worth it at the end of the day for you know having priority in lines having like access to VIP lounges and stuff like that going to concerts and and you know everything else in between so um, if any of you guys are going to RTX this year I am absolutely planning a meetup like I did last year. It should be a lot more organized and coordinated because now I have Twitter and a lot more people follow me and a lot more people know about, you know, my channel and stuff like that. I'm going to be staying at the Hilton Hotel uh, like I did last year. So that's like a, a little giveaway for anyone who kind of wants to meet me at the scene. But yeah, so um, I'll absolutely be going to RTX again because uh, Blue Blue Puerto Rican 5 mentioned, you know, you hope you meet me. Well, if make sure you if you see me, you stop me and you come and say hi, you ask for a hug, you ask for a picture. You asked to hang out or whatever because uh, some people didn't meet me last year because they were like, oh, I saw you, but I was too nervous to meet you. And I'm just like, I'm just a guy, you know, I'm just a fan just like you. Granted, I'm, people might know my name or people might know where I'm from or what I do on YouTube, but in no way, shape or form do I want anyone to feel like I'm above them or I'm like arrogant or, or anything like that. I'm so fucking, well, I don't mean to toot my own horn, but I'm a nice person, you know what I mean? Like, I treat people the way that I want to be treated and... You know, if you're nice to me and cool to me, I'll reciprocate it, absolutely. Hey, Taylor Haynes, you just got home? Well, I haven't talked about anything yet. We have 666 viewers in the chat right now. <laughs> but yeah, um, nah, you're afraid of looking stupid, so I made myself look dumb a few times, and I have evidence of that because of the recordings that I that I did at RTX that I went back and rewatched, and I, I felt so cringe, like, talking to, like, passing someone in, like, the exhibit hall, and they're like... Arnold and I'm like oh hey what's up and then I strike up a conversation and there's like a million things going through my head I'm still like immersed in everything around me uh so I I, I absolutely get that trust me and I'm very easy at breaking the ice or making people feel comfortable and not making it seem like I kind of want to drive the, the the conversation and whatnot because I know that it's very one-sided when I do it you know what I mean like I'm talking to you guys on a on a computer screen whether it's live right now or whether it's recorded but then when you meet me it's like well what do I say so I feel like YouTube has kind of trained me to have that cue of when I meet somebody I drive the conversation break the ice make them feel comfortable and then it kind of makes it a lot easier for them to open up and talk to me so um, I absolutely um, <laughs> the muffin button was awesome yeah <laughs> <laughs> I met the bulk of those people, and then we actually got there, and I noticed his shirt, I was like, let me go, let me see what he does, so I think, I thought that was really awesome, muffin button is best button, <laughs> well, I'm glad you guys like the RTX vlogs, I have another one coming out next week that's going to feature people in the community, so if you went to RTX and you saw me, chances are you are in the video, so um, look out for that. Uh, Arnold, if you are alright with waiting a couple weeks, months, I can donate my laptop to you, uh, no problem, just gotta let the couple paychecks build up and completely customize my, oh, Jamie, yeah, absolutely, I mean, I, I feel very confident that I might be able to get my PC before that point, and I've already talked to you about it, and it's super grateful and appreciative of you to, to kind of go out of your way to do something on that level, just because you've already done so much, but, um, I might, might be able to... Uh, have the PC that I need for the videos that I want to do uh, before then. But if anything, I'll get back to you. But thank you so much. Uh, incredibly grateful of you. <clears throat> yeah, this is going to be long, considering it's already 8 o'clock. So we're going to be starting, without further ado, uh, RTX London? Uh, London? No. I think the only RTXs that I would ever commit to are within my country, because, I mean... I've, a, I've never traveled out of the country. B, I'm super nervous about traveling out of the country versus, like, in my own country. Like, city, like, state to state is a lot more easy going for me to handle than going to a completely different country. Because if something happens, I'm fucked, you know? So, um, I, for now at least, 
for now, like I'm not saying I'll never ever or if the opportunity will never ever come, but for now I'm just going to be sticking to RTX Austin. And just because it's only my second RTX this year, I feel like I want to go a few more times before I get my feet wet with going elsewhere. So, um yeah, it's 12 it's it's 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time where I live. So, uh and we've spent about 30 minutes chatting up. <laughs> and um is Alex in the chat? Is Alex Abraham in the chat? Someone just asked that. Yo, if you're in the chat, Alex, dude, I fucking love the OSTs that you did this volume. You guys did so many, because you guys had, like, what, eight World of Remnants, which is fucking insane, but, um, I loved them all. I loved the OSTs, I loved the little snippets of music that we got, the, the, obviously, Armed and Ready was, like, such a hype song. I'm looking forward to Armed and Ready and Bad Luck Charm more than anything. Like, I'm so much more hyped for this volume than I was... I think every volume is just like the hype is more intensified than the previous. Like I remember just like foaming at the mouth practically waiting for the volume three soundtrack so I can listen to I'm the one uh, and divide and cold and like the full versions. And then when like now, now we have like snippets, we only got like, f I think five songs throughout like the volume, but I'm pretty sure this like, we're probably going to get way more than that for actual songs, not just remixes or uh, orchestras or anything like that. So, um, yeah, the chat's going by very fast. There's 700 people in here, so you got to take that into consideration. Uh, I have slow mode chat, which is one comment every 45 seconds. So I might have to. I, I don't know if I'll have to extend that, but but yeah, <laughs> the new boop. Yeah, that that's pretty great. That that OST, I really love that one. Um, okay, so without further ado, we're going to be starting. Thank you guys all for joining and for the support if this is your first time in here. I hope you enjoy the discussions with myself and the chat. I hope it's entertaining. Thank you guys so much for the support of all 12 volume, uh, 12 volume uh, chapters that we, that we made it through with my reactions and my discussions. By the way, by the way, um, I did the math actually, and up until this reaction, which I won't have the total clocked time, I'm expecting this to be at least three hours, at least, which is definitely going to exceed. Uh, I have put 27 hours and 46 minutes, I believe, into the live stream discussions. I spent 27 hours talking about Ruby from the first discussion of Chapter 1 to uh, Chapter 11, which this one, will, I'll definitely exceed 30 hours. So um, that just proves how crazy the fact that I want to just talk to you guys about Ruby and also put into perspective, a lot of you guys were around for that long, that amount of time as well in the chat. So, uh, just thank you guys all around for the support and for enjoying these and for liking the fact that I do them because I'm definitely going to do these for Volume 5 since a lot of you guys enjoyed it initially. So, <clears throat> yeah, that is a lot of hours. <laughs> no, 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 I'm not confident that it's going to be three hours. I'm saying it's going to be minimum three hours. Like, we're going to exceed three hours, but it's not going to be shorter than that. So, um, without further ado, we're going to get into this, and the I'm going to disappear a few times in this video, but the first one I'm going to disappear for is that we got to see the full image of the Nukalavi Grim, which I'm a it's confirmed, that's what it was, it was a Nukalavi, it's, you know, a horse body, or, or a horse portion with, like, a humanoid top part, um super super fucking sick how they revealed it last chapter of just showing the horse's mouth and then the arrows on its back and it's like uh like it spikes on its back and then immediately showing the face and like it's screaming nature i thought that was so fucking sick we see like the whole image here like it has like ribs that are like like bone ribs exposed like the wandering red eye effect which i think like a super cool effect that they added to the grim it has clawed hooves on the front or clawed like feet on the front hooves on the back a giant long like mr fantastic four freaking arms which is i think that's what makes it like more deadlier than anything else is the fact that it has so much range i thought it was just like okay it has mobility because it's a horse and it can gallop and it can like run around and stuff and maybe it has weapons that it fights with too it's like nope it just has freaking <laughs> so i saw a gif right i saw this gif that um that like portrayed wacky waving inflatable arm flailing tube man but it was this grim and that's the first thing that i thought it was like it just has like spaghetti arms that just fling around everywhere and that's how it attacks and that kind of makes it crazy to think like no wonder this thing survived for so long no wonder it's killed so many people like humans and huntsmen alike because it's like it's so versatile and it's 
it's it, I feel like this is like we'll never see another one of these Grim. Like this is like truly a one of a kind Grim that took four Huntsmen in training to take down. You know what I mean? Granted, they all came together and did it, but how formidable would a single Huntsman, like a single skilled Huntsman, not like Croaks? I feel like he's like Apex or Ozpin is like Apex, but like maybe like a Grim that like like a Huntsman that goes out in the field and just fights for for earnings. Like, would they be able to take this Grim out? I'm not going to count the, the Huntsman that was in Chapter 2 because he could have also been tied up in the aftermath of the Bandits. So he could have gotten wounded by the Bandits and the Grim after, afterwards. So um, I just loved the fact that this Grim looks so fucking sick. It looks so terrifying. It actually like put on a really good fight and I wasn't really expecting much out of it because I was like, well, what can a Horseman Grim do? You know, it didn't have weapons or anything like that either. Um... If it could talk, I would probably be dead. <laughs> Alex, you are in here, dude. How's it going, man? Thank you so much for joining. I don't expect you to stick around for as long as I plan on doing this, but thank you so much, man, for joining. Oh, man. I freaking need... We need to meet someday, dude. I freaking love the work that you did for this volume with the OSTs with Jeff. <laughs> it, the one thing that I will say that his arm is really useful because then he can like scratch his own back whenever he like wants and I went back to rewatch the episode and there were some funny moments there that I was just thinking like if this Grim could talk and it just realized how sh like in a shit position it's in it'd be so funny if the Grim would be like talking to Jean or something or talking to the group and he's like hey can we work this out or something I think I have a few screenshots to compliment that but that was super funny that I realized um, and then obviously this scene right here shows the, the vendetta between Jean, I'm sorry, between, uh, Ren and the Grimm, like, this is the Grimm that destroyed his village, that killed his mother, that killed his father, that has been terrorizing, you know, this entire territory for, for years, and he's actually looking it back in the face, and this is the first time Ren's actually expressed anger, like, em like, genuine anger and emotions, like, we've never seen, like, any type of, Ren for the most part has been extremely stoic, since the volumes, like, since the series started, like, I understand back when Monty was voice acting for him, it was just because, like, Monty was always working, so his lines were very minimum, or minimal, rather, but, um, I, I personally tweeted out to Neith, I think Neith did Ren so much justice, not just in the volume, but this episode in particular, like, this episode just solidified, like, how thankful I am that he decided to step up and take the role of Monty's role of you know playing playing Ren you know it was like it was like from from brother to brother I just I just love that and it made it so much more impactful for me to just see wow like Ren's character came through this volume and shined in the last two to three episodes and Neith did an incredible job mind you not trained in voice acting has learned from since taking over the role as Ren from volume three to now he's come an incredibly long way and he's just done so much, he's done so much justice, justice for the character. Um, my favorite scene that, like, that just made, like, it just, it, I, my heart was just, like, melting at the at that point was where Jean was, uh, where, where Ren was, like, from my mother, from my father, for all those that you've slain, for myself. Like, I just, that scene was so fucking good. It was so fucking good, and I loved it. And he didn't, like, again, he did an incredible job. I absolutely loved it. And I can't picture anybody else doing doing the voice for him now at this point. And I love how it was still within the family for Monty, you know, for Monty's sibling to take over. <sighs> but yeah, so um, really great to see the emotions kind of flaring for Ren. Um, just because, I mean, we've never seen that part of him. And I feel like once you see a character start die, like, start progressing off of like, what makes them their character, like, when you see Ren acting up, and, you know, getting mad, and, you know, showing ex signs of emotion, it's like, he's not acting, he's acting very out of character, which makes it seem like, wow, it's like, okay, so something must really be, this must be really important, or this character must be extremely distraught for him to act irrash uh, irrationally and out of character, um, similar to, like, Yang, like, Yang, the entire volume, it's like, we've never seen Yang in that state of just, doom and gloom depression in bed the entire time doesn't want to participate in anything doesn't want to make a step forward just you know is going through so much internally and that's not the yang we know like yang volume one two and three is very hard-headed very passionate caring loving uh kind of party girl-esque very bubbly and and fun to be around um has a pun you know on hand at all times <clears throat> 
And, like, when you see some a character going through something that makes them out of their character, it just makes it a lot more impactful of how are they going to combat this, how are they going to overcome it. And that's... I love the under, underdog story of characters. Like, you're not in your element, but let me see how you bounce back from this. Let me see how you change and how you progress and how you um, transcend, I guess, to be more open and more, uh, like, two, three, four-dimensional as a character. So, um, absolutely, absolutely love the fact that we got to see that, especially from Ren, because we've gotten a lot of context clues of the first three volumes. Ren and Nora have no, are, are orphans, they have no family, they've only ever had each other. Boop also gives a lot of context for that. And just the interaction that you see from them two, since the very beginning, like, they're always together, they're always, you know, they're, they're, they're partners, they're teammates, and then we see the flashback, which adds a lot more importance and significance to all of that. So, I, I just feel like... All of that just culminates into what makes a character, and I, I, it, 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 it really showed a lot for Yang this volume for me personally, and especially for uh, and for Ren. So um, this never, uh, sorry, this never more. Jeez, this uh, I'm gonna call it. I don't even know what to call it because Nukalavi doesn't roll off the tongue. So I, I really don't know what. To, I'll just, I'll just refer to. I don't know. I, like you guys will obviously know. This is the only Grim that we see this episode. So, um, super cool. It starts like shouting. And the first thing that I think about is Attack on Titan, because I know Miles and Carrie and, like, people at Rooster Teeth know about the show, they're fans of it. The Grim in of themselves, like, the nature of the Grim is very... Oh, a Nuck! I can call it the Nuck. <laughs> yeah, I can call it that. That That's actually really clever. I didn't even think about that. But, um... Knuckles. <laughs> Dude, we should definitely have, like, a key name for it. No, we don't have a confirmed name for it yet, which, um... I wish somebody asked that at the, um, at the New York, I'm sorry, at the, uh, RTX Sydney Ruby panel. I, I wish someone had asked, like, for the official names for, like, the Grim that we haven't gotten names for, like, the, the Serpent Dragon Underwater Dragon Grim that, that, that Blake and Sun fought, and then this, the, the name of this Grim. We just know based on, like, what, I guess, species they're from, or what mythos creature they're from, so, everyone calls this the Nukalavi, but that's not the name of the Grim. that's just what it's inspired by from its creation, and its inspiration, so, um, <laughs> yeah, call it question mark, question mark, question mark, yeah, I want to call the Nukalavi Knuckles, just because it, that's, like, so legit, obviously it reminds me of Sonic, but, um, it does, like, this shouting attack, and I remember Attack on Titan, like I said, the Grimm's concept is very similar to the titans from attack on titan like the grim don't need to eat they choose to eat they destroy humans and all of their creations when they die they evaporate and those are all very core aspects of titans in the attack on titan universe and when it started shouting i remembered the female titan i'm not going to spoil it in case any of you guys i'm not going to spoil the identity in case somehow no one here has watched it but the female titan does a shouting like a shout and that shout instantly calls all titans in like the range of that sh which is incredibly loud so it calls all titans in the territory to come it's almost like a summon like she summons all of the titans to just run to her location i thought that that's what this was gonna do i was like is it shout because it shouted a couple of times and it's like okay are you just doing that for show is there a reason why you're doing that are you just trying to like express like your your power and your like how terrifying you are so <laughs> someone in the chat said mating call gen wolf jesus christ <laughs> Uh, I don't think the Grim, yeah, the Grim don't reproduce either. Similar to the the, the Titans, they don't reproduce. Uh, to 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 our knowledge, or to the knowledge that's been given so far in the anime. But yeah, like it was shouting, and I thought like all of a sudden we were just gonna get a fucking array of Grim just flooding into this city. So um, how late are you? Not really late. Like based on where I am right now, we're in the first first scene of the chapter. So um, I just loved how it was like putting up a front, and like this started like a boss fight. And I, I'll say this too, I'll say this too, this entire fight scene reminded me, like for any of you, if any of you guys are Dark Souls fans, Demon Souls fans, or Bloodborne fans, this felt like a four-on-one Dark Souls boss fight. Like, the Grim was fighting them, they were putting, like, it was going back and forth, back and forth, and then the Grim, like, transformed mid-fight, and that's exactly what happens to bosses in Dark Souls or Bloodborne. Like, when you're fighting a boss, once you reach a certain amount of health, it changes form, and it kind of comes out with new attacks, and it just makes the fight a lot more harder for you to survive. And that's what it reminded me of. This reminded me very much of a, like, a boss, like a mob boss fight, like a four-on-one boss fight. Um, and that, like, again, like, I'm a fucking sucker for Dark Souls and Bloodborne, 
And um, I absolutely loved it. I absolutely loved that concept. And it reminded me, I was like, holy shit, this feels like a Dark Souls fight because he's transforming and shit. And it just looks so cool. So um, I mentioned this particular moment here last week. And I think subsequent weeks as a as a result that Crow is a sitting duck. Granted, he's a sitting, well, technically he's a sitting crow, but he's a sitting duck in the sense that I said to myself, I was like, Crow is there. Team Ranger is there. This Grim, if it's as smart as I think it is, if it's as strategic and combat effective as I think it is, it's going to go for him first. I said that in my reaction to Chapter 11. I believe I mentioned it in the live stream discussion. I was like, if it goes for Crow first, that's going to be a first good move because that that will make it so Team Ranger can't fight at 100%. Similar to how, like, Crow was fighting Tyrion, but he couldn't fight as, at his 100% because Ruby was getting in the way, and obviously he wanted to make sure she was safe, which in turn is what got him hurt. Um, you can't be at your 100%. You can't be fighting at your absolute capacity if you, ha if there, if you have something holding you back or hindering you. So, <clears throat> very surprised. Like, he's looking at Team Ranger in the top scene, and then he immediately shifts his attention to the Huntsman that's down on the floor, defenseless and injured. So, I thought it was a very smart move for this Grim to go after Crow first, just based on, you know, what I just mentioned. <clears throat> We're 45 minutes into the stream, by the way. This is going to be a long fucking stream. <laughs> <clears throat> So, um, so yeah, I just thought that was, like, incredibly capitalized on the Grimm's part. But, Ren comes through, and, oh my god, dude. So, we actually, so first off, actually, before I get into that, by the way, I screenshotted 159 screenshots for this live stream discussion. I spent all day yesterday, like, clipping them, and then I spent half of yesterday and then the rest of this morning putting them into OBS so forgive me if I stray off of discussion for what I'm talking about versus what's on the uh what what screenshots being shown because I I didn't I can't memorize like the order that I did them in because there's so fucking many but yeah so Mr. Fantastic basically so he's a uh, he's part grim he's part horse he's part like huntsman like horse like horse rider and he's also part Mr. Fantastic uh where he can just extend his fucking arms across the courtyard and try to attack and Again, like I mentioned, that is, I feel like, his biggest his biggest arsenal is just the fact that he has so much range, and he's within, like, he's in a safe distance, like, he can just attack you from a distance and just, like, try to claw at you and whatever. Granted, he doesn't really, the Grim isn't as smart when it comes to, like, hey, when you attack with your freaking arm, you better retract it, because that, in the end of the day, is what got him killed. But, um, really wish that it, yeah, 159 screenshots, but... Um, this was a, this was almost a half an hour episode, but, um, uh, what was I going to say? But, I, 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 like I said, I like the fact that this was, like, one of the big features of the Grim. Like, he has mobility of the horse, he has the combat experience of years of killing and surviving his fights, and I, I was just wondering, like, how are they going to fight this thing? So, it was super cool to kind of see that. Jean makes the, like, the team leader, I guess, decision in a way to kind of be like, Oh shit, as a strategist of the team, as kind of like the Sokka of the volume, uh, or of the series rather, um, he like asserted, like in, in, immediately he was like, okay, the Grimm's looking at Crow, I gotta go take care of Crow. So, uh, and then the other three were dealing with him. And um, we got to see like what Ren semblance, semblance actually does. So, <laughs> oh my god, that top one though, yeah. <laughs> But, um, oh, you're wearing the same shirt, Ben. That's pretty sick. Uh, hey, Arnold, are you going to be reacting to RVB? So I mentioned this briefly. I mentioned this in, in, in length. But, yes, I will be reacting to RVB in March. And I'm going to be trying to catch up to at least season, uh, like, 10 to 13 by the, by, before Ruby Volume 5 comes through. But, um, but, yeah, so we actually, like, back in the day, like, first off, Ren seems to have been training his semblance since he's discovered it, because before, it was very close proximity, like, himself and other people that he's physically touching. Um, in the last chapter, we saw that, first off, he activated his semblance, like, mid-stress, and he made his way under the building. He hugged Nora, but because of the grim, like, the angle that it was shot at, 
the Nevermore looked under the building, but I didn't think it was looking directly at them. Like, I, I literally thought, okay, it's suppressing its emotions. The Grim can't, like, literally see ladder, like, can't, like, r literally see, like, right across, like, horizontally, like, okay, I can see under there. I can see no one's under there because they were really far in. And from the angle that it showed, it didn't seem like he could see them, even if they were visible. So I was, uh, like, everyone obviously was under the impression that, okay, it's to suppress emotions, but... Now we see that he actually suppresses their existence. Like, the Grim can't see them. Like, sensory, he can't see them, he can't hear them. I'm assuming he's walking right in front of it, so he can't hear them either. Um, but the Grim is kind of dumb, because it's like, dude, he was there as you were charging him, and then he disappeared. I would just imply, you're invisible, I'm just going to attack where you were. But, uh, obviously, for the sake of... The fact that we found out the what the semblance actually did it made it made a lot more sense to be like okay we'll give them this one they can get away and we also see how ren has been evolving the semblance i think everyone's semblance to some extent has evolved over time ruby's in the character short uh weiss is in the sense that well not really hers has evolved but she's just manifested and tapped into it a lot with a lot more confidence to where she's able to summon fully um blake actually makes like Kage Bushi no Jutsus, like fucking Shadow Clone Jutsus from like Naruto. Before, they could only take hits. Now she can summon them and use them with herself, like they actually are tangible. And then Sun can summon more clones than just one or two. Like he summoned up to like, I think, four this volume. Um, so it seems like everyone's semblances are evolving and growing over time. And Ren's obviously, since he was a kid, he discovered it. So I can only imagine how many times he's had to use this semblance for him and Nora to get out of close calls with Grimm, especially since they grew up like on their own, you know, so, um, yeah, initially I thought it was Ren Yada, which it's like, son of a, so, like, that play of the game is kind of, like, obsolete now, because it, that's not how it was, but granted, it was great to just have that be a thing, because that's what everyone was thinking at a certain point, um, <laughs> gaze into the iris, yeah, Grim may have thermal vision, so they can't see them, I honestly, I, I will, granted, we, we don't really know the extensive nature of, like, the anatomy of a Grimm, like, what, do they have certain vision, you know what I mean, like, we know Faunus have night vision, you know, they can see to a certain extent, um, you know, based on their species, but for Grimm, I don't know, um, it, it just mainly, I think it mainly is based on the nature of the semblance, not necessarily the nature of the Grimm, because... Does Ren's semblance, like, cleanse them of aura? Like, do the Grim see aura? Do the Grim see anything? You know what I mean? Like, do the Grim see build... Well, hold on. I don't know how that would work, though. I think the semblance does, like, just essentially clear you from existence. It would have to. Because, like, the Grim have used, like, inanimate objects before, you know what I mean, like, they've used inanimate objects, they, they're aware of their surroundings, you know what I mean, so it's not like they just see life forms, like, they see buildings and things of that nature, granted, their targets are humans, so maybe there is an essence to them, maybe they sense the aura, maybe they sense, um, you know, their soul, or maybe it is thermal, or maybe Ren Semblance does wipe their existence off of the map, um, it's it's not necessarily existence because he's still there on top of that. So um, it's just a form of a cloaking mechanism, like invisibility in a sense. But uh, it's just eerie. How, it's just I don't know. I guess it's just like the fact the Grim got outplayed <laughs> at this point. Um, Will Yang be stronger than Ruby? Yang is stronger than anybody on her team, like, strength-wise. You have to really divide it into utility. Like, Ruby is really fast and quick and agile. Yang, uh, Weiss is basically a mage. She's, like, more experienced than Dust than everyone else. Blake is very, like, rogue assassin-esque. So she can kind of get the drop on people. And then Yang is just the powerhouse. So, um... So, yeah. Hey, what's up? Yeah, the Seer Grim. Yeah, you have to remember the Seer... Oh, yeah, the Seer Grim, because they have, like, a, 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 a very particular vision, like, the way that they see the world. So, but but that's the thing right there. Like, there wasn't any... Like, when it looked at Mercury, and, like, they obviously tap into their semblances, so they have aura, they have a soul and stuff like that. Like, when they looked at, when they looked at like, everybody in that room, like, they looked at... Uh, well, the Seer looked at Emerald, Mercury, Cinder, and Salem. It didn't show off, like 
they have like any pings on them or or blimps on them that are like you're a human you're a life form you're a life form there was nothing that like showed off any type of way to tell like they particularly see humans in a certain way that if that part of them was wiped then they wouldn't be able to pick up on them at least that's how i interpret it but anyways uh we got more of ren's semblance which was super awesome welcome to the stream again brandon uh i saw you in the chat <laughs> Mercury has no soul. <laughs> I'm so upset. I'm so irked that Mercury did not get any lines of dialogue, especially since I was so, like, hyped for him after Volume 4 of seeing, like, how good he is in a fight and, and, and seeing how, like, how much of a big role he played in, like, the fall of Beacon and trying to, you know, play Yang as, uh, you know, being a victim and whatnot, but I was so upset that, 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 that he didn't have one, especially since I'm the one hyped him up for me even more, and then volume five, um, volume four, we didn't get much out of them, um, yeah, we did get a bunch of new characters, <laughs> Mercury ate shit this volume, Merc has been irked pretty much. I've kind of been irked a bit too because of that. But um But yeah, so moving on from there. Uh yeah, so Jean like kind of gets Crow to safety, and then they have like this little exchange right here, which I think this was so first off I want to say a lot of people thought like Jean was gonna be really like not necessarily, but he was gonna be like cutthroat to to, to Crow because of the way he was reacting to um the way he was initially reacting to finding out that Pyrrha was a maiden, and she was kind of, not coerced, but like falsely coerced into it by the teachers, and he was like, oh, you guys used her, you guys tried to turn her into whatever, and now she's gone because of you, and you know, all that other stuff, so just his, the demeanor that he was going about trying to blame Crow and blame Ozpin for Pyrrha's death, people thought like, wow, he was gonna kind of, not go AWOL, but he maybe he would have resented Crow to some extent since he had a part in it. Um, I never really thought that. I don't think Jean, I never thought Jean to be that type of person. Like, I feel like anybody, once you find out, once you're thought to believe one thing, once you're thought to believe Pyrrha was killed because of this unfortunate event, and then you find out people led her to take the steps necessary to get herself in that position that caused her to die, you radically change your thought process, especially since he went months, months with assuming that, you know what I mean? So, um... It's not outside of John's character or nature or the human nature, you know, or the human condition for that matter, to act out or lash out in that way, especially when something as crazy as someone dying that you care about, um, you know, ends up dying in a, in a way that you thought was one thing, and then you come to find out there were a lot more things behind the scenes. So, <clears throat> I never really thought, um, I never, I never really thought that John would ever act in that in that in that way. And I feel like maybe this was kind of like that too. First off, I feel like primarily like this was like, do you guys have this? Because like Crow obviously wants to help, but, and he knows like, holy shit, this Grim's serious. And are they ready for this? Are they going to be okay without me? Granted, he can really, he really can't do much, but you know, he could do something, you know what I mean? So, and on top of that, if he's out of the picture, if his semblance is like an area of effect thing that's always on despite him having aura or not, um, that was just gonna act against them. Granted, it would have acted against the Grim, but it wouldn't have helped their, their chances either. Dashi Lee, welcome to the stream! Absolutely glad that you're able to join. Yeah, Jean is absolutely, understandably pissed, and yeah, he's not gonna, he, he wouldn't take it out on Crow, you know what I mean? Especially Crow wouldn't settle for that, he'd be like, hey kid, sit down, you're stressing me out. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> I just like this moment right here of, you know, Crow just being like, do you have it? And John looks at him with confidence, like, yo, we got it. It's almost like confirmation, like, you got this, you're good, I'll be here. And then he goes back into fight. So, um, I just really liked how that went. But initially, for the fight, Ranger was getting their teeth fucking kicked in. <laughs> um, uh, Nikachu, thank you very much for joining. <clears throat> You, uh, it just, oh, first stream, nice. I hope you guys are all enjoying it. But yeah, they were getting their fucking teeth kicked in, like, initially. Mainly from, like, like I said, the arms. Like, Ruby got taken down. Nora got shot across the freaking courtyard. Ren was, like, held down. And I, I wanna, I wanna say this right now. If, 
like, and don't take this personally if any of you guys feel this way. Um, this is, I guess, in, in in a sense, I'm kind of projecting how I feel about the whole the whole situation about it. But if you watched Volume One, Volume Two, Volume Three, all the way up to the end of this fight, even the the end of the chapter, and you think Jean has not come a long way from being a character, for the character evolution that he's gone through the development that he's gone through with his team with him growing as a warrior as a as a leader as a team player as a strategist and just seeing how much this journey has changed him if you are still sleeping on jean i feel so bad for you and i, I just feel bad for the fact that like people don't see how far he's come like he he was the shot caller this entire, like, he was the shot caller in the fight with the Deathstalker. He was the shot caller during the fight with, uh, the Geist. He was the shot caller in this fight, making a lot of great, like, calls as a, you know, he's grown, so he's come so fucking far. And look at, just go back, just go back to Volume 1, Chapter 2, and watch Jean. Just, just watch him. And just look and see and realize that that Jean is gone forever. Like, we will never get the goofy kid who can't even, like, use his weapon and hold it upright and can't strike a normal conversation. Um, I love Jean. Absolutely. One of my top five favorite characters of the volume. Uh, I see so much of myself in Jean for the things that he's gone through personally, like being bullied and stuff like that and not being confident in himself and, and all that stuff. And... I, I resonate so deeply with him for how far he's come. Losing someone he loves, you know, going through, like, torture, trying to show Pira and show himself that he can be the, the warrior that he wants to be if he just tries hard and he has people that believe in him. And as a team leader, like, and I mentioned in the last chapter, like, he doubted himself in Volume 1 of, you know... He's not a good team leader. He doesn't think he's he's caught, you know, he's right for the job that going to the school was a mistake. Ruby bounced him back from that. Last chapter Ruby was doubting herself of I wish I never dragged you guys into this. You know, this is all my fault and he had her back when she had his. And just that dialogue alone just shows how much Jean has how, how much Jean has taken in for his character and taken in for himself since volume 1 and I absolutely fucking love it. I love Jean with all of my heart. And, um, you know, uh, some people can even say, well, that's because he's gotten more development than anybody else. And it's like, you know, that, I think that's the point. You know what I mean? Like, Jean and Pira's development really, um, fed off of one another. Of She helps him, he helps her. And that's, their relationship kind of was forged that way. And then when you take her, like, when you take the core aspect of what a lot of people assumed was Jean's character development, which was Pira, you see how he's still able to go on and progress and mature and develop without her but with her still there in a sense like in spirit essentially so um i love it i feel like jean has become like the big brother of the group you know what i mean like he looks out for everyone he's got everyone's back he's reassuring to ruby everything's going to be great that they went on their own accord reassuring to ren you know make sure you stay safe uh you know keep each other safe protect one another and you know giving hugs and just reassurance he's essentially like the big brother of the volume at this point i absolutely love him for it and Miles, especially in terms of, like, goofy, dorky, uh, comic relief Jean to more, like, rational, um, heartfelt, very serious and concerned character. And, want, like, a coming of age for, for his character, especially. Um, so I just wanted to say that because he, I think the next screenshot, yeah, right here, like, he makes a lot of great calls, like, especially as a strat as a... He, the, the best part is that he's a team leader that doesn't have the limelight. And I think that's what makes a great team leader. Like, building yourself up from, like, from the bottom and making your way to the top. I feel like once you become a leader, your job is to kind of bring other people up and not have the spotlight. Like, really be in the background of things. So the fact that he's a strategic team leader means that his team strength comes from his coordination, comes from his calls... And it comes a lot from how he just uses his uses a different aspect of his huntsmanship, which is his knowledge, his brain, kind of like how Uplek does, um, like in real time, on the fly, on the battlefield to kind of, you know, not die and not get his team killed. Um, because if he makes a call, it's like what Ozpin said, you have to always be performing at your best. You have to always give your team a reason to follow you. You know what I mean? And 
in this fight, if Jean was like, Ren, do this, and that got Ren hurt, that's on Jean as a team leader, as a strategist for not making the right call, for not making the right plays. And I love how it was so... I, I love the direction of how Jean's character has come and how far he's come, not just as a character, but also as a team leader. And, you know, seeing the fruits of his labor being put to, te put to the test during the fight. Um, like here, he... You know, he's like, everyone go in a circle because the Nuck is fighting everyone, just, you know, attacking people here and there. Like, basically just attacking whatever he can see or whatever is within reach. So they figured, as as long as we're moving, it's going to make it hard for him. He's stationary, so he only has two arms, and there's four of them. So they could just be playing, you know, they essentially they're playing, like, Ring Around the Rosie right now, or Duck Duck Goose, <laughs> or Duck Duck Grim. Or something like that. Essentially just playing mind games with the Grim and keeping it off balance with making sure no one gets killed. And Jean makes the first strike towards it, which I thought was awesome. Um, immediately afterwards, however, uh, it doesn't really turn out that great for him. Because immediately after, Jean gets like kicked right in the chest. Um, thank God for Aura, because I feel like that would have killed him. Uh, thank fucking God for Aura and his armor, especially so, especially his armor, just by the fact that the, the Huntsman mentioned, like, um, it'll be a lot better for him to have that armor when he goes up against the next, a, a new pair of claws, which, I mean, this is the next big Grim that they were fighting, so, I'm just glad that, essentially, his armor and his aura was able to save him right there, because it was just like, he attacked the Grim, and then the Grim looked at him like, boy, are you crazy? And then he just fucking double-kicked him. <laughs> <clears throat> you've helped me see the greatness of Jean. Well, I mean, I feel like a lot of people feel that if a character doesn't have 100% of the limelight, if they don't look cool and fancy and flashy when they're doing their thing, whether it's a fight or whether it's just their overall appeal, then they don't matter. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like a lot of characters are slept on because they're not the quote-unquote main character. Like, Jean has got so much development, and I can understand people feeling like, oh, he already had an arc in the first volume, and then he had an arc again in the second volume, and I can understand why people would feel that it's like, oh, is this Ruby, or is this is this show called... Like, I, I literally read a comment once, which was like, is this show called Ruby, or is it called Juniper? Because Jean and Pira were the main focuses for that time, but it's like, how are you going to get here if you're not even giving the writers and the team a chance to express and develop things as they go on? Characterization is super important. If you don't have characterization, I wouldn't give a fuck about Jean. Like, why would I care about Jean if I didn't realize how far he's come? You know what I mean? And... I don't know, I feel like maybe some people just care about the action, or some people just care about one aspect over all aspects, you know what I mean? And, um, honestly, if I didn't care about the characters, the show wouldn't be that enjoyable. No fight scene would make me care about about the show if, if the people that are in the show and are going through all of this stuff, if you don't have a resonance with them, or you can't relate to them, or, or what have you. I can understand, like, if your favorite character isn't getting a lot of screen time, I can absolutely understand, like, a lot of the frustration, like, oh man, Ruby's my favorite character, we haven't gotten anything on her, but the fact that we're not getting anything on her now just proves to me and shows me that once she does get it, it's all gonna be worth it. Like, Ruby, I feel like Ruby's development has is yet to be told because when it is it's it's going to be hers and hers only and she's going to be the only one to shine and have the only spotlight and everybody else is it's like everyone else will already have been fleshed out essentially you're saving the best for last so um so yeah i i just personally feel that way uh about the fact like character development is incredibly important it's it it, it is whether you want to admit it or not or whether you care to acknowledge it or not it's you need that to care you know, if you don't care about the characters, then what do you care, like, what is there to care about? So, um, every character is my favorite. I, I very much so feel the same way, um, Cook. I, I, I feel like ev one character, there is no one unified character, you know what I mean? There is no character that displays excitement, bubbliness, sporadic nature, uh, or just overall energy like Nora. Like, there is no Nora. You, if you were to love Nora, that would be like her, like that would be like what makes Nora Nora. Like that's why you like Nora because no other character brings what she brings to the table. And I feel like every character has that, um, which is why when people ask me, you know, what's your favorite character? It's usually it usually goes like it usually changes from volume to volume, especially since, especially based on what we get. Um, 
and I'll usually give my answers, but at the end of the day, I would never say, this person's my favorite character, so, and that statement would never make it, okay, that's your favorite character, so you don't like all the other characters as much. They just bring something different that I'm interested or I look forward to. <clears throat> Yang is my favorite. Yang has, has definitely boosted tremendously because... I, ha I like characters, but I have to I have to have something tangible to hold on to for why they're my favorite. I can't just like Yang because she looks she looks attractive or because she's a good fighter. I need substance. I need more. And uh, and this volume definitely gave me what was missing from her. She was missing hardship. She was missing. She was just missing. I I, I think mainly like grit and just. I guess mainly the hardship of what she went through because she never experienced that. That was something that was lacking for her character that made me feel like that made her lack as a character overall for me to like or for me to consider a favor or one of my favorites. <clears throat> and of course, to each their own. It's like, it's not like I'm saying, oh, my me liking a character is definitive. Like, I don't... Obviously, you can like whoever the fuck you want to like. Um... For me, I just feel like it, it goes beyond just liking you as a character or liking the weapon you use or the way you fight. It's like, I, I need to like like who you are. Not what you do, not what you look like, like who you are, what you've been through, what your story is. Uh, that, at the end of the day, is what makes me care so much about characters. <laughs> you get no water break. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm, this is my first bottle of water. I have three bottles of water. We're an hour and ten minutes in, and I'm still talking about the fight scene. So hopefully I can make it through this whole stream without having to, like, get up and go get more. So, um, he gets kicked, like, right in his chest. And this... Oh. Give me one second. <clears throat> I have the, like, I have probably the best, the best best like best foreshadowing ever 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 that i've ever seen i don't know like if any of you guys are rooster teeth are somehow watching this stream miles carey gray whoever or an animator or something i like i i really cannot believe that this came true okay so first off fucking sick 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 mod again reminds me of bloodborne bloodborne has trick weapons where your weapons transform based on um how you end up using them my back's really itchy so give me one second um all right i got it so uh bloodborne has trick weapons where um your weapon kind of has like dual parts that you can combine to like make them strong or whatever there's one weapon i believe it's called ludwig's holy blade and that was the one that i primarily used in bloodborne it has a it's it's similar to Jean's weapon in a sense. It has it's just a great sword. There's no shield, but it's a great sword. Um, but it's just a regular sword, and the sheath is really like wide and heavy, and it's on your back. And when you do the trick weapon, you take your sword, you put it in your sheath, and then it becomes a great sword. So this again, going back to the whole Bloodborne Dark Souls thing, this felt very much like a Dark Souls Bloodborne fight, especially when the Grim kind of entered its second phase, and this weapon, again, complemented the fact of it being, like, Bloodborne, because his weapon fucking transformed. So he had a great sword. So right now, I'm probably gonna blow your fucking minds, like, right off of your free... I'm, I'm about to, like, blow your minds, like, right off of your head. So. I just went back there to grab something. I bought this. I bought this in 2014, I believe? I bought this during Ruby Volume 2. This right here. This is the Jean... Uh, you can see the box in the corner over there. This is the Jean um, McFarlane Toys figure that's in the background there with like my other Ruby figures and whatnot. What would, what would you say if I told you that Rooster Teeth has been foreshadowing this since Volume 2? I've known about this since Volume 2. I wasn't as excited or surprised. I didn't know, like, they didn't tell me. I've known about this forever. And here's how. So this is Jean. This is the sword that he uses to fight in the episode. This is his shield. Okay? I'm about to blow your fucking minds. Okay? <laughs> so, this shield has a little slit on the very top of it. I realized this after I did my unboxing for it on my channel. If you take this slit, 
and you put it on the sword, like so, his sword is now a great sword. They literally fucking called this two volumes back. At least two volumes back when this was created. I lost my fucking mind. I literally lost my absolute fucking mind when they did this. I could not fucking believe it. And I said to myself, like, mind you, like, I discovered this two years ago. So this was just in the back of my fucking head for two years. And I think at one point during my volume two reviews, I mentioned, I was like, oh, that'd be so cool if he ever did like a, like a fucking, like a, like a great sword, like using his shield. But we would have never known in volume two because A, the fall of Beacon didn't happen. B, Pyrrha didn't die. C, he didn't get any modifications to his, you know, to his, to his shield and sword at all. So it's like, how the fuck would you know that unless you thought ahead of time like i said i don't know like i said i don't know if this was planned i don't know if mcfarlane just did this for whatever but this is foreshadowing at like the highest order like you would never ever ever figure this out unless you have this figure you realize that and you tried it for yourself uh because i've never ever heard anyone else mention this this is like the first time like i I'm, I'll, I'll be the first to say that I thought of this first, um, as far back as Volume 2 when I bought this figure, but, um, yeah, so I'll give you guys a minute to kind of cope with that realization of how crazy it is that <laughs> that fucking thing happened, um, I just couldn't believe it, I was like, they foreshadowed that in their merch at least two years ago during Volume 2. So, it was during Volume 2, so, the finale now, so that's literally two volumes ago. Um, yeah, that's some next level fucking foreshadowing. <laughs> the shield has been his sheath, but it's like... To, to, to know that the sheath is still there on the sword or on the on the shield after it like transforms is like it's like it, I almost feel like that's like too good to be true you know what I mean like how would we have ever known that 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 eventually the sheath would have become would have became like an extend extended blade essentially um I just thought that was super cool like again like I said I don't think I don't know if Rooster Teeth had that planned I don't know if McFarlane had that planned or whatever but when you put it like that like when you look back on it like holy shit like you could have easily pieced that together and just had that as a thing that you would have gonna you were gonna do in the future also Rooster Teeth did mention in the past that they were planning on weapon modifications I think someone asked during volume like after volume two finished and they said they said that they were planning like weapon mods um, so, again, that could have also been a reference to that point. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I just thought I'd mention that because this, like, when I saw that, I wasn't necessarily surprised because i was like wait i've seen this before where have i seen this before oh yeah uh the figure <laughs> so um i thought that was super cool and then like the obviously it's an upgrade so it does more damage than just his rinky dink sword so it's now a great sword has way more heavy hits has way more attack power and um he was actually able to like actually attack the grim and do damage this was a very interesting scene right here like jean looks at the grim and the Grimm and him just exchanged, like, looks. Like, the Grimm was just like, did you just do that to me? And Jean's like, like, Jean's just fierce as fuck. Like, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna fight you. And, um, <laughs> I just thought that that was, like, a super, uh, like, the Grimm actually just stopped and looked at him. I was like, what is this Grimm thinking? Like, you're actually stopping to, like, like, look down your opponent. Again, John really shines this 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 fight. Like he's not like he's not the one who kills the Grim or whatever, but he very much is like a component throughout the entire fight. That's like he's his presence is there. He definitely didn't have a presence previous volumes, but um, 
<laughs> That's savage as fuck. Yeah. Um. <clears throat> yeah, broadsword essentially. <laughs> what you think he's interested, like Tyrion? I don't really know why or if there was any significance to why Tyrion said that Jean interests him, aside from maybe seeing the fact that Jean might have potential in a fight. Um, like, who the hell is Tyrion? Like, why would Tyrion know anything of Jean to consider that he's someone of interest? Um, you know, on, on top of the fact, Tyrion's just a psychopath, so he could have just been interested for the sake of being interested, um, or for the sake that Jean gave him, like, a, like that similar look. Similar to how this Grim is just looking at him like, dude, you want to say something to me? Like, you want to do something? So, he just had that look. Maybe maybe it was just that that triggered him. But, um, <laughs> did you just cut me? <laughs> Pretty much. Uh, also, shout out to all of you guys. We have 855 people in the chat right now. Um... I've been streaming for an hour and 20 minutes for any of you guys who are just joining. We're still talking about the early stages of the uh, the Knuckle fight between Team Ranger. And um, I've kind of just been going over my thoughts from scene to scene. So there's not... You, you, you still have the mass of the of the rest of the stream to look forward to. So, um... <laughs> cash me outside, how about that? <laughs> you know, I only just found out about that, um... You know, I only just found out about that meme, like, last week. I never even knew about that. Because I don't really watch TV or anything like that. But, dude, memes just... Overnight, dude, they, they, they're just formulated and they just go on... A, like, they just go... Like, wildfire, essentially. Like, literally overnight. So, Jean's look, like, triggered that Grim to, like, the nth degree. Because he basically was like, Well, fuck this shit. I'm just gonna start wailing on everybody. And then Jean's expression immediately changed <laughs> and as he tried to run away he got like hit in the back and dropped to the floor um but this again this is well first off this is like terrifying in of itself because the grim is literally spinning its spine and its front and its head are like in two different spots so like that's just like some grudge shit right there um on top of the fact that's like it's spinning like a like and it has like a crazy amount of range like the entire courtyard's worth so um this, again, just goes to the whole point of why the Grim was so... I feel like it's lived for so long and it's killed for so long. And it's, um... It's thrived and it's learned for so long. It's just because it... Like, you never... Like, I wasn't fucking expecting that. I was like, what the hell is it gonna do? Oh, of course. Just start freaking spinning around and killing... And attacking people. <laughs> Basically, Crash Bandicoot spinning, essentially. Um... <laughs> Yeah, Beyblade Grim. Yeah, part Tasmanian Devil. Oh my god, I remember Tasmanian Devil from Looney Tunes. Dude, that is such a fucking throwback. <clears throat> the Grim has anger issues. It looked at Jean and was like, fuck this kid. And then he just started spinning and he just started attacking everybody. I just thought that was really funny. Like, It was almost like Jean's look triggered the Grim to do that. Uh, so I thought that was great. And then this is where... I start getting super fucking hyped. This is similar to the whole... Again, going back to the whole Dark Souls Bloodborne thing. Like, they're doing enough to this Grim to where the Grim needs to step it up. It needs to take it to the next level. So it kind of goes through, like, an evolution. Like, it has, like, the spikes growing out of its back. If you notice, like, the stitching of its mouth rip apart once it does this shout. And this shout, again, was kind of impairing them. Like, they couldn't hear. They had to, like, cover their ears and stuff. And, again, I thought it was very Attack on Titan. I was waiting for Grim to start spreading, like, fucking roaming into the freaking... Like, stampeding, rather, into the freaking... Into this village and to help it out or whatever. I was just wondering. I was like... First off, I was like, you've only screamed like that a couple of times. Like, it, what's the... Like, why are you doing that? Like, are you doing that for any particular reason uh, or, or whatnot? So, I, I just thought it was super cool, too, because it just... I love... Whoever does, like, the noises for the Grim is, like, a fucking, like, he's just, like, really awesome. Uh, like, he, I, I think it's one person does the voices for, like, or the sound effects or the efforts, whatever, for all of the different types of Grim that we see, like, one person. Uh, so I think it's super demonic and terrifying of how this Grim almost has, like, two overlapping, like, sound effects as it's, you know, going through, like, whatever it's doing, like, with its shouts. So I think that was super cool. And, um... 
again, like, this felt very much like, okay, phase two of a boss fight, phase two of a Dark Souls run. So, uh, <laughs> ripped vocal cords, essentially. Like, it literally ripped the stitchings off its mouth with that scream. And you can kind of see, like, the, the spare parts of the, of the stitching on the bottom part of the mouth, uh, of the jaw, rather. And his mouth is just, like, a gaping maw of fucking, like, fiery inferno. Um, but yeah, I, I think that was super cool to just see how that, like, just to see... Holy shit, like, this Grim is actually, there's more to this Grim, it actually evolves. The horse I was kind of disappointed in, if I'm, if I, if I gotta be completely honest. Um, <laughs> you're not you when you're hungry. Oh god, grab a Snickers. That's really clever of you. I don't know what they're yelling about. <laughs> the nightmare, what nightmares do roost, does Rooster Teeth have? I honestly think this Grim is so fucking sick. Like, they did an awesome job designing it and kind of flushing it out. Granted, it kind of lived and died during its same... Like, it kind of, like, was shown off and died in the same episode. Obviously, you would have had to have done that. But the Grim... The horse doesn't really add anything other than the Other than the fact of this Grim has a uh, height advantage, you know, because of, like, the whole horse stature. And then it has mobility because the horse actually can pick up speed and gallop and stuff like that. But other than that, like, most of the work was done from the upper half. You know, I was expecting the, the horse to, like, breathe fire or breathe poison. A lot of people were talking about, you know, the Nukalavi of Mythos can actually breathe poison. So a lot of people thought, like, that was what it was going to do. The horse didn't really add much to the, the, the dynamic of the fight other than what I already mentioned. So, um, this right here. Rooster Teeth likes to play around. Almost too much likes to play around with the fan base, whether it's Ruby Chibi with its, you know, fan shippings, or, like, I felt like I was being taken for a ride towards the end of the fight, uh, not taking, well, in retrospect, I felt like I was taken for a ride, because, um, since volume three, I feel like everybody's been on edge with expecting someone to die this volume, uh, me, myself, I wasn't totally like someone is absolutely definitely going to die, but based on, you know, other, you know, supplementary series out there that I watch that kind of give, me, like, maybe I feel like inspiration of other shows give me mind, like, give me a mindset of how I perceive things going on in Ruby. Like, for example, I, uh, for anyone who's seen the anime Akame Got Kill, um, it's, you know, it's, it's an, it's okay, especially, it falls off towards the end after, like, the whole thing with, with dying kind of becomes numbing, but essentially... Whenever a character gets character development in that show, they are most likely going to die in that same episode or the next episode. So, because I watched the comic I killed him because I knew that, I was like, I really hope Rooster Teeth isn't going that route. With showing us, like, Ren and, like, they, they kind of foreshadowed, foreshadowed the grim footprint in the first, in the second episode. Then we saw it again in the episode where they split off. And then Kuro Yuri, we get the backstory of Ren and Nora. The latter half of this volume was very focused on Ren and Nora on top of that. So we're getting all this development with these characters. And then we see this deadly grim that they're going to fight. And I'm thinking, I really hope... <clears throat> I really hope that... And I'm by the way, I'm talking about Akame got killed the anime. I don't know how the manga goes. Because I know the anime and manga are different towards the end. But, um... I really was just... I was like, I really hope they don't go the route of that I'm thinking of giving development for these characters, having us attached to these characters for so long, and then immediately kill them off. And this was the first instance when when Ren gets pinned to the tree uh, to the building, and Nora instantly swings in to save him, and then it cuts to black, no s silence on top of that, no cues, no sound effects, nothing. Like it's just. Ren's there, the other claw's coming in, you see a glimpse of Nora, and then it cuts to black. So, I felt like we were being taken on a ride for the sake that, does that mean she got killed? Did she get impaled saving him? What's happened to Nora? Because we know Ren is fine. And then it turns out, no, we were just messing. She's fine. And at that point, I was like, you motherfuckers, do not do that to me. That's like what they did with fucking Blake last volume, like, when Adam cut her head off. For that split second, I thought, like, they just, like, fuck it, we're killing everybody. And because of what happened, like, Amber died, and Cinder got the maiden powers, and Yang got her arm cut off. Like, that was too, that was so much to take in, that when I saw that with Blake, I was like, 
what the fuck's happening? Like, I literally did not know what was ha- I was like, what the fuck is happening? So, I'm not a big fan of, of fake-outs. Especially when it comes to death. I'm not gonna be like, I was angry, I was up in arms, and don't mess with my emotion. I wasn't like that, but, like, in hindsight, I was just thinking, like, damn, Rooster Teeth, like, you were really... <laughs> you were really playing it up that Nora was gonna die, or Ren was gonna die, you know, like, that was the scariest moment of the episode for me, it was like, please do not tell me Nora is dead, because I mentioned that too, I, I said, God forbid, like, God forbid, but if you were to kill off Ren or Nora, you would have to kill them both, like, you'd have to, like, you would not, you couldn't, like, you couldn't leave one alive without the other, the other would essentially die with, like, like, a loss of will, like, the other person would just exist, they wouldn't even be living anymore without the other person, so, I, I personally felt like, if, if Nora's dead, then they're gonna, then Ren's gonna die this episode too, like, that's what I was, like, when I saw that cut to black, I was like, if Nora's dead, Ren's gonna die in the end, like, they're both gonna die, so, um, and I don't want to be that guy that's like, oh, who's gonna die this volume, you know, because I don't, I, like, death is very impactful for me, like, I don't, I don't consider, like, oh, okay, so they killed someone in volume fo- fo- uh, three, so they're gonna do it in volume four, in volume five, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. um, I'm expecting death in the future, just because I feel like that's just par for the course of what everything's building up, like, this big war, I feel like we're gonna have another great war with Salem and, you know, whatever factions are going to support her, whatever faction is gonna support Ozpin, especially the end credit scene, it seems like, you know, shit's, like, going off on the, like, conspiracies are happening and shit like that, people don't know who to trust, and it's just gonna erupt into another, another great war, essentially, so, um, I'm just glad that she didn't die, I, I will say that, Seeing this and seeing that, oh, it's off at a very, oh, look at that, she's up there with her hammer. So she, like, came in at an angle and stopped the claw from killing Ren, essentially. Um, granted, I will say, though, neither of their aura was depleted at this point. So I don't know if, maybe that strike, since it came in so fast and so on point, it could have essentially, it could have easily broken the aura and killed him. So, I'm not going to sit here and be like, oh, they can't get hurt until the aura is depleted. That could have essentially gone past the, the point of his aura depleting. Um, and then, essentially, vitally wounding him. Or fatally wounding him, rather. <laughs> but yeah, so, this scene right here was adorable. In hind- like, just based on the fact of the situation that they're in, and how... How, like, the situation that, though, it's like, it's a dire situation, you just almost risked your life to save him, and the first thing that you're worried about is Ren, like, looking up your skirt, which, which I thought it was, like, it, it was such an anime moment, like, the, the, the traditional upskirt anime moment, like, I feel like we've all seen that at least once in a particular anime of, like, the wind blowing and you get a catch of panties, or, or you have, like, a pervert, a perverted character in an anime that's just, like, that kind of character, um, you always have those in, like, that's a traditional Japanese, very anime, I guess, trope or, or, or tradition or something that you always see in an anime, so, to see it in this felt so fucking, I was just like, holy shit, like, that's such an anime moment, and she's like, stop looking, and I, I feel like he wasn't looking, but because she put that in his head, like, oh, wait, from this angle, it makes it seem like I am looking, but I'm not looking, so I'll look away, um, but then this scene right here, oh, hold on a second, let me back up real quick, ah, this back scene right here, the bottom one, she has, like, a little smirk at the end, like, I know you were looking, I'm fine with it, I'm cool with it, she's just trying to play hard to get right now, essentially, 900 people in the chat, thank you guys so much, we're only an hour and a half, so I feel like, <laughs> I wanna, I wanna think that we're making good progress, but, uh, we're an hour and a half in, but yeah, she has like a little smirk, like as he's looking away, and she's like, so how was it? So, you know what I mean? And another thing, I think Monty kind of implemented this, like, concept for people to realize, because if, like, we personally can't, like, see, like, we see frills on Ruby and Nora's skirt if they were in an upward, you know, position. Like, from the scene that, from the shot that we saw from her dangling with the, with the thing, we saw f- the frills of her skirt. And I think Monty kind of put it in a way, which is, the characters in the universe don't see those frills. The characters in the universe see, you know, the panties or or whatever. Like, they see what we don't see. And that's for viewer discretion. Like, they don't want 
upskirt scenes of like Ruby or 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 Weiss or whatever or 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 Nora, but they want to keep that context within the show itself. So Nora's saying stop looking. It's because when Ren looks up, if he was looking, he'd be looking literally up her skirt. Whereas we don't see any of that because obviously it's just I guess in, in kind of bad taste if we did. So um that's essentially the, the concept that Monty kind of created when, when it came to having the characters with the skirts and the frills. At least I think that's, I think I remember hearing like an interview about that because I personally didn't come up with that. So I did hear to some extent that that is a concept in the show that, because I remember I, I saw someone reading uh, my comments. They were like, what's Nora worried about? Oh, no, 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 it wasn't mine. I think it was somebody else's video or a comment on Facebook, that they were like, what's Nor worried about looking up, like, looking up her skirt? What is he going to see, frills? And it's like, no, she, he can see, we can't. So I think that's kind of cool. And it keeps it, like, rated G for kids, because up until a certain point, up until viewer discretion, um, it was a, it was a very broad range of, of, of viewers. There was no target demographic for Ruby. It was like, if you want to watch it and you like it, then it's for you. And it got more serious for a mature audience, uh, even though it, at least it started out like a kid's show, like very happy-go-lucky, very, you know, sunshine and rainbows, and no one's gonna die in this show, and, you know, all this other kind of quirky stuff. So, and it felt, it feels very much like, I, I think it almost feels like Harry Potter. Like, Harry Potter has, like, a wide demographic, but as the books get further and further, like, book four, I think book five is what really pushed it over in terms of its mature setting. Um, I feel like it's very much like that, like, kids, adults, elderly people, everyone knows about Harry Potter, everyone watch. like, I, I'm not gonna say everyone, everyone knows about it, maybe not everyone's read, read it or watched it, but that kind of theme shift and coming of age point seems very apparent in Ruby, um, where it took three years before they were like, hey, we know younger audiences watch this show, maybe have a parent buy in case, you know, something happens that you're not particularly expecting. <sighs> yeah, I'm not. It, it was. I'm not gonna say it was a kid show, but um, because it was a kid show on the surface. But this is what it was always meant to be. You know what I mean? So at the end of the day, you could say first episode of Ruby, not a kid show. Like once Ruby ends, if I ever see someone that's like, I'm watching Ruby for the first time, I can easily just say not a kid show. Versus them who's watching it and experiencing it for the first time, they're gonna take what they can get. So when they see the first episode, they're like, "Oh, it's a kid show." It's like, no, not a kid show, not at all. Obviously, we wouldn't know that because we we're not the writers and we're not staff. So we we're we're t like we perceive what we're given and we run with it. And then when it changes on us, then we have this perception of, "Oh, it was a kid show and now it's not." It's like that's how it started, but that's not how it was going to evolve over time. Yeah, this water bottle is getting a lot of freaking camera time right now. <laughs> Love the shirt. Thank you very much. It's a Cheese Master Gus shirt that I got from uh, uh, RT Extra Life 2016 in support of the kids. And, uh, you know, it went towards donations and stuff like that. <laughs> Ruby is a shonen, I guess. Yeah, it's, it, it, I could see that. It's like its own thing, you know what I mean? Like, you, you can't put Ruby in a box essentially like you can put any other anime in there it's like oh are you focused on females and magical powers you're a shoujo are you focused on like dark blood gore mature setting you're a seinen are you focused on like a mature setting probably for like kids like like teenage boys or whatever you're a shonen like ruby is like you can't really you can't be like oh are you uh are you a slice of life are you a romance what are you you know what i mean like ruby is very much like its own genre in a way and I think Barbara mentioned that too at, in an interview. She was like, you know, Ruby is kind of like, people consider it, some people consider it an anime, some people don't consider it an anime based on like, if they're purists or if the Japanese didn't work on it or or it doesn't have the same standards as a 2D animated series or whatever. But I honestly feel like it's an anime in its own right based on its inspirations, based on the fact Japan acknowledges it, you know what I mean, and runs with it. So I feel like, and that's never happened with an American like animated series i don't think that's ever happened like where it gets adopted in a different you know adapted from english to japanese it's usually the other way around so and that's rooster teeth for you you know what i mean like i feel like only rooster teeth and monty could have done something like that uh and have gotten it to the point where it is to where now it identifies as its own thing because it's it doesn't look like an anime traditionally it doesn't look like an anime um it has all of these different aspects and you know set pieces and 
uh, themes and inspirations from different works that kind of culminate to make it its own thing. You know, you have a show that has kind of like the it kind of has like the the pacing, not the pacing, but it kind of has the the theme shift of Harry Potter, the world aspect and building concept of like Avatar: The Last Airbender. It has its own unique animation style. You have fairy tales. You have like R Little Red Riding Hood in here. You have Goldilocks in here. You have the Monkey King in here. You have Mulan. You have Thor. Like you literally have all of these things. They're just emulated and represented differently. And it's like, what what other thing does that? Nothing else does that. So, um, yeah. And that was Monty's goal. Like he wanted it to be an anime, and you know now it is. You know, it's on Crunchy. Like, how are you gonna... You can't really deny... Like, you can personally deny it. Like, it's not, it's not, it's not. But when it's acknowledged by... You know, it's on Crunchyroll. What's on Crunchyroll? Anime. Netflix, anime section. Ruby's there. Uh, you know, just because... I understand, like, just because you say it's an anime doesn't mean it is an anime. But to say... It has an anime feel, so why not? You know what I mean? And I'm kind of drudging up back on the, the topic on the uh, fan service podcast. Which, by the way, fan service is coming back uh, next week, I believe. 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. No, this weekend, fan service is returning February 11th. And I'm so happy because I want to I want to get back into more anime and I haven't watched anything since it ended back when I watched Yuri on Ice. So, um, so yeah, I mean, to each his own, I'm not going to sit here and be like, no, it is an anime, you're wrong. If you want to think it, go ahead, that's fine. Uh, I personally feel like it is honorary anime, especially. <clears throat> yeah, an honorary anime. Yeah. Not a title I give lightly. <laughs> Well, thank you very much for that. I appreciate it. Uh, Ruby appreciates it. The Cheese Master shirt is glorious. Yeah, Cheese Master, dude. I, I didn't... I actually... This was my first RT... Well, this year was my first... Well, 2016 was my first RTX, but I didn't know about Cheese Master. So when I ordered the shirt, after that live stream ended, a couple days later, I watched Art, uh, Extra Life 2015 when this happened. And I couldn't... I was laughing hysterically. Like, Gushy was like... <laughs> I am the cheese man. Like, where the fuck did that come from? So, um... No, fan service didn't get cancelled. It just got... It didn't get cancelled. It got, um... Like, the season ended. So it just had a season one, and now it's coming back. It's greenlit for season two. That's coming out soon. Just, like, uh... Always open and stuff like that. So anyways, drudging up on this point, like, way too long. But yeah, Nora was liking it, and Ren was kind of flustered. So, but then right here is where... Again, Rooster Teeth taking us for a ride. For some reason, I don't apply the concept of aura when I'm in the moment. What I mean by that is... Yeah, day five. Yeah, that's what it was. It was day five that was returning. I'm so fucking happy for that. <laughs> what is RT fan service? It's Rooster Teeth's anime podcast that, that comes on... That's live every Friday. Uploaded on Saturdays for first members. I think it's only first members. It's a, it's a first members only... Um, production. It's Rooster Teeth's anime podcast. It comes out on Fridays live, and then it comes out on Saturdays on the Rooster Teeth site for first members. That's why it doesn't come out on YouTube, because it's only for first. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so like, like I was saying, I don't apply the concept of aura when I'm in the moment. What I mean by that is, the concept, like, when I'm in the middle of, like, when, when intense shit is happening like this, like a fight or whatever, understand like i understand the concept that like or is there to protect you and the stakes become deadly once your aura depletes that is completely lost on me when i'm in the moment like i'm not gonna sit here and be like oh shit they're fighting this grim it's crazy it's deadly but i'm not gonna take it seriously and i'm not gonna be serious about it because i haven't seen anyone's aura deplete so up until that point they're fine uh, that's lost on me. Like, I don't go into it like that. I feel like that breaks the immersion to some extent. If you're just waiting for Aura to deplete before you start getting, um, worried for the characters. I, I was worried for the characters before the fucking Grimm even showed up. So, um, but my, but my, 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 my worries and my fears are elevated, like, immensely once I see Aura breaking. Um... That's how it was, like, with Pyrrha. Like, any time Aura breaks, it's like, you will die now. Or you're you're about to die, or you could die. So I felt like, okay, they already teased us once. Not even teased us, because I didn't want that to happen. But they're already playing us for fools once with, you know, the con like, with the initial 
cut to black moment of, oh shit, did Nora die? Now I'm actually, like, trembling with fear because her aura is now broken. And they follow up with doing the same thing for Ren. So now I'm just like, so, so initially I was like, oh my god, they're gonna die. And then I was like, okay, they're safe. And now I'm like, oh shit, now they're gonna die. And now both of them are within, like, death's grasp, essentially. So I, I, I was just all over the place this volume, uh, this chapter rather, just because it was like, I felt like I was, like I said, in retrospect, when I went back and watched it, I was like, Rooster Teeth really took us for a fucking ride, and I don't know if a lot of people would appreciate that. Um, <clears throat> Shadow Wolf, how's it going, dude? Thank you for joining the stream. But yeah, I, I just felt like, like, damn, dude, like, don't do that to us, you know? And uh, this is where Ren kind of really, like, once I kind of realized, oh, shit, that's what Ren's going for, where he was, like, he didn't care. He didn't care about, he didn't care about anything. He was just lost in his emotions. He was lost in his anger. And, again, it goes back to Ren is not in his character element. This is so out of Ren's character, which is why it's a lot more serious. Similar to, like I said, with Yang. Like, Yang, from happy-go-lucky, you know, party girl, awesome, quirky, cool chick, to doom and gloom, I hate everything, I don't want to do anything, I just want to be a couch potato and just sit here. Like, total out-of-character moments, which make me feel like, I want to see how you bounce back from that, you know, how are you going to improve, how are you going to bounce back from that, but Ren, unlike, unlike, you know, Yang, who spent most of her time in bed and at home watching TV, getting over herself, um, Ren was in, in danger, you know what I mean, like, he's fighting a Grim, and the last thing you want to do is lose your head in a fight, you're, ex you're exactly, you're, oh my god, I didn't even realize this, but essentially, he's replicating what not to do in a fight, he's replicating Yang right now, Tai Yang, I feel like, holy shit, dude, that wasn't just a, <laughs> that wasn't just a speech Tai was making, he was essentially saying, Anybody shouldn't be in that situation, not just Yang. You gotta keep a level head, keep cool, think before you act, and that's exactly what Ren's not doing. He's not trying to die, but he's not trying to go out like a punk either, you know what I mean? So, I I, I feel like... Oh my god. <laughs> Sashomaru Flash, Ren turned Yangry. Let's, uh... Let's give Sashomaru Flash some acknowledgement for that. Good job, dude. <laughs> Sashomaru Flash, everybody. <laughs> yeah, like, um... It's a big weakness. Yeah, I get that. And that that essentially was just like... I, I, I guess that was just nightmare fuel for the Grim. Because it's just like, wow, this guy's pissed. He's angry. That's what I fucking feed off of. This is great. And... <clears throat> Oh, don't boo him. Jesus Christ. I'm sorry, Sashomaru. It was, uh, it was in good taste, but, uh, we don't approve of that around these parts. <laughs> wow. <clears throat> but yeah, um, it was just very, and the worst part was, like, he realized what he was, I guess he realized what he was, he was, he didn't realize what he was doing, that was the big thing, and Jean himself was like, Ren, knock it off, like, stop, what are you doing, you're not supposed, like, what the fuck are you doing, like, you're, you're throwing us all off with just running and gunning, you know what I mean, and for Jean to say that says a lot, it says a lot on the fact of, like, dude, this isn't you, you need to snap the fuck out of it. I understand you're mad, you're angry, you're frustrated. You're looking your past in the face. You're looking at what took your mother, your father, your family, your home away from you. And I get that. And you want. Re and he's on a revenge path right now. And <laughs> if Naruto taught me anything, it's that, yeah, probably don't go down the path of revenge because it's not going to end well. You know? So, <sighs> I, I, I was just like... It's moments like this, again, moments like this that make me super thankful that Ren has Nora, you know? Even when he's down, even when he's fucking down, he's still, like, hungry for just, like, he just wants to, like, fight, and, like, that's it. And, um, it, it, it sucks, you know what I mean? Like, it's, it's a very human thing, you know? Everyone goes through it differently, though, you know, instead of being absorbed in anger and hatred and, and, and revenge, like, 
Jean is applying himself differently. You know what I mean? Like, maybe that is his end goal. You know, maybe he's training all this time to one day be able to face the person who killed Pira to kind of have that moment, to kind of prove himself and to get revenge for her death. Ruby has lost so much, but it doesn't mean, like, she's going to go down this warpath of vengeance. Ren is obviously a lot more honorable. Like, that's basically what his whole character scheme is based off of. He's based off Chinese tradition, based off Mulan, and the Chinese tradition is based solely on, like, honor. Like, it's honorable for a warrior to die in battle than anything else. So, maybe he saw this as, you know, I have to kill this thing, and if I die, then I'm gonna go out, like, an, I'm gonna go out like a warrior, and I'm gonna try my best to avenge my family. And... Again, like, in the top... Uh, another cool thing, too. I don't know if Ren's aura is a little bit more purple, like the strand of his hair. But either that or Ren and Nora have pink aura. Which I think is a cool, like, little match made in heaven for both of them, too. For, like, Renora or whatever. Just for the shipping factor. Which became, essentially, confirmed this this chapter, which was great. It didn't even be... I never even questioned it. It wasn't a, it wasn't a question of... Uh, it wasn't a question of if, it was more of a question of when, for me. Like, I, it was never a doubt in my mind, it was like, I wonder if Ren and Nora are gonna get together, it was always, when are Ren and Nora are gonna get together, you know what I mean? It was just clear as day, it was clear as fucking day that that was gonna happen, it just, developments had to occur, and the time had to be right for that to happen. So, um, <laughs> nice rhyme, bro. I didn't even realize that rhyme, what, did I rhyme? Um... What did you miss? I've been streaming for a little under two hours, so uh, I'm up to the point now where, like, Ren is kind of, like, crazy bloodlusty trying to fight this Grimoff, and uh, shout out to my girl Nora here for fucking... Again, like I said, I'm so thankful for Nora because she is the per... Like, look at the top scene right there. Like, she's just, like... I'm fucking pissed off at you right now. Why are you acting like this? And she just, like, grabs him and just throws him under the freaking building with her. And, um... That right there, that that just shows that when one person's down, the other person's there to lift them back up. And when one person, you know, needs a kick in the right direction, that uh, that per that other person will be there to kick them in the right direction, or throw them, or grab them into the right direction. Uh, and that's essentially what Nora is to Ren, vice versa. Um, you know, and I feel like this is a great way for her to kind of show that she cares, especially when you see, like, the, the flashback moment, like, of seeing her young self and then her older self, and seeing that, like, damn, Ren, you were there for her, and she's trying to help you out, what are you gonna do, like, come on, get your get your shit together, so, <laughs> yeah, Ren needed to slap, snap out of it, essentially, and, um, I just love the bottom scene too, like, she's just so, like, she, she's like stiff as a board as she's just putting all of her momentum and, and, and force into just pulling him under the, cause the Grim was charging towards them also, so, <laughs> to the left, everything you own, so yeah, so like, they, they both go under the building, I think this is the same building that they were both under when they were kids, just saying, just saying, it looks like it, kind of, from, like, a different angle, from, like, where, from when they, like, both were under it, when they showed, like, the big scene of the building in the background. I'm sorry, from the top-down view. Um, and then on top of that, it shows her under that building as a kid, and then it, like, it, like, when, when Ren's looking at, like, a past version of her, and then it shows, like, it shows the same background, and then it shows it again there, so I would, that'd be kind of cool if it, if it was the same building, like, yo, this is where we first met. That would have been a kind of a great opportunity for a first kiss, I guess. Like, yo, this is where we first met. Granted, under different, I wish it would have been under different circumstances, and I wish we weren't into this in this predicament. But uh, I think that would have been kind of crazy. I think the fandom would have just lost their shit if it was like, oh shit, it really came back. Like, who thought they'd be back where they met each other years later? Um... <laughs> <clears throat> Let's see. Yeah, it is. Oh, okay. Yeah, there were a lot of slaps. Uh, <laughs> freaking uh, Sun got a couple. Ren got one this volume, uh, this chapter. Yeah, and it was at this point that uh, I was kind of eased. I was like, okay, she's going to snap him out of it. I feel like at this point, both of their auras are gone. If she can kind of get through to him, it'll set myself at ease of not feeling like you two are going to die in a gruesome way. 
and and whatnot by the way shout out to ruby rose this chapter i mean yeah this chapter this fight scene she was doing like all these fucking cool crazy like at one point she was like shooting crescent rose like from behind her back like she was just trick shotting the whole time i didn't really take much screenshots of her because i felt like it was very renora focused and mainly like even jean focused at some points but ruby was definitely like an awesome support uh you know suppressive fire trick shots like i said like from the start to finish which i thought was super fucking cool so um Shout out to Jean again, because Jean is that boy, dude. Like like I said, came an incredibly long way, held his ground as long as he did, you know, kind of... He was the one who stopped the Grim, like, after they went into the building. I was like, what the hell? Like, what happened to the Grim? And he got Jean there fucking holding him down. <laughs> so, again, Jean has come an incredible long way, and again, I feel so bad for people who, you know, who, uh... Not, like, look down on him, but just, you know... They, I don't know, they, they don't take him seriously. And he's come such a long way, you know? He's a tank during, yeah, essentially, he was just the one taking all the beatings and dealing the heavy damage and trying to suppress the enemy while everyone else got their shit together. Yeah, like, Jean has come such a long way from Vomit Boy. You know what I mean? Chapter 2, well, no, not even, Chapter 1, Vomit Boy, like, on the freaking airship, to where now he's like... Staring death in the face and just giving it all he has as a strategic team leader, which is great. I don't know. I just I just feel like... Uh, for people who sleep on Jean, it's like, dude, he's come such a long way. Like, and if it takes you rewatching the episodes or even going back to chapter 1 and 2 of the first volume, like, those two moments, those two episodes alone just show how far he's come. Kristen, how's it going? Thank you for joining the stream. Yeah, Jean's class is Paladin, absolutely. Yeah, that, that definitely makes a lot more sense now. Paladin more than tank, because paladins are kind of like both sides of the spectrum. <clears throat> oh, it's Vomit Man now. <laughs> Ruby doing quick shots, 360 no scopes. <laughs> Pretty much, uh, in, a, in a way. Like, she had it behind her back, but she was just still on point with it. So, um, yeah, so we got this part right here. By the way, I made a meme out of this. I'm pretty sure some of you guys are upset with me, who, whoever saw the memes on Twitter. Uh, but yeah, there was a clenched fist scene in every chapter of Ruby Volume 4. And I clipped one every chapter, and I posted it to Twitter, and I got so much... Like, obviously it was in, in good fun, but a lot of people were like, God damn it, Arnold, stop, please. <laughs> some of the Rooster Teeth animation staff was just like, Arnold, please stop, like... Please. And I was just like, you guys are giving me ammunition. Like, every chapter I look for it, and every chapter I find it, because you guys, you guys set, you guys set yourself up. Like, you guys set me up so well for it. And I was like, the first time I watched the episode, I was so in the moment, I didn't notice this. So, um, my friend Matthew, actually, Matt Farley, actually showed me this in our Discord call the other day. Um... Or uh, on Saturday night, and he he actually put that together for me because because I was gonna go back and rewatch the episode, and eventually I was gonna find this, but he did the work for me. He was like, found it for you perfectly, and I was like, oh my god, a, a little a little sneak a, a little tidbit of information. Um, uh, uh, Carrie is the director for Ruby, so Carrie kind of directed like all the scenes and stuff and how he wanted the volume to play out. He didn't know Kim Newman. She's an animator. She told me that she showed carry the arthur meme and like she showed him these and he had no idea about the arthur meme before starting ruby so essentially this was just like a match made in heaven for me based on the fact that i knew the arthur meme and you know it, this was happening in every chapter so <laughs> i kind of want to do an arthur meme video based on all the memes that i found throughout the volume for people who don't follow me on twitter who haven't seen them but uh yeah i thought it was super fucking cool <clears throat> yeah uh guys in the chat do not type in all caps because you guys will get your your comment will get deleted i just don't want i don't want all caps because and it's nothing against what you're saying uh, obviously i want you guys to be respectful but um i just don't want all caps because i understand people want me to see what they read but i got to keep it uh consistent for everyone yo what up michael how's it going dude i watched your uh I watched your uh, your latest video, uh, uh, Chapter 11 r review for, for Ruby. Yeah, I ended up watching all of that, dude. That was awesome. <clears throat> yeah, I'll do it. Uh, I'll absolutely do that video. Uh, I just got to find a way to formulate it well, just because I don't want it to just be a video of screenshots. I kind of want it to be somewhat entertaining. 
So, <clears throat> uh, fuck you guys. All so you guys type out all caps instead of actually putting all caps. Thanks, man. No problem, dude. Anytime. Definitely want to catch up with you soon. Now, unfortunately, Ruby's over. It's uh, it's very bittersweet. Like I've been chatting for about. I've been chatting for about two hours now. We're coming up on two hours. An hour, 58 minutes. We have 904 people in here. So I, I, I incredibly, I'm incredibly grateful that you guys are, um, are enjoying, have enjoyed all of the discussions and don't mind me talking and rambling. And you guys all enjoy, you know, my thoughts and opinions and what I have to say about the show and, um, you know, just doing these every every week has been great. And I'm absolutely... This is the first time I did it, too, for Volume 4. was the first time I ever did. I wanted to branch out from reactions. I just didn't feel like... The, the response that I got last year, like people donating for me to go to RTX, people subscribing to me, people sending me gifts and all that stuff, people wanting pictures and signings and stuff at RTX, I felt like for what I put out, I felt like it wasn't it didn't equate to what I got out of it, you know what I mean, like, I felt like I got way more than I deserved for the reactions that I did, because, I mean, I kind of give in to the stigma of reaction, you know, reaction videos on YouTube, and I kind of give in to the fact that, you know, some people enjoy them, but at the end of the day, it's, it's not necessarily the hardest thing in the world to do of a reaction, you know, a lot of people have started doing it for volume three and volume four, and it's very low effort, it's just based on what you're willing to put out there for people. So, um, <clears throat> I'm just glad that, uh, I branched out. I'm glad that I did more than just reactions. Like, I hyped people up for Volume 4 with the concept designs for Ren and Nora, for Team Ruby. I, I covered news like the Ruby books were coming. I covered news that, uh, of, like, the information and news from New York Comic Con. I did, uh, live stream discussions as early as the character short. Um, you know, I've been doing these live stream discussions every week since the volume started. I've been doing my reactions every volume since it started. Uh, I played the entirety of Ruby Grim Eclipse. Ruby is like, some people even have asked me too, is like, don't you ever get sick of it? Like, don't you ever get sick of Ruby? Like, you do everything on your channel, everything on Twitter that you do is revolving Ruby in some form or fashion. Don't you ever just get tired? It's like, no. Like, I am a very honest person. Like, I would never lie to anyone to, to fit like an agenda that I have or a facade like I do it because like that's just the level that I'm on with Ruby like anything to help the show anything to get another person into it to create another fan to to promote the show to have just to to make it the best that it could possibly be like that's all I care about and I I would never get sick of it ever um Especially if it's something that I love to death. Like, and I get sick of stuff all the time. Like, I can't watch too much anime at a time because then I'll go months without watching it. Uh, same thing for video games. If I play too many video games, I can't, I'll, I can't watch it. I've played Kingdom Hearts more times than I can count. Um, but it's just, you know, it's just the factor of how much do I love this and how much am I willing to go into it. So, um, give me one second, guys. My computer just went into hibernation mode. Because I haven't been moving it around and whatnot. Um, give me one second. <clears throat> oh, this is weird. This is very weird. Hmm. <clears throat> I guess my computer is just like, dude, you're talking too much. I'm going to sleep. <laughs> so uh, just give me one second. Actually, I'm going to pull out, probably have to use my phone for the chat at this point, just because um, it has something to do with like activating something or, or rather. Yeah, short intermission, I guess we're just going to have a short intermission right now um, on clip number. All right. Okay, so we're gonna, we're gonna, ah, hold on, give me one second. <clears throat> Alright, give me one sec, guys. I gotta pull up my computers, my, my chat for the stream on my phone, because my computer, my, my older laptop is just, like, not responding right now for some weird reason. So give me one minute. <clears throat> Oh, there we go. Holy shit, it's back. All right. <laughs> okay. Jesus Christ. Like I was like, what the fuck? It was so random and weird. 
All right, all right. I'm back. I'm back. I'm back. It's back up. It's back up. Uh, intermission. Arnold, you haven't done one of those. You haven't gotten through one scene yet. What do you mean? <laughs> yeah, my computer's done with my shit, dude. And I'm just finishing my first bottle of water at the two-hour mark. So, I have three bottles of water too. So essentially, we're probably gonna go for six hours. Nah, I'm just kidding. Uh, we are one third the way through with the screenshots. I'm on screenshot number six, uh, 57 right now. So I have another hundred screenshots to get through. So, yeah. <clears throat> you guys can still see me and hear me, right? Uh, I just want to make sure. I know this computer isn't tethered to anything. My streaming is going down on this laptop right now. So, uh, I just want to make sure because I can see the chat now. <clears throat> Yeah, I took 159 screenshots for this chapter, and we've only made it through about 50 of them, so... <laughs> <clears throat> yes, okay, you're good? Alright, just making sure. Just making sure. Um, <laughs> only four more hours? No, not at all. Uh, honestly, if I, if I truck through it, like, after the fight, it's like smooth sailing from there after the fight it's just gonna go from scene to scene because the second half of the episode is just ruby's monologue and then a lot of scenes in between so i'll touch up on the scenes i'll touch up on ruby's monologue as a whole and then i'll touch up on each individual scene and then after that is gonna be like okay the stream is done for the most part now we can get into theories and speculations and things of that nature yeah getting comfortable <clears throat> are you a halo fan absolutely uh, I can't say I'm a diehard Halo fan because I haven't played all the Halo games, but, 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 um, after I get my PC, I'm going to be playing Halo Master Chief Collection along with Halo 5, and I found out that Halo Reach is actually downloadable DLC for, uh, um, the Master Chief Collection, so I'm going to, I'm going to play all of the Halo games with viewers on Twitch after I get my PC, because I don't have a Kinect, and I don't want to have to set it up in a way with my Xbox One S, because the Kinect doesn't fit on my TV or on the base of my TV. So uh, I'm just going to wait until I get a PC, so that way I can just do it through my webcam. But yeah, uh, absolutely love Halo. I'm going to be playing the first two. I've played all of the Halo since Halo 3, so ODST. No, 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 it wasn't ODST. It was ODST that was the DLC. It wasn't, it wasn't Reach, or maybe Reach is also a DLC, but I know ODST is. I know Halo Reach is backwards compatible, which I already have that too, so, uh, so yeah. Um, yeah, 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 ODST, not, okay, so my, my chat is a little backed up, because I just mentioned that it's not ODST, I mean, it's not Reach, it's ODST, and then someone's like, it's ODST, not Reach, I'm like, oh, damn, so my, my chat's a little behind, <clears throat> yeah, I've beaten all the Halos that I've played on Legendary, I beat Halo Reach on Legendary by myself, because that's, I got the thousand gamer score in Halo 1, I'm sorry, Halo 3, on 360, I got the 1,000 gamer score. I actually got all the achievements in Halo 3, the 1750. In Halo 3, I got the 1,000 in ODST, uh, Reach, and I, I kind of fell off a bit after Halo 4, and I never played Halo 5. So, <clears throat> yeah, I loved ODST. A lot of people didn't. It felt more like a DLC add-on than anything else. Um, hey, Alex, I just got your message. Thanks so much, dude, if you're still in here. I appreciate it very much. Um... Yeah, so let's continue onward where I left off. My computer kind of just spooked me there for a second because it just like it was like you have to activate Windows. I'm like, but I'm on Windows. So uh, yeah, so the next scene that we have here. So this is very much a Renora moment, by the way. I'm just I'm just putting that out there. This is very much Renora at this point of her just slapping the shit out of him, being like, that's what he needed. Like he just needed her to just slap him, slap some sense into him, basically, and. Um, we all kind of realized what he was doing. You know, he was just, in a way, kind of killing himself. Not like, oh, I'm going to do this. I'm going to, you know, obviously that's not what he's thinking. But by him acting recklessly, that's essentially what you're going to lead to. You're going to get yourself killed. And she knows how much it means to him. And he knows what it means to him. But he has to go about it a different way. And she's not going to let that happen because they've been through too much for him to just throw it all away now for, you know, his emotions to get out of, you know, to get out of control and whatnot. And again... Gotta be thankful for Nora because she kind of saved his life. So he owes her. He owes her a relationship now. No, I'm just kidding. But uh, but yeah. Um, this ship will never sink. <laughs> uh, 
Oh, you're heading out. Uh, have a good night. Thank you for sticking around. Uh, you left at the two hour and eight minute mark if you're still in here. So if you want to pick back up where you left off once the stream's uploaded, you can. Uh, thank you very much for the support. Kyle Pingall, thank you for... I hope I pronounced that right. Thank you for joining the stream. Um, how's it going, man? Yeah, Major Hinata vibes right there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, Ramble of Birds is so real. Absolutely, I mean, if there was any chapter I was gonna ramble in, it had to be the finale, you know? So, um, so yeah, like I said, like, she, he very much owes her a lot in terms of, like, she, like, she, like, tossed him out of the way, she saved him from that freaking, from that grim claw piercing and killing him, and now she's trying to calm him down and get him back to his senses, so that way they can plan strategically and actually make it out together. So, together, together. But, um, yeah, you gotta love Nora for that. You absolutely have to appreciate the fact that she cares about him more than he maybe, maybe realizes at the moment. And, uh, I feel like going through something like this with someone almost kind of says the words that you need to say without saying it themselves. Like, for example, you know, Pira was always like, um... You know, uh, she, she, she liked John, but she didn't know how to convey it or get it across. It, it's very easy. Just go up to him and tell him how you feel. Easier said than done. Uh, same thing with Nora. Like, she loves Ren, but she doesn't know how to express it or, or share or say it in a way that makes, that, that doesn't leave her super exposed to, you know, rejection or whatever. So I feel like the fact that she's doing all of this stuff kind of says it for her. And the response of everything says it for her. Like, when she's, like, hugging him and holding hands and stuff like that. Like, it's clear, like, dude, she's into you. Like, don't be a Jean. Like, <laughs> uh, and, I, and I, I give him shit for that, like, mainly for Chibi. Because Chibi makes him even a billion times more oblivious. Like, a way worse. Like, way worse. Like, dude, like, I get that's the shtick. But it's, like, it's painful to see in Chibi because it's blatantly obvious. So, um, that Pira likes him. So... Um, <clears throat> let's see, <laughs> don't be a Jean, yeah, pretty much, like, if you got something to say, say it, you can, you know, you'll never get, you'll, you know, you'll never, you'll never get a yes if you don't try, you know, and if, and, you know, among dozens and hundreds of no's, someone's bound to say yes, and I'm not saying that as like, hey, someone will say yes, it's like, obviously, it's just not the person or it's not the time or it's not the moment that you need to capitalize on it you know what i mean so shout out to nora she's um best girl right now and then this moment right here just fucking broke my heart because it's like why you gotta do this why you gotta do this to me uh, <laughs> this is a, this was super 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 fucking like uh, it's like just rip my heart out of my chest right now why don't you renpai <laughs> Yeah, practice what you preach. Essentially, that's what Nora said to Pira in the first, uh, when she was talking about, like, oh, just go tell Weiss how you feel. And it's like, well, she's stubborn. Well, she was a lot more stubborn then than she is now. I'm wondering how she's going to interact with Jean come, like, whenever they, uh, come volume five, most likely, if they all get back together. But yeah, I absolutely love this scene. Like, this was such an amazing scene just because it was like it just pulled the past with the future like this is where we came from and this is where we are now and look how much look how far we've come together it we can't end it here so i love 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 that moment and i love i just love when when like series do that like they they harken back to the past to make it relevant for the future um a big part of that was the obito versus kakashi fight in shippuden um, because it phased back and forth between their training match in the past when they were kids and the match to the death that they were having uh, in the moment, like in the present. So love moments like that. Love moments like that. Absolutely. So um, we get that. And then they kind of like give each other confidence right here. Like, you got it. I got it. Like, they just give each other, like, the confidence that they need. And uh, here, too, we see Ren actually had his dad's dagger with him the whole time, like in his boot. I thought he was uh, I thought he kind of modeled the daggers after the daggers that were on his uh on his his gun stormflower i thought he like used one of them for that and then he just modeled another one but he still had the original which was great ren has no fucking chill when it came to taking out that grim he was just savage as fuck and i loved it 
it wasn't even like savagery like he wasn't enjoying what he was doing he was like this has been a long time coming and it's kind of like closure for everybody that was affected by the grim so um <clears throat> so uh so I was really happy to kind of see that he actually still had it and it, its purpose was going to be apparent <laughs> in due time. So, um this scene right here, I was kind of disappointed in a personal in a personal note because af after this point Ren and Nora, they're obviously back up to speed. They know what they have to do. They're, you know, Ren's calmed down. Ruby and J Ruby's like Jean and I will go for its arms. I wanted with every fiber in my being, I wanted Nora to say, I'll go for his legs. That was just a wasted oppor- That was such an opportunity. Like, I understand, like, obviously it'd be hard for them to do that, but it was just like, fuck. Like, she says she's going for the horse, which subsequently the legs are part of the horse, but it was, it was just like, fuck. Like, we have, like, the we'll break his legs reference from volume one. That would have been so cool to see that brought back or called back to uh especially in a moment like this like an actual fight scene that <laughs> that would have mattered it would have just been so funny to be like holy shit like we'll break it like she really is the breaker of legs uh dude when he was like i'll go for his arms and i was like nora was like i was like nora will go for his legs she's like i'll go for the horse i'm like fuck like you ruined it like that's such a missed opportunity <laughs> But I'm glad that I picked up on that. I was like, please, legs. Legs, please. So. <clears throat> Adam Warren. Uh, love you, man. Watch, love all of your videos. This is my first stream. Really enjoying it so far. Uh, depending on when you joined, I've been streaming for about 2 hours and 15 minutes. Thank you so much for joining and for enjoying these live stream discussions. Uh, or rather, my videos. If this is your first live stream discussion, um, you're on the better half of it. Because chances are it's probably going to go for another a couple more hours based on how I ramble, but thank you so much for the support, I really enjoy, I, I really appreciate it very much, and uh, hopefully you enjoy the discussions in the chat, if you guys want to, um, oh, hold on, <laughs> you had one job, Nora, one job, but yeah, thank you very much for the support, man, I very much appreciate it, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the stream, it's bittersweet that this is your first stream, because this is also the last stream of the volume, but I've already mentioned to people, I'm going to be doing this live stream discussion Every volume Ruby comes out. I feel like it's a staple now on my channel. A lot of people looked forward to it. I've gotten hundreds of viewers live, both live in the moment, and then thousands of people would watch it after it's uploaded, which was the crazy part. I was like, damn, thousands of people are going to sit through a two, three, four, five hour stream when, I, when it's not live, like when they're not in the moment. But uh, I absolutely appreciate it wholeheartedly that anybody was willing to watch those kind of videos. So um and you can also watch whatever you missed if you want to check out the early parts of the stream uh before the two hour mark when you joined or anybody for that matter these will be uploaded like the other ones are uh after i finish uh after the streams are over no it's not i i highly doubt i'm gonna try to keep it within the five hour or under we're at two hours and 15 minutes i'm at screenshot 64 right now so uh, we still have a ways to go, but like I said, if I keep rambling like this, I'm going to be here all day, but ultimately, thank you, Adam, and everybody, whether it's your first time joining, or you've been here throughout, or throughout this stream, or throughout all of them, uh, so yeah, uh, missed opportunity there for the, uh, you know, should break his legs, um, I want to ask you guys something, uh, because for this moment right here, for this scene right here, I don't watch superhero movies that much, like, uh, Iron Man, Hulk, Thor, uh, like, 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 uh, Avengers, Spider-Man, Captain America, I don't watch any of those movies, and it's not because I don't like them or anything, I just never got into comic books and superheroes, I was more of, like, a gamer and an anime person growing up, so I never kind of dwelled on that side of nerd culture, but, um, this moment reminded me of Thor, I don't know everything about, like, I know a bit about each superhero, and whatnot, but I know Thor, so first off, Thor, he, blah, blah, let me try this again, first off, Nora is based off of Thor, like, that's who her, she's inspired by, uh, that's why she, her last name's Valkyrie, which are, like, the, the beings of Valhalla, um, that's why her blade, her, her, her hammer's called, called Magenhild, which is, like, a reference to Mjolnir, which is Thor's hammer, she controls lightning, Thor is the god of lightning, uh, the thunder god or whatever so um i know like i know thor he doesn't fly but i know his hammer's like super fucking heavy so i know like he's like one of the only people that can like lift it or whatever 
So I think this moment was like a Thor moment. Like I, I think what Thor does, like he like winds up his hammer to like create like inertia and momentum, and then he throws it, and the the force like sends him flying with it, and that's how he like gets over long distances or essentially creates the illusion that he's flying. I think that was what this was go what what this moment was supposed to be going for was like a Thor flying up up moment or something like that. Um. Yeah, so that that's like the only reference that I wanted to address with this scene right here. I just thought it was a, a, a superhero moment or a Thor moment. Correct murder. This is a Thor reference. Oh, okay. Nice. <laughs> Beam me up. <laughs> Air Valkyrie. Wow, like Air Jordan. Jesus. <laughs> oh, it's not heavy per se. It 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 all has to do with if you're worthy or not. Okay. Well, again, like I prefaced, I'm not really that, I'm not really that versed in in uh, superhero mythos, so I appreciate that. Oh, you geeked out during that scene? Well, I mean, if for any superhero fans, if Thor fans, if they if they noticed that, I'm pretty sure that was a pretty awesome scene for them to see. Uh, so yeah, uh, they actually coordinate and plan like, okay, Ruby and John will take out the arms. Nora will deal with the horse. Ren was like, I got everything else. It's like, yeah, you're gonna kill it basically. So. Uh, strategic wise, I really like how they, they worked this out. Like, again, Ruby was doing a lot of trick shotting before she came and impaled it. Uh, big, like, the Grim is kind of flawed in a way because it would, like, extend its arms and attack a target, and then it would just keep its arms there. Like, it wouldn't retract it back, which is why it was able to get pinned by Ruby initially, and then at that point it just set itself up for failure. Um, Jean and Ren's combo attack was super fucking cool. Probably my favorite part of the bunt, uh, uh, my favorite part of, like, the team orientation of it. Because at one point I realized, I was like, wait, why, why doesn't Jean have his, like, why doesn't he have, like, his great sword? Like, why isn't it, like, super fucking cool and awesome and whatnot? I was like, where's his shield? And then Ren was chilling on the building on the side, just waiting for the right moment, and he just came in perfectly. I love how, I love the team, like, the team synergy of that. And Jean was there as, like, a decoy. Again, Jean might be, like, a goofball or whatever. He might come off as one. But I feel like everything he does is very based on strategy and based on, like, outwitting your opponent or having your opponent underestimate you. So Jean just shined completely this fight. And a huge portion of their success was due to his leadership, especially. <clears throat> that sack. <laughs> yeah, Ren's, like, Ren's like been, been playing football or something, I guess. Um... I just thought that was a super fucking cool moment right there. <clears throat> City Girl 45415. Um, thank you for sticking around in the chat. I'm sorry you have to go so early, but you're leaving at 2 hours and 20 minutes. So if you ever want to come back afterwards and pick up where you left off, I appreciate it. Uh, thank you as, again for sticking around, and you have a good night. Jean is Link. He's a strategist. <laughs> That's the team. Yeah, pretty much. <clears throat> Waiting for Death Blossom. Jesus. Death Blossom. That's Reaper, right? Because I think uh, I think Jin from League of Legends, I think that's his passive, Death Blossom. A second bottle of water, by the way. So, I'm going to have to take the fucking, the, the craziest piss afterwards. I'm going to have to, oh my god. I, I'm not feeling it right now, and it's not like... It's not like I'm holding it in or anything, but I just went through a bottle, and now I'm going through another one. So, uh, I'm just dreading that moment. Like, once I know I have to go, but I want to bear through the rest of the stream first, so... <laughs> we'll get to that bridge when we... We'll cross that bridge when we come to it. So, that was pretty cool. That, uh, John and Ren's kind of synergy helped him pin down the second part of the Grim. This was fucking dope as fuck, dude. Nora's just like... It felt so cool just seeing her first part, like, just seeing her, like, on the top part, like, just her eyes closed, like, motionless, and then she's like, here I come! It, <laughs> it was so fucking cool, and then, like, she just dr fucking brought the hammer down, like, killed the Grim, like, she killed the horse with that, like, strike, she just created, like, so much force with that, with that freaking hammer down moment, and, um, hey, right there, a sign of Reinhardt, and, uh, I just thought it was super fucking cool, how that scene was kind of set up. She was like on the cliff and then she just willingly falls. And then she's like, all right, time to get into action. I, I love that moment right there. That was pretty great. <laughs> Nora hammer time. 
Yeah, I just I like the I like the facial. I like the I like I just like how she like transitions from like calm and tranquil and peaceful to I'm about to wreck house right now. <clears throat> it was a leap of faith. <laughs> Nora smash. Stop, it's Nora time. Jesus. <laughs> so peaceful in the air. Yeah, and she literally killed the Grim. Like, she snapped, like, the freaking... She snapped the freaking Grim's neck. Like, she, like, crushed its head. But I assume, in the process, probably snapped its neck off of its freaking... Off of its spine, just because it's, like... All that force, you just slammed it into the ground. I thought that was pretty cool. Uh... But Ren's moment was so fucking bad ass. And again, like I said, my favorite moment of Ren in the episode probably overall was just that final moment. And I'm pro I think I'm gonna disappear yeah, I'm gonna disappear for a second. Ah, when well, I gotta get rid of these screens first. Um probably my favorite moment of the fight is when he kind of like has the Grim dead, like so the Grim's pinned down by its arms, its horse part's dead, so it's not going anywhere, and it just shouts in Ren's face. Like it just shouts. Like like and then like the badass part was like Ren just stood there. And he just like his his hair's blowing like from like the the the, the shock, like the sound wave of the shouting. And he looked so fucking badass just looking at this Grim in its face, like, yeah, like your time has come, like, and I'm gonna be the one to kill you, so you never have to do this to anybody else, and this is for everybody, and I thought it was so cool, I just, I, I loved it, it was such a cool scene, you know, and again, like I said, for my mother, cuts off one arm, for my father, kills off, cuts off the other arm, for everyone that you've slain, slashes it in the chest, and in the final moment, he just, like, reflects to himself, breathes in, for myself, and then chops its head off, and boom, the fight's over. Absolutely, like, this was where I felt like Neith, Neith Ohm, like, did so much justice for Ren when it mattered the most. When it, when it was, like, his backstory and fight, facing his demons, you know, in his past. <clears throat> I loved it. Absolutely loved it. And I, I reached out to Neith on Twitter. I was like, dude, you did his character so much justice. I absolutely love you to death. You've, you've come such a long way. And uh, I'm just so thankful that he's a part of the team and he's a part of making a character that his brother fulfilled. You know, he was able to kind of take those reins and, and make it the best that it could have possibly been. You know what I mean? Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely loved it. <clears throat> and, uh, and so ends that fight scene. And, uh, a really crazy one at that, like, essentially, that's more than, I said, that's half of the episode right there, so, we're two hours and 25 minutes, so, at this rate, we might make the five hour mark, but, uh, I loved it, I absolutely loved it, I love the fight scene, obviously, everything that's to come was very, uh, very worthwhile in terms of speculating and just talking about, because the dialogue, like, Ruby's monologue took up more than half I, the other half of the episode but i i just love the the complimentary like imagery like the images and scenes that we were seeing of things to come in the future like it was just massive setup um before i get into that though yeah from monty at the end of the day absolutely for him uh he would have been so fucking stoked to see where ruby is now like like volume four is going to be showing in japan and the show is on volume 5, and this volume was so fucking cool, and the show looks way better, you know? Absolutely a great, a great, 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 amazing addition to the series so far, volume 4. Um, but before I get into anything else, uh, I think, I know M Miles mentioned it, but I didn't watch that far into the stream to, to, to see for myself, or to kind of relay it to you guys, but, um... Um, I was, I was wondering if, did any of you guys watch the RTX Sydney Ruby panel? They were doing a bunch of, like, Q&As for the, for, for the, for the volume as a whole and for the finale and everything like that. 
I think Miles explained the time skip in depth, like in detail, for the four to the the six to eight month time skip. I don't know any details though, so I don't know if the six to eight month. I I know that he did he. I know a bunch of people say he did. Oh, 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 so, sorry, the chat's behind, so you guys are responding to whether you guys saw it or not. Uh, I was, I saw on a, on a, a post, I had, I didn't watch that far, like I said, in the live stream, but it was told, first off, we're getting Neo, like they said, Neo will be coming back, so we got Neo confirmed, but, uh, I, I think Miles mentioned the detail of the time skips. No, they purposely kept it vague. Oh, really? He pretty much said it's unspecific to avoid plot holes. Ah, oh, that's smart of him then. Okay. Okay. The only thing that I'm wondering then is like, Volume 4, in terms of what we got out of Volume 4, was months in the making. You know what I mean? Like, last episode to this episode, Blake didn't- Yang did not leave home, get on the ship, travel overseas, uh, reach that signpost, and decide she's going to go after Ruby in the course of an episode. Like, that was weeks, probably even months, depending on whatever. So, I don't know if this time skip... I don't know if, like, the moments that were passing while we were watching episode 1 through 12 was during that 6 to 8 month time skip, or did that 6 to 8 month time skip pass, and then these events occurred that were also weeks in the making. Uh, those are the only things that I'm wondering uh, so far, because obviously everyone's converging, but when are all these moments happening? Are these moments happening simultaneously? Are these moments happening congruent to each other after the time skip? Are these moments the time skip? You know, all that other stuff. So, that's the only thing that I was really wondering about. Uh, I understand, like, for plot plot holes, because like, I understand. Like, you can't really reveal stuff, and then people will, can, you know, fans will be super nitty-gritty and be like, well, what happens here? And if you come up with a plot hole, you're fucked. You know? You have to retcon or you have to fix it or something like that. Best left open for interpretation. Okay. I, I'd like to believe that it was... Because you gotta remember, too, like, there was a, a slight time skip between Ruby leaving home after Ruby left. Like, it was fall when Ruby left when Ruby was home, and then when she left on her journey from, from, in the, in the finale of Volume 3, it was snowing, so you could just imply that winter had occurred. And then when you go back to Yang, it's like sunny and stuff like that, so it's probably spring already. So, um... Okay. <clears throat> yeah. All right. But yeah, so, absolutely loved the whole Ren moment, and, uh, this was pretty cool, too, just to see everyone coming together after the fight, like, Nora just running in for a hug immediately. Uh, I was very, I was, I was hoping, I was like, worst case scenario, like, when Ruby was running back to check on Crow, I was like, I either, I really hope, A, he's not dead, like, he didn't die, like, like, from the poison during the fight, which I think that would have been super fucked up, and B, I hope he didn't leave. Uh, a part of me felt like he could have just left or just, you know, done his own thing. But, uh, I'm glad that he's still stuck around. Granted, it seems like he couldn't have left even if he wanted to just because he was in too much... He was just too weak or too injured to do anything. But, uh, just glad that everything turned played out well. I'm glad no one died, you know what I mean? Like, I'm not gonna sit here and be like, Wow, I can't believe no one, everyone made it out of there unscathed. It's like, well, based on the... Like, I feel like we, we're still... We're still healing from the wounds that we've gotten, you know? Penny, Pira, Ozpin... Ozpin technically died, you know what I mean? Uh, well, granted, I feel like he, you know, he lost on purpose, so the Maiden's powers wouldn't go to Salem or someone else if he killed C Cinder. But, like, Ozpin died, technically. Um, Penny died. Uh, Pira died. Yang lost her arm. Uh, Blake... Adam almost killed Blake. You know? The school fell. Tons of civilians got killed. You know what I mean? Like, all that shit is still, like... I still I still feel like that's something that has to be mended. Like, all of those concepts have to be mended. And I feel like it wouldn't have been enough time before we got another character death. You know? 
<clears throat> Roman, yeah, Roman Torchwick even died, you know what I mean? Like, he got eaten. Freaking, a bunch of characters, a bunch of awesome people, and a bunch of things happened that kind of threw the show on it, like, you know, flipped the show on its head, and we thought, it, oh, okay, this is going to be a Game of Thrones now, so we didn't really even understand the notion, like, not the notion, we didn't understand, like, the the theme of, like, okay, what does it mean by viewer discretion? Are we going to be getting characters dying left and right, like, like on some Game of Thrones shit? Uh, you know what I mean? Like, so, and it was, like, the first big impact of, like, death in the show for the first time that we had seen, so, um, I can understand why people, a lot of people were up in arms. Like, now that we've gotten, like, a kind of hopeful volume like this, I feel like that will ease a lot of people's concerns of, will someone die in volume 5 or volume 6? We, we basically kind of have to look at the context clues at this point versus... I think volume 3 kind of set us up to expect more death in volume 4, and because volume 4 kind of kept things peaceful as best it could, uh, I feel like that's why now we have to look with a different lens for volume 5 and onward um, in case, you know, because I don't want it to be like, oh, everyone's mentioning, like, death and who's going to die every volume, because then that kind of takes the... That kind of takes the impact out of it, like my friend Josh was talking about. If you're asking, once you start questioning, he said, once you start questioning death in the sh in a show and who's gonna die and who's going to die or who you think's gonna die, the the the, the weight of death is kind of lost at that point because it's like you shouldn't be having to say that or think that, you know what I mean? So. <clears throat> yeah, Rip Shion Village. No, I don't watch Game of Thrones. I don't watch any kind of. TV shows, I honestly just watch YouTube videos, watch Twitch streams, and that that's my entertainment. My entertainment is Twitch and YouTube. Um, I know a lot of people watch, like, a lot of people, I feel like people are getting on bandwagons at this point based on how many people, like, overnight kind of just get into it, and I'm like, were there always people that liked shit like this, you know what I mean? Like, uh, like the superhero shows, like Supergirl, and Arrow, and The Flash, and, um, you know, those are, like, the big ones that I hear everyone talking about when they're out. Like, Walking Dead, I know a lot of people like that. Uh, Breaking Bad at the time was really good. I think Stranger Things, I think that's the show people are watching right now. And I think it's called Black Mirror. I think that's another show. Um, I don't watch any of those. Like, on-demand, like, weekly shows or stuff like that. I don't watch those. I, I don't have any subscriptions to any services like that. The only subscriptions that I have to stuff that I actually watch is the Rooster Teeth, is Rooster Teeth, like, that's the only stuff, like, I'll watch Always Open, I'll watch the RT Podcast, I just started watching On The Spot yesterday, that, I, I never, like, it's not like, I, I didn't have anything against it, I just never watched On The Spot like that, I watched it here and there, I watched the episode yesterday, I was fucking dying, it was with Grey, it was with Grey and Maggie Tomini on one team, and then Stan and Cole on another team, it was so fucking funny. I loved it. And I, and, I, and I started binging a lot of on the spots last night. So, um, and then YouTube videos are any subscribers that I watch. And then Twitch is any Twitch streamers that I want to check out, like what, what games they're playing and stuff like that. So it's not canceled yet. <laughs> are you talking about on the spot? <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm going to be getting back into anime actually, because whatever uh fan service is going to be getting into i kind of want to be a part of that discussion hashtag still not canceled <laughs> oh man i love that running joke that they have sometimes i consider them serious like like i like i like on the spot like i watched it like a full episode for the first time yesterday and i i really really liked it i thought it was super fucking funny yeah i really have been missing out i, I i've honestly been missing out on on the spot i'm absolutely gonna watch it now yeah, everyone was just messing with John. They were like, uh, John, they, I said John. Everyone was messing with John Reisinger. They were like plugging their other shows like, hey, Ruby Finale comes out this day or <laughs> or catch this show at this time. And it was just so fucking funny. It was so funny. I loved it. Yeah, Rooster Teeth's version of Whose Line Is It Anyway? I love the improv. I, I, I really like that. I think that's super cool. <clears throat> but yeah, so uh, let's see. So getting back to this, everyone's like happy no one died. I'm happy about that as well. And then we get like fucking airships like out of nowhere. So first off, they mentioned that they saw smoke. And I understand like when the Grim died, it evaporated like a huge thick black cloud of smoke. It's like, really? Like they saw the smoke from the Grim and that's what called them over there. I, I, I thought it was like, well, is there a fire nearby or something? And then I was like, oh no, they're talking about like, really? They're talking about the Grim? So I thought that was kind of weird. Um, 
too conven a little too convenient if you ask me but you know they got to do what they got to do and these are the airships that we kind of saw in the um the mistral world of remnant so we know like mistral kind of takes in the the aspects of nature to and that's how they thrive and survive and stuff like that um and they're very forward thinkers and uh extremely uh what's the word i'm looking for what's the word i'm looking for uh, they have a lot of ingenuity, like, obviously, they're fucking making airships on their own, like, without the military and without Atlas tech and stuff like that, so they clearly have what it takes to, to make technology that can suit them for a lot more, like, for the better, like, travel and shit like that. Uh, let's see, let's see, have you heard of Berserk? Yes, I do, I've read the first chapter of the manga, it's back there, uh, uh with the rest of my manga. Um, let's see, but yeah, so, super cool that we got to see, like, these... And as a result as well, they were able to save Crow, which was great. Um, and this is going to be a cool dynamic, because Tyrion, Tyrion's whole spiel last volume, like his damage control was like, I didn't get Ruby, but I poisoned Crow, which means to them, they would think Crow's dead. So now that Salem and Salem, like, and she even said the last eye is blinded, I think that was in response to Crow, like Crow is a spy, Crow is Ozpin's eyes. And he's been taken out, so the last eye is blinded. For her to say the last eye is blinded makes me... If, if it was in reference to Crow, that could imply that Ospin has had other people in the past try to, um... Try to, like, do... Esp like, try to do, like, uh, recon work for him. But she said the last... The last eye is blinded. So, I don't know if that just means Ospin has no one else at the time, like everyone else is busy, or maybe out of all Ospin's spies, Crow was the last one that finally has been taken care of. So, um, so there's that, and now that Crow's alive, Tyrion doesn't know that, Salem doesn't know that, so I feel like they both think, like, Ospin, like, to the villains at least, Ospin and Crow are dead. So now, the ball's in their court to kind of come out of nowhere, and, you know, surprise the enemy of being like, hey, we were alive the whole time, you guys thought otherwise, and, you know, it could it could work in their favor if they play their cards right. Well, Ozpin can play his cards really well, because he's literally in a different body, and Crow just needs to stay in bird form the whole time. So, um, could it be possible that Tyrion has vision problems, and without his tail, he's now truly blinded? No, I mean, you would have to explain how to get back to Salem, you know what I mean? Like, he, he has to... He has to, uh, no, I don't think that. His symbol is kind of an eye. Yeah, it is kind of an eye. So I think it maybe it could have been a reference to Crow, but then when, when she says the last eye is blind, what do you mean, the, like, Crow is the last spy? Like, were there ones before him? That's where I'm getting at with my logic. Um, Dinner, uh, yeah, Dinner Boy, how's it going? Thanks for joining the stream. Did you see the end scene? Absolutely, of course. Ruby always has an end scene. Every volume has an end scene. I absolutely watch every single thing of Ruby. Like, in the ending, too, I would listen to it anyway, because we got a new song. Which I'm going to be getting to that fairly soon, too. Yeah, and that's another thing, too. You can kind of infer, like, oh my god, uh, Nora and Ren are f sailing on a ship. The ship has sailed. <laughs> For, like, the shipping of Ren and Nora. So that's kind of funny, too. Uh, let's see. Um... <clears throat> Yeah, Crow's Ospin's spy. Essentially, he goes on, like, recon missions for him. Uh, let's see. So, yeah, and then we got to see Ani- Uh, not Anima, Mistral. Which, by the way, <clears throat> the city of Mistral is also named after the con- uh, Also named after the kingdom, which is super weird. Um... Just because, like, that's the same thing for Vale. So, is Vacuo not only just the city, but also the kingdom's name? So, th those are things I was just wondering. I was like, that's kind of curious. Unless it's, like, a capital. Like, it's also the capital and the city. Like, uh, like no, no, it's the kingdom and the city, I meant. <clears throat> Talk about the Renora scene. You mean the other Renora scene? Yeah, so, first off, I will say, when it comes to Anima... I'm, oh my god, not Anima, that's the continent. God damn it. When it comes to Mistral, like, that's super weird because I was expecting it to be called something else, not Mistral. I thought Mistral was the kingdom, the city was going to be called something else, Anima is the continent, Haven is the school. But now it's Mistral is not only the kingdom, but it's also the name of the city. So, um, Mistral reminded me of Omashu from, from, from Avatar, The Last Airbender. 
It reminded me of like a combination of Omashu and Ba Sing Se. I don't know if any of you guys uh, like bought that as well, or if any of you guys know that, if you guys have watched Avatar. But that's like the first thing I thought of. I thought of Omashu more because Omashu is kind of like stacked up on top like stacked on itself like you have the larger base at the bottom and then it gets higher and higher and the very top looks like it could be the school you have like all of these like little smaller uh pop like neighborhoods or something like that like l villages and stuff like that within itself which is super cool i'm wondering how they're going to traverse and get from point a to point b within the confines of the city um that's going to be something that's that's really interesting that i hope uh, that's like the biggest thing I'm looking forward to because I'm so tired of Vale. Like we've seen Vale, we've spent three volumes in Vale and Beacon, and this was like a cool volume to kind of get like a, a sense of the world in between the kingdoms, like the world of Remnant, um, and see all of those like world of Remnant concepts coming together in an actual volume, which is why I feel like a lot of people feel like this volume was filler or it was slow paced. I feel like uh, I like that because. There was a part of me that was like, I want to see the what the world looks like, not just one kingdom to immediately to another kingdom. I want to see what happens in between. So um, that's my initial thoughts of of uh, of Mistral. Super cool. Never thought that it would have looked like that. It looks so fucking sick. And um, yeah, uh, the Happy Boy. That's where this is where Pyrrha's parents are from, or, or, or presumably where she's from. And, yeah, that's where she's from, because she went to Sanctum, which was a combat school in Mistral. She won the Miss, Regional, Miss, Re, Miss Mistral Regional Contest four years in a row, which is also hails from Mistral. So that just leads me to believe that, yeah, she is from Mistral. So, um, not sure if we'll see that. I really hope we don't, because that's very, 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 like, that, that would, like, break my heart even more, just because we got, like, Chapter 2 of this volume, which destroyed me. Because, like, we got to see her again, but it wasn't in the way that, you know, I hoped or in a way that I could have expected. And it just made it, f it just made the, the loss a lot more harder to deal with for me. <clears throat> Maybe we'll see the actual Pumpkin Pete. <laughs> oh, man. <clears throat> yeah, tongue twister much. Yeah, pretty much. So, um, let's see. So, yeah. Oh, let me show this right here. So, is this the Renora scene you guys were talking about? Like, someone was like, can you please talk about Renora? They're on a ship. And they are a ship. So, you guys got two sailed ships right now. <laughs> and look at, like, I like her face, like, when Ren actually, like, touched her hand. She was like, uh, oh, uh. Like, she wasn't expecting it. I really like that. And, um, I guess it's official now. Like, Ren and Nora are together together which is great now it's just like they better not fucking die now <laughs> that's like the only thing like they better not die now like it would have been like it would have sucked if they never actually realized the their relationship during like beforehand but now it's like now they're actually together shipception <laughs> yeah pretty much yeah boop ren and nora confirmed 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 pretty much and yeah like I, I just love this right here like they're just like looking at each other and then they just like they just like press up against one another and just like have a moment together which is real i really like that it's like a long fucking time coming and she obviously has been waiting for this moment forever so it was great to finally see it was great to see someone get together you know what i mean like we were all hoping pira and jean for the past three volumes and that didn't happen so I feel like they had to confirm at least a ship for someone because, <laughs> like, people are, like, all over the place with Bumblebee right now because they're not together and Blake is with Sun and, you know, that whole thing and, apparently, like, like, Arcos was never fully realized as, like, a confirmed, like, real thing for both people. Like, it was just Pyrrha getting her emotions across. So, like, now to actually have one confirmed, I feel like at least the ship, the Renora shippers can rejoice and be happy that it actually has finally happened. <laughs> kiss me you fool <laughs> yeah i liked it it was a pretty cute scene and uh and then we transition this is the latter half of the episode where um we kind of get into ruby's like long-winded dialogue and kind of scenes that are going off on the back end here we're now 93 94 screenshots in guys so we actually might make it before four hours 
I, oh, well, an hour and 15 minutes to get through, well, no, 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 I, I take that back, I take that back. We might actually go beyond four hours, but, uh, didn't think I'd be wrapping up the end of the episode so soon at two hours and 48 minutes, but, um, Crow's alive, too, and Crow's in Mistral, guess who else is in Mistral? Winter. Winter's in Mistral, so... We could see more dynamic between them two because they seem to have history based on like they, there was just there just seemed to be like a lot of not bad blood but there seemed to be a lot of uh um tension between the two of them when they met it seemed it almost seemed like they have history or maybe they were a thing in the past uh that'd be kind of cool if they even went no there's no way they went to school together but um winter doesn't seem as old as crow but it doesn't it's it's not below like it's I almost feel like they were a thing to some extent. So, uh, they're both in Mistral together, which is also pretty cool. Snowbird, please. <laughs> yeah, I would say Black Sun does have more ground to stand on just because we know we've seen reciprocative feelings for both sides at, at a point. You know what I mean? Um... We've never seen that from Blake or Yang, Ob and I'm speaking objectively. You know, we, I'm not, tr tr I'm not, you know, I'm not the type of person to be like, oh, you like that ship? Like that's not a real ship. Why do you like, like, I like to each his own. Do what you want. Ship who you want. Care about who you want. That's fine. That's whatever. Objectively, you you can't deny the objectification of not objectification, but you can't uh, you can't deny the lack of 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 like. Comparing apples to apples, you're comparing apples to oranges when you compare Black Sun and, um, and, and Bumblebee, which it's fine, you know what I mean? It's fine, you know, do what you want, say what you want, that's, that's great, but, um, <laughs> I can yell if I want to. And trust me, this isn't me, like, putting down anyone or saying that it's impossible. It's not impossible. I'll say that right now. It is not impossible, and if it happens, it happens, and... Fucking more power to more power to Bumblebee, and I actually made the mention last week. I was like, if Bumblebee becomes a thing, that would be super cool to see Blake and Yang Bumblebee ship on Bumblebee the bike. It's like a Bumblebeeception, um, and that'd be pretty cool. His shirt is cheese. Yeah, for those asking, this is Cheese Master Gus. Uh, the shirt isn't available anymore, but I got this shirt during the uh, Rooster Teeth Extra Life 2016. These were on sale, and 100% of the proceeds went to charity, so I bought one in support of charity and to get a pretty cool shirt. Uh, I also bought a couple of posters. Also, those went directly to charity as well, for anybody who's wondering. <clears throat> so this is what a live stream is like. Hey, what's up, Jammy Boy? Yeah, this is uh, this is the live stream. <clears throat> and I hope you enjoy it thus far. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so moving on from there, so this is where we're going to deviate and talk about a few other things. We're going to be, for, so first off, I want to talk about Ruby's speech, because Ruby's speech is kind of glossing over these scenes as it's going on. So Ruby kind of gave me what I was looking for in this speech. I mentioned, like, for those of you who've been to the live stream discussions thus far, um, so like, however many you've been to, I've mentioned throughout that, especially in the first volume, not the first volume, the, uh, the, the intro, when I did chapter one in the intro live stream discussion, I mentioned, I said to myself, I was like, Ruby has gone through a lot, but she's never talked about it. She's never relayed at all how she's handling everything, how she's going through everything, what, she, you know, how is she feeling mentally? How is she feeling physically? How is she feeling uh, emotionally about losing all of these things and going through the hardship of everything that they've gone through to get to Mistral, you know what I mean? Like nearly escaping death, you know, witnessing, um, you know, just seeing bad stuff happen to them left and right, like with all of these villages and whatnot. Um, and I, that, I, I questioned that. I was like, why doesn't Ruby ever talk about that stuff? And I can understand maybe she's young. Maybe she can easily bounce back from it. You know, I didn't want her to be like this Mary Sue character that was like, um, you know, I, I can brace through anything and, and I'm not phased by whatever is happening. It, it's just, I guess in a way she kind of, cause it's not like she's, she's not equipped to deal with shit like this. This is all happening in the moment, you know, and she's got to deal with it as she goes. She can't let it get her down. So I guess in a way 
she's never had the proper time to grieve or to cope with what what happened and uh, i love the fact that this letter kind of conveyed to me how ruby felt internally uh about everything that's happened she like especially since it was a letter to yang so it, it was a lot more heartfelt in just realizing she even said in the letter she was like when i left you told me that it was risky and that it you know it basically it was risky and she even said she was like i can say that you you know after everything that's happened i can say that you were right and um the the letter at the end of the day felt very hopeful and uh, aside from the ending obviously but the letter in, in as a whole felt very uplifting and it felt like it wasn't just a message that was conveyed to the show but it was a message conveyed to us like the people watching it or anybody who feels like there's no way out or 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 just feels depressed or hopeless that they're one person and they can't they can only do so much that they that there's that there's nothing that they can do on a grand scale on, on a grand scale that can change you know whether it's like she said whether it's changing yourself whether it's changing the world around you um you know it's all about you know growing and and growing together and trying to make it out together like and i apply that to myself you know um I'm one person. I'm one guy. One guy who loves Ruby, who wants to talk about it and share it. And I've I have 952 other people in the chat, which is fucking crazy by the way. I have 900 other people in here who I have to some extent have impacted, who have changed their perception who have given you guys value, have given you guys insight, have given you guys relatability, have given you guys entertainment, you know, whatever it may be, I, as one person, have done something that changed someone's outlook. I've changed the world, my, my small world I've changed. I've changed, like, my small world being, like, the Rooster Teeth community. I've changed it. You know, it's not on a grand scale. It's not like I'm working for Rooster Teeth. It's not like... I, I'm, I'm like an extremely important person. It's not like everyone in the community knows who I am and knows what I do. But for the people that do know about it, you know, I'm changing, uh, I'm doing something for someone else. And it's, it's, I, I, I get the messages, I get the comments, I get the tweets, I get the DMs, I get the emails of so many people out there who have said, dude, you know, I watched that episode and I don't know what it was, I don't know what it is, but I, I, I just couldn't feel for it. You know, I couldn't get emotional with the episode. And then I watched your reactions, and I cried like a bitch. You know what I mean? Like, I, like, like, they, some people have mentioned, like, my reactions kind of, like, opened them up more than they thought they could. Or my, re my discussions make them think about things in ways that they didn't see themselves or they didn't pick up on. Even my reactions, like my reactions, I, I pick up on a lot of things on the fly. Like the big thing that a lot of people were like, holy shit, I didn't even notice that was Klein as the Seven Dwarves. When I noticed that immediately because he, um, because he, first he had like the grumpy nature and then he immediately sneezed and his eyes changed and I was like, grumpy sneezy seven dwarves like it just clicks for me like that sometimes like if i know the reference then it clicks for me immediately and i i kind of get like that with a bunch of whenever i watch the series and i commentate while i react which i guess that's why a lot of people like my reactions too is because i don't just sit there and just watch the episode i kind of engage because i know someone's gonna watch this so um i felt like the letter ruby's letter kind of it really resonated with me because i know where i started on youtube before any of you guys knew who i was no offense to you guys I, I was a nobody i still consider myself a nobody to an extent but um i know where i started and when i first started i didn't have that kind of influence i guess you could say i'm somewhat of an influence you know uh in the in the community like people tell me i what do you think about this because i care about your opinion or your opinion matters to me um and in a way that's kind of like an influence you know what i mean like i've done like merch unboxings and unboxings in general that people are like holy shit thanks for the video you've helped me decide that i'm actually gonna buy this figure i'm gonna buy this box set or whatever like unwillingly of for me like it's not like that's what that's not my intentions but i'm unwillingly like uh like an influencer in the community whether it's based on my opinions whether it's based on my content or the value that i put in my videos that you guys take away from it so um you know, and my channel 
has 38,000 subscribers, you know, 38,000 people, a majority, a vast majority, more than 90% of which are from the Ruby community. So I, I took this letter very to heart for myself, which was, I've grown, I've changed as a person, I've changed the world in a very small, marginal fact, like sense, like I've changed you guys, you know? Years ago, you guys didn't know who I was. Like, to know who I am, to know that, to know who I am, to watch my videos, to care about my opinions in real time, like, in these discussions, proves that I have changed something in all of you, and in myself, for me to kind of want to do bigger and better, and, you know, want to prove to everyone that I love doing this, and this is what I kind of feel like I'm meant to do. I, I honestly feel like I'm meant to just talk, because that's all I fucking do, is just ramble. But, uh, you know, I, I, I still to this day can say I don't know what I want to do when I grow up because I, A, I don't feel grown up and B, I, you know, this can only go so far, you know, and this is, can, this, this in a way could even be a stepping stone for me for bigger things in the future. But, uh, I don't know. I, I really resonated with this, with this letter because I, I've come such a long way and I am a product of that evolution over the years you know what i mean like right now this moment is a, is is evidence of that you know it's a testament to 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 wanting to better ourselves to want to change to want to make the world a better place even if i'm not curing cancer even if i'm not solving the world's most leading you know issues like world hunger or 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 racism or or you know like you know people being divided whatever i do what i can for who i can and I do it the best of my ability, and if anyone takes something away from that, then I've succeeded, you know? <laughs> Rambling is your semblance. I guess, I guess I can just, like, talk someone to death <laughs> in Ruby. <laughs> oh, that'd be so fucking awesome, dude. <laughs> but yeah, um... <laughs> But yeah, uh, like not a day goes by where I don't acknowledge that. Not a day goes by that I don't realize how lucky I am because, you know, I, I talk to so many people who wish they were in my shoes. They wish they were in my position. They they wish they worked at Rooster Teeth. They wish that, um, you know, they knew what their calling was. And I still don't know what my calling was either. I couldn't have told you three, four years ago that I would be right here, right now, doing what I love. You know what I mean? Like talking about Ruby for... Three hours now, we just passed literally three hours and 45 seconds, 46 seconds, 47 seconds talking about this, and I'm just thankful and grateful for everything. I, I slip up here and there, I don't get a video out every single day or when I'm supposed to, and some things happen that deter me and pull me back, but uh, every day, I'm, I'm, I, not, not a day goes by where I wake up and I'm not like, I'm so thankful that I'm doing this and not doing something that I hate, or doing something that... I'm not passionate about because I, I used to be like that all the time. I used to love what I did. And then as I got more into the robotic phase of doing it, I just it detest. I detested it. You know what I mean? So um, <clears throat> Arnold just talking and you see the other person's ears start bleeding. That's his semblance. <laughs> but yeah, um, I don't know. I'm going to get off my soapbox right now, but I, I, I guess in a way you guys like your involvement with what i do kind of adds to this letter as well like listen like take this like think of it like this you know you guys change me you guys change my life you know you guys might not make youtube videos or 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 post theories that everybody in the community thinks about and they think you're cool and awesome and you know they want to hear what you think every week and stuff like that uh but for the people that you do do it for, like the people who make other reaction videos or people who make theories on, on Reddit or Facebook or, or Tumblr or, or Amino or YouTube, um, you helping them out, you're changing someone else's world too. You change my world. You know what I mean? Like I do what I do now because of you guys. So it goes kind of like this letter kind of even contradicts what Whitley says. Like what can one man do that an army cannot like that's kind of reflective of here. Like there's a lot that one person can do as an individual than a collective and vice versa. Like a collective of people can impact 
can 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 have the same amount of impact as one person a la you guys to me vice versa me to you so um yeah i mean i'm 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 being super fucking sappy right now but i i just i i i just realized how how much i took away from the letter in general like a lot of people are like oh the letter was like ruby's monologue was way too long and whatever it's like i i needed to hear that you know what i mean like i needed to hear that and it applied to me a lot so it meant so much more after the fact um <laughs> And I just say thanks, guys. I just want to say thank you. Like, I can't say that enough. And um, I try to let my, my videos and my content speak for itself on on relaying that to you guys in every video. But I can't say it enough, you know? <sighs> and now we have to wait. You know what I mean? Like, this sucks. It sucks so bad that the volume's over. But we got Ruby Chibi. Like I said, we have RVB. We have a bunch of other stuff. And... I know you guys will still be around for whatever it is that I make, which I'm super grateful for. And, um, and yeah, so, like, along with the speech, or, or sorry, along with the, uh, <laughs> I felt like I just did a speech. Excuse me. Uh, along with the Ruby's monologue, we got, like, a bunch of scenes in the back end. So we have Weiss, who's actually leaving home, stolen away on the back of a random cargo ship to Mistral, uh, with nothing but a suitcase and her sword. And, um, so she's gonna be making her way to Mistral. She knows Winter's there. She knows that, um, I don't think she knows that Ruby, like, she doesn't know Ruby's there, but, un you know, she's by proxy gonna cross paths with someone there, because everyone's converging on Mistral. So, Weiss is gonna be making her way back to her sister. Like I said, I can't wait to see Winter. I'm really happy. I love Winter. I love Winter. I love the dynamic between the two. I wonder how Winter's gonna react when she actually broke out of home and left, and how she's gonna respond to the way her father's been treating her, and took away her position of the head, uh, of the, of the heiress and everything like that. Um, but I'm, I'm just really looking forward to more sister moments between Weiss and Winter, and seeing Winter in the new animation style is, is like the biggest thing that I'm looking forward to for, for her when we see her. So that was that. We have Blake who's kind of going through, literally going through like a, like a little treasure chest of her past of having like the White Fang because she obviously she was a member of it before. So she's kind of going through aspects of, you know, changing who she was from the past to now with her whole plans of, you know, wanting to change for the better for the White Fang. Uh, let's talk about this right fucking now. Oh my god! <laughs> Yo, Yang is so fucking cool. I love the- the best thing I love is the fact that she's wearing pants. <laughs> Not to take away from, like, the fact that she was wearing shorts. Um, the short- the pants make her, the outfit look way more cooler. Um... In my opinion, like the dust, like the duster, and the shit in the shades, and her hair's down. She looks so fucking cool. And then she's got her arm. She's got like something over it protecting it. She's got gloves. She just looks so fucking stunner cool, dude. She looks so fucking awesome. And I love it. Uh, it, it just shows. So that was essentially the the final look, I guess, in the in the show itself of what sh what her design looked like from. Uh, the final concept designs of volume four she doesn't look as fierce as people thought like in the concept design it looked like she was like she had like revenge in her eyes and her her hair looked like it was literally like on fire but um i like it I, <laughs> someone's like she looks like she's about to like light up a cigarette <laughs> she's, she looks cool but she's not that cool i mean uh smoke is not really that cool but I get what you mean. Yeah, the ponytail was just a product of the time. Like, it was just, like, a, a hair-up kind of thing. Like, fuck off. Like, I don't feel like trying, essentially. So, I love it. I love the way she fucking looks. And she's got a picture of Team Stark. I don't know if, if Crow gave her the picture. Like, from uh, from, from when he was at... When, when he gave her, like, information from the school. And she's on the same boat that... Blake and Sun were on, which I guess means this one dude travels and sends people to different continents all the time. Or maybe it's on the way to Man like maybe he stops at Anima on the way to Menagerie. But then again, she's on Patch, which is on the opposite side of 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 uh of Vale. So maybe I don't I don't really know how she did it. Maybe she drove well, I highly doubt she drove through Vale. Maybe she got to the docks of of uh of Vale. And then took a boat and just took the long ride there. But yeah, absolutely love Yang. Love the design she has. She has like a she has like a, a, a 
I think it's like a coat. I don't think I don't think she's worn that before. She's got like an orange kind of tie thing, like scarf looking thing around her neck, which isn't her shirt by the way, because she's wearing the orange shirt still. She's got the black pants. She's got the boots. She's got like a a, a purple scarf thing tied around her leg, which is almost similar to what she had in um, almost similar to what she had. In the previous volumes, like she had one wrapped around her her leg, and Ty had one wrapped around his arm, so I thought that was pretty cool. And the duster, and the fact that she has her fucking bike, like she just looks so fucking cool. And I remember Barbara mentioned during the the, the, the RTX Sydney panel for the Ruby panel, she mentioned that Yang, like she when she saw Yang, she was like, Yang, she, Barbara was like, I wish I was that cool. <laughs> like she knows that she's obviously Yang in a sense, but Yang at that at this point was just so much cooler than than Barbara was. So, um, I love it. I, I absolutely love it. I mean, for the most part, she seems like she's bounced back from a lot of things, uh, that's yet to be seen when she sees Blake and especially if she sees Adam again. But aside from that, for right now, for this moment, for, for this scene, she looks great. And, um, it seems like she's got her head on her shoulders of what her plans are for the future. So really love seeing that. Um, we got Ty here. I love this picture right here. The Ruby, like the new friends picture. Um, because we know, like, Ruby wasn't the best at making friends, you know what I mean? She wasn't the best at making friends and being social, uh, when the volume started, so it, it was really great to see that, like, and she even mentioned, too, she had old friends at Signal that she wished she could bring to Beacon with her, which is kind of like, fuck those guys, right? <laughs> like, obviously, they were just filler people, uh, just to let it be known that she had friends when she was at Signal, but, um... I just liked it, and I kind of liked the little parallel. It would have been cool, like like Ruby's parallel with Summer. Uh, it would have been cool if if Yang was parallel with Ty. I don't know. Uh, Blake was parallel with with like it would have just been cool to kind of have like the parallels almost like the best you can put them at least. But it was really great to see like the new friends because it just shows how far that they all they've all come. And it was like Team Ruby, Team Stark, and he's probably seeing like like Ty. Like he's obviously looking at the picture and he's seeing like. He's seeing, like, a, the new age of, like, what his team used to be. Like, obviously, Summer would be representative of Ruby. Himself would be representative of Yang. And then everything else with, with what's happening. Like, their teams are torn apart right now. And that's similar to kind of, like, what he was explaining to, to Yang was, like, their team got torn apart, too. And Raven was kind of, like, a product of that. So, um, to the socially awkward, yeah, pretty much. Um, but, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, the shadow people, too, like... Those, oh man, the shadow people. That's just another reason of how, that's just another, that's just, like, the shadow people is just another testament of how far the show has come. You know what I mean? <laughs> uh, to be young and socially awkward. Yeah. <clears throat> Summer looks sketchy. Nah, Summer looks awesome. She's the team leader. She's like, I feel like Summer and Ruby are like, Ruby is like a spitting image of her mother. I honestly want to say that. Um, down to her quirkiness, to her cutesy charm, and to her initiative to just want to help people and be a team leader. I feel like Ruby has gone through maybe even the same exact things. Like, Ospin picked up Sim uh, Ruby, Summer, the same way he picked up Ruby, and let her in the school early, realizing her silver-eyed powers, her silver-eyed potential, maybe needing her for his war, uh, which is why I think maybe by proxy of doing that, like, Summer died as a result of Ospin's poor judgment, or calls to whatever mission she went out on and didn't come back from. So, um... I can definitely see parallels with the teams, and I can see parallels with how Ty's looking at his team compared to his, like his daughter's teams now. So I love that moment, and then right here too, like we got a little bit of Zwei. We got Zwei in the last episode, which was great. Uh, obviously, we're probably not going to see a bit of him for a while, just because we saw more of him back then because he was at the school. And um, based on like how Ty, like Ty's back home by himself, he's not being like a therapist for his daughter. Uh, he's alone now, so. You know, it's great to just have Zwei there for company. And I mentioned this too in a previous live stream discussion, but I felt that, like, if Yang ended up leaving, that would give Ty a reason to pursue, like, his own things that he had to do, like, help signal, not help, yeah, go back to signal, or to help rebuild, uh, you know, Vale and Beacon with the other teachers, like, Oop, like, and Port and Glinda and stuff like that. So, um, and then Zwei is just there for him for, like, emotional support. I almost want to say Zwei is, like, a stress dog, like, a dog that, like, Zwei, like, that Ty got maybe after 
uh, Summer died, or maybe he got it after Summer died and, and Raven left. Maybe he just needed a companion, and maybe he just needed something to get his daughter's minds off of the fact that their mothers aren't in their lives. So, um, Zoe's best doggo. <clears throat> so there's that. This right here, dude. Um, this was really tough, because at this point, they started playing cold. And you guys know how I feel about cold, and how important it is to all of us, and how important it is to the community, and what it means for the show, and what it means for Monty, and this, the, the OST for that in the background, on top of Ruby's, like, impactful speech, kind of, like, <laughs> it was, like, very overwhelming, because, I mean, this is, like, Jean looking at Pyrrha right now, like, that... Pyrrha used the shield and sword. Her metal of her weapon, of her either her headdress or her shield, are in his weapon. So he's got the red sash of remembrance. So it, it it's um, it's very much like he's alone right now with his thoughts. And I love in the next shot right here how like um, how uh, they actually came through to comfort him and. Like, not keep him wallowing in whatever he was thinking or however he was feeling. Because Ruby mentioned during this part, too, she was like, I've seen what loss can do to people. And she saw firsthand, like, she saw, like, Jean basically torturing himself, training day in, day out, uh, well, every night, basically, essentially, like, training on loop, just hearing Pira and taking in the training that she tried to teach and, you know, taught him and just doing that without like day in and day out with you know days on end for how for months you know he could have been doing that every fucking night for all we know and um it definitely shows in his combat that he's grown because of her even more so um oh really this was your favorite part yeah it was a very emotional part it really was um and I loved it, you know, I, like, Cold being played was what took me over the edge, because it's just like, I, I, I have, I listen to that song very few and far between because of, you know, what it does to me, and, and, and what it means to me, and what it means for the, the community, so, uh, for them to play that song was almost like a cheap shot for, for the feels for the, for them, so there was that, and then, like, they come in to comfort him, and this part right here, I don't know if you guys have seen this, but the bottom shot right here, someone photoshopped the scene where Pira is laying by Jean in volume 3. So it kind of seems like they're all together still. Uh, for those of you who haven't seen that. I, I, that was like, awesome. Like that, like broke my heart when I saw it, of course. But, uh, it was, um, you know. Yeah, it's... <laughs> yeah, the, the, the OST mashup was really great, too. How it went from... You know, it went from each character's themes and stuff like that, and then Cold, and then how it just, like, wrapped up that way. But yeah, it's... This was super like heartbreaking because it's like they don't like they're together still. You know what I mean? They're all together still, literally. Like in spirit, Pira is still there. So, um, <laughs> sorry to get you guys very like on like the emotional side of things, but yeah. But yeah, so, you know, we got all of that, like, Weiss seems more happier here in the back of a random, like, cargo ship than anything else. <laughs> uh, she, she, uh, she seems really happy, and it seems like, you know, she's actually taking initiative for herself to not kind of be trapped with her dad. So that one, that scene was pretty great. Like I said before, Blake is trying to change the world her world at least, trying to change the White Fang and its history and its past and, you know, what it means, like, obviously taking control, taking it back, making it a peaceful place and not something that it's become based on, like, Adam's plans and all of that stuff. So that was another great uh, factor that we got to see. And then Sun's there too, 
And by the way, she made that smile towards him. Uh, just saying, not not trying to fuel any fires or anything, but you know, Sun being there is a pretty good, is a pretty great um, like support for her, like to have someone with her, like by her side to help her through all of this. Being a faunus also helps. So um, there was that. This part right here was super cool to see because like I I didn't realize. Hold on, give me one second. Because I didn't realize that until, obviously, they landed. I was like, holy shit, like, this is the same ship that, like, the same crew, too, that, that got Blake and Son to Menagerie, and it's the same dude who got Yang to Anima. So I was like, does this guy, like, just, is he, like, the freaking, is he, is he, like, the shopkeeper of, is he, like, the shopkeeper of, of, like, the seas? Like, he's on every ship, and he's always doing whatever, and his crew's always with him. <clears throat> yeah oh uh really quick guys how's how's the how's the quality someone mentioned in the chat that they're getting really bad lag i'm not sure if it's me or if it's them uh so just sound off just let me know what what how how, how things are going and to be completely honest, I think I will make it less than five hours because I'm on screenshot 117, which means I have fifth, uh, 40, 42 more screenshots left. Like I said, towards the end, it's just rapid fire. It's just scene by scene. So it wasn't that, it wasn't that much. The fight scene was more had more substance to talk about in a grand discussion than these moments because these moments are just passing fling moments of just seeing progression and seeing how the set pieces are being played for volume four uh sorry volume five it's all good uh sounds good to me uh it's desyncing very so often huh Quality, 8 out of 10. The sound cuts out sometimes. Oh, that's odd. Give me one second. <clears throat> Whatever happened to the Cinder Theory, that got debunked, believe it or not. It didn't get debunked, but as this volume went on, more and more aspects came to light that made me retract the theory altogether. Same thing with Jean. So basically, my theory for Jean was that Pira would live on in Jean... Because Jean is based on Joan of Arc, and one factor about Joan of Arc in her, like, in her story was that she used to hear voices, uh, voices of God, that led her to become a warrior and fight in the, you know, fight in the war and stuff like that. And I felt like Pyrrha would have been living in the in Jean's mind. Like, Jean would have to be, like, on the brink of, like, insanity. And after the first volume, I was like, nope, he's not like that at all, so that theory doesn't work. And for Cinder, my Cinder theory was that she didn't have a semblance at all. That her semblance, um, that her semblance wasn't, like, she didn't have a semblance. That, that's why she wanted power. That's why she seeks Salem. Salem being her fairy godmother, her fair like, the fairy godmother in Cinderella gave Cinderella her glass slippers in a way of how Salem is giving Cinder all of this knowledge and power and opportunities. So I kind of was under the impression that maybe we never saw a semblance because Salem just never developed one. I'm sorry, Cinder just never developed one. Um, and I had a few other supporting factors. The fact that she never used, like, the fire powers that she used that we've seen up to that point were, were all, like, part of the Maiden's powers. She used the dust canisters as weapons. She used her actual bow and arrow as weapons. So we never got to see anything... Uh, that would claim that she had a semblance. Uh, and then, like, we could say, like, the power that she used during the during the fight with... The, the power that she used during the fight with, say, uh, with, uh, with Amber, like, she, she took all, like, the embers and soot in the air and kind of compressed them and made glass. I think that would be the product of the fact maybe... It, there was a scene, though. There was a scene, like, where she does that, but there's a lot of emphasis on her hand. Mainly the ring on her finger. I don't know if that's anything. But I, I, I was like, maybe there was emphasis on her hand. Like, maybe that power wasn't hers. Maybe that glass ability that we've only seen her use once. Maybe that was a product of Salem. Which would harken back to Salem being her fairy godmother. Which is how Cinderella got her glass slippers from her fairy godmother. So, yeah. Um, <clears throat> 
so yeah, uh, those two theories ended up being either debunked or not a, not a lot to really go off of to why I just decided not to do them. I'm not a theory guy by any stretch of the imagination either. That's very much Jake One Man Band's uh, area of expertise, in my opinion. Uh, Jake One Man Band and Muffin Man Dan. Um, I'm just very much a rambler. I'm, I'm very much just like a reviewer kind of guy. Uh, so I theories just aren't really my thing, especially if they don't have a lot of weight to them. <laughs> I love how Dashy says, I gotta pee yet. Actually, it's I'm feeling it. So, <laughs> so yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, getting back to this little spiel speech, we have Oscar, who's going to, uh, who took the train all the way to Haven, actually, which is pretty cool, and he, I guess he's just following along the lines of, of, you know, of everything that Ospin has been trying to tell him, and going along with it, and feeling like it's the right thing to do, and that he's, you know, going to be helping out a lot of people by doing this. So that was pretty great to see. Obviously, he's going to be going to Haven, Haven Academy. The biggest thing I hope we see in Haven Academy is new students, like new people. I know we're probably going to see Team Sun and Team Arburn because they hail from Mistral. They're from Haven Academy. Um, so I, I, I personally just feel like seeing a bunch of new characters, not necessarily characters that will have the spotlight 24-7, but just seeing new characters that, you know, will get their name, will see a weapon of theirs, will see a semblance of theirs, and you know, send them on their way, uh, you know, or stuff like that. That's just the one thing I want. I kind of want a lot of new for Volume 5. Um. <clears throat> yeah, Oscar's name is Oscar Pine, by the way. So, um, that's pretty cool as well. Yeah, he's taking a train trip. <laughs> yeah, he's having the best trip out of everybody. He's not even like, I don't have to fight Grimm. I don't have to walk for hours on end. I don't have to camp out in the rain. Uh, you know, all that kind of stuff. Like, I don't have to be held up in the back of a cargo. I, honestly, I think maybe Yang's having a really, just as much of a good time because she's riding her bike and she's on a boat. So, um, them two definitely chose the better alter mode, al like, the better, like, method of transportation for sure. Um, I wonder... I wonder if you need a, a driver's license to drive in in the world of Remnant, because Yang has been riding a motorcycle since she was 16 from, like, her trailer. That's how old she was. So, I wonder if, like, if that's a thing. Like, well, maybe she's got her driver's permit or something. Like, I highly doubt their world is as, um... Organ not organized, but as regulated as ours is. So, and we, we've only seen, like, a couple... No, 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 that's actually not true. We've seen, like, a bunch of people with cars. The fight scene with the with the mech, like, they have highways and shit. So I wonder if that's, like, even a thing, because Yang's now... No, 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 I'm sorry, I'm sorry, no, no, no. She was 17, she wasn't 16. Ruby was 15, everyone was two years older than her, so she was 17 when she... Oh, no, that's a good age. Like, you can get your motorcycle license at 17. You get your driver's permit for it at 15, and then at that point you can drive by yourself. So I take that back, I take that back. Um... Depending on how far back the chat is, you guys will be seeing the correction. So I'm pretty sure some people will mention it in the chat. Uh, myself. So yeah, uh, Oscar's going to Haven Academy, which is pretty great. And uh, we see a little bit of Ilya here, who seems... Uh, based on what Yang... I like how Ruby... When Ruby was talking, like, the particular things that Ruby said complemented the scene here. Like, um, I think she mentioned here that some people are still lost, still trying to find their way. Which kind of goes back to where, like, Blake was talking about, like, the faunus of the White Fang are just misguided. And maybe that could be very much Ilya's position. Maybe Ilya doesn't necessarily want to do this, but she's doing it because that's all she knows. Or she's being misguided based on, you know, the promises of being in the White Fang, similar to Blake. Uh, obviously, with Corsac and Fennec as well, obviously things are, are happening behind the scenes that we don't have enough context for yet. But, um... Hey, what's up, Fatal Blast? How's it going? Uh, just getting into the last bit of discussion for the Ruby Volume 4 uh, finale. <clears throat> oh, don't worry about it, Dan. At this point, you can just do whatever. Um, we're on like the latter half of the stream anyway. We're about three and a half hours in. Um, I don't see the stream going any longer than another hour. Uh, maybe another hour, maybe another hour, but I don't see it exceeding five hours, to be completely honest, based on the fact that I'm getting through these, like, 
like really quickly um cinder seems to be growing a lot more like she doesn't seem like she's struggling as much as she was before which again this all goes into like we're getting context of what's happening at different intervals at different points in time so this could be another week or so or another two weeks after you know the part that we saw of her struggling with the Beringle and the in the beowulf grim now she's actually using like fucking fire spin and shit and uh emerald and mercury are in on it too like they're in the mix of like helping her with her training uh emerald semblance still broken as fuck <laughs> like um and whatnot why does emerald know how ruby looks with her new outfit she doesn't um that was just a workaround for i feel like that was a workaround for rooster teeth because they would have had to create another another mo rigged model of ruby what she looked like in her volume one attire and i don't think that's possible to do as well because this is a new animation style this is a new animation program that they're kind of using initially so i feel like it was just for the sake of saving time and not wanting to really uh focus on you know needing to be super super prompt and uh i know a lot of people were complaining about it like how does she know that and some people were like well maybe Tyrion explained it to her it's like i highly doubt that but it from a technical standpoint i can see that it was just based on the fact that they they have the model of ruby already just use that who cares um it's not like it doesn't deter from the story or anything. It's in Salem's mind anyway, so it's not even real. So, um <clears throat> Yeah, they modeled in Maya to begin with, but they still would have to make up the make up the figure all over again. It's just it's like, well, we have what we have. Let's just work it work with that um and whatnot. I don't I don't really see a re and, and on top of that um no nah, i don't know i think it's just a it's something to nitpick at the end of the day it's very it's a very nitpick kind of thing because it's like well yeah but it's not done that way um i don't know i i brush it off because i realize well if it's from a technical standpoint someone didn't want to rig another model that's fine i really don't care because it doesn't affect the story it's not a plot hole in any drastic sense just because it's not, you know, it's just from a semblance perspective. We know what Ruby looks like before, and we know what Ruby looks like now. That's her outfit from Volume 4. We're still in Volume 4, and, you know, they're using the models of it. So, I don't really mind too much. <clears throat> hmm. Let's see. Yeah, and on top of that, too, there's a lot of moments in Ruby where there's, like, a mess-up during the initial release, and then it's fixed by, like, the Blu-ray DVD or by, like, the public release of the show, like, the YouTube version and stuff like that. So, um, that could very much well be a, uh, like, a first member's experience or an RT uh, site experience, and then maybe it'll get fixed on YouTube's end or the Blu-ray DVD version or whatever, if it, if it matters that much to go in and change it. So, um... <laughs> emerald follows ruby snapchat of course <laughs> or who knows like maybe maybe he did maybe she did um maybe Tyrion did explain like hey this is what she was wearing this is what she looks like because obviously to some extent she looks different so um i mean you you can't forget a face but she's not wearing the exact same clothes that you can just pick her out so easily um or what would be cool too is like you know how like people evolve their semblances uh Maybe now Sa Sa Salem, I'm sorry, maybe now Emerald could maybe control two minds a lot more easily than what she was able to do before. Because before she was like, one mind I can handle, but two is a stretch. Or, because her mind, her semblance is based on mental perception, perception of the mind. That'd be cool if she can like peer into the minds of another. That'd be kind of cool, because then that would explain... I'm not saying this is like a theory of explanation. I'm saying that'd be cool if it was the fact, and then that would explain... Like, maybe she could peer into, into Tyrion's mind and see what Ruby looked like to be able to make that replicated figure. Um, but I don't know. That's kind of cool. That'd be kind of cool to see. Um, what? Where was it confirmed, though, that Sa Salem... I'm sorry, that Neo is coming back? They confirmed it at the RTX Sydney Ruby panel that should still be up on Twitch.tv slash RTX Sydney. Or RTX Australia. 
Um, they, they, yeah, they did confirm. They didn't say when. They said she will be coming back. That's all they said. <clears throat> so, for those people who are just looking forward to Neo, I understand like Neo's appeal, but it's like I Neo really has like no substance to her as a character, other than the fact that she's like she looks adorable. You know what I mean? And she's based on Neapolitan ice cream, and to some extent has a history with Torchwick of how he recruited her. Um, not much that we, maybe it's, maybe that's the thing. Maybe it's the mystique of her character. That's why a lot of people like her. Cause I know a lot of people like Ozpin, like really we're into Ozpin liking him as a character when, it, when the show started. And it's like, well, we haven't, we, have, we don't know anything about this character. So, um, I think it's mainly like the, the fact that there's just a lot of mystique around of Neo. That's why I feel like, uh, she is so appealing to a lot of people. I will say this though. How many of you will be upset? Not upset, like, in the sense of, like, frustration or anger. But how many of you, I, I don't know, maybe disappointed or let down uh, if Neo started talking? Like, if Neo could talk. And I don't say Neo could talk like she can talk now. As far as we know, she doesn't talk. So, that's what I'm going with. Even if she has a confirmed voice actor, which I don't think they confirmed. Uh, even if she has a confirmed voice actor, she hasn't talked yet, so she can't talk until she does. <clears throat> You'd love it, really. I feel like the big appeal for um, I feel like the big appeal for Neo is the fact that she doesn't talk. Uh, she just reflects everything in her emo like in her body language. Like she smirks, she like moves her body around and stuff like that. And that is her. And she texts too. Like she was texting Roman when Ruby was on the on the airship. So <clears throat> you know, like I mentioned in a previous discussion, it's similar to the whole Kakashi thing. Like. Uh, Kishimoto didn't reveal Kakashi's, like, face, like, he always had the mask on, uh, like, the, the thing over his face, because th he thought, like, his face would have ruined the character for the show, like, people would have been like, oh, you should have left it the same, or he, he looks lame, or whatever, so he didn't reveal it until the show was over, after the fact, like, it wouldn't have mattered, because you wouldn't have seen it up until that point, so I can kind of see both sides of the spectrum of, some people are like her, some people don't, so... Neo is pulling a Celtie. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people were saying, too, like, it would be super fucking cool, and this isn't confirmed or anything, but, uh, uh, it would be cool if, like, if Rooster Teeth ever got, like, Casey to, to Casey Lee Williams, the girl who does the, the, the music for, for, like, the vocals for, for the soundtrack, if she did Neo's voice. That'd be super cool. Because I know, um, I did the interview thing with Jeff Williams on my channel, and, uh, like, we asked the question, like, would you ever voice act a character in Ruby? And he was like, yeah, absolutely, me and Casey would love to voice act, I think that would be awesome. And, um, I, I think that'd be super cool, like, they're both willing, Neo is one of, if not, Neo, I believe, is either one of, if not, Casey's favorite character. So that'd be super cool too, like that. And she's cosplayed as Neo too at a at a future at a past con, uh, at a past RTX or a past convention. So um, that'd be pretty cool to to see the voice the voice of the music of Ruby actually in the show. On top of that, have like a bigger role, a bigger part in the community than she already does. And um, that'd be pretty cool to see just overall. Yeah, I wish she can stay mute. Either way, I'm I'm fine with it. Either way, I think the 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 factor of the mute is uh just appeal is just a lot more appealing to her character. Uh, but I mean, how else are we gonna get a character story or a backstory, or whatever, if she doesn't speak up? You know, open your mouth, say something. <laughs> so, um, Miles mentioned that Neo is best girl. Uh, Michael. <laughs> You're welcome. Not a problem. Yeah, and then technically Neo would be the singer of the show because up until they revealed that Weiss was voiced by Kara Eberly, everyone thought that Casey's voice was. Um, and I noticed a lot of people say like Casey's voice doesn't match with Winter. I'm sorry, Weiss. And it's cool to say that now because back then that's what people thought her voice was. And then we found out about Weiss. And we found out the kind of character she was, and Kara did a really great job of portraying her character. That when we heard um, Casey singing. 
th during the concert because that was the music that she does. Um, people were like, some pe some people that I watch reaction videos for, they were like, her voice doesn't match the like the character, like the song, the vocals for the song didn't match the character that much because it was very clear that it was a different person. So. <clears throat> How many volumes will Ruby have? No clue. Uh, we only have speculations and ballpark estimates of like 20 volumes in terms... We have 20 volume, a number of 20 volumes in terms of uh, like outlining. You can probably condense those 20 volumes into 9 once you get into more concrete aspects of those volumes. But Monty did a lot of uh, prep work and planned a lot ahead into the uh, in, in the story. Miles and Carrie were with him every step of the way, so I feel like whatever they add to the story would still be canonical to what would have been in the show regardless, despite Monty not being the director. So, <clears throat> Ryan Whitney, how's it going, man? Sorry, I didn't. I haven't noticed you. There's a ton of there's 900 other people in here, and the chat goes from time to time, and I get lost in talk from time to time. So, uh, my bad if I haven't seen your you commenting throughout. But I hope all of you guys understand that that a lot of people in here I can't really pick and choose like individuals, especially when the chat's constantly going. <laughs> yes, please, no caps, guys. Uh, that's just a rule in the chat. <clears throat> but yeah, so, um, like, so Cinder's growing in terms of her, her fall maiden powers. Uh, what I'm wondering, Dark Lightheart, you have a good night. Thanks for sticking around in the stream. We're at three hours and 40 minutes, so if you ever want to come back and pick up where you left off, there you go, bud. You have a good night. Um, <clears throat> so, basically, uh, Cinder, I'm wondering why, though. Like, why did Amber have fire, lightning, wind, ice? You know, why did she have all Why did Cinder just opt in for fire? Is it because she got it through un, like con, like she didn't get it through normal means? Does she have to like unlock those powers as she becomes more comfortable with it? She would be a lot more deadlier if she if she had all of these elements at her disposal just instead of prioritizing fire or choosing to use fire. So um, so that's, that's something that I'm always wondering because even even like in this scene right here, like uh, like. Ruby's image is, is materialized in her mind, and then she just shoots her with, like, a fire blast. And it's like, okay, still going for the fire, I see. But, like, maybe she's because she hasn't mastered it, but that wouldn't make sense either, because Amber was the most inexperienced of the Four Maidens, and she was the youngest of the Four Maidens, and that's why she got taken out so easily. Um, I don't know. Maybe Salem... Maybe that's just Cinder's forte. Maybe that's just, like, the nature of what she prefers, and it seems like it's fitting the whole uh, Zuko... Fire Nation uh, thing that's going on. Like, she's got, like, a scarred eye. She uses fire. Uh, she's on a... You know, she wants to redeem herself after being embarrassed by, by Ruby. She's trying to reclaim her honor, essentially. Uh, I've seen a lot of that going around. <sighs> so, um... <clears throat> Yeah, Cinder, <laughs> Cinder is Zuko confirmed, essentially. <laughs> so, yeah, um, a lot of things are going on right now. I really hope we see Emerald and Mercury again, probably next volume. Uh, this wasn't really their moment. Th this was Cinder's moment to kind of recuperate, and because uh, she got blown off course, essentially, because she was supposed to go and meet the informant in Mistral, and because she got messed up by Ruby, she had to stay there, get treated back up, train as she did, and Watts went in her in her uh, went in her um, in her place, so uh, it's obvious that you know things are things probably got derailed for Cinder in the group. But I'm hoping that it comes back down with uh, <laughs> let it burn. Hopefully, it gets back uh, with all three of them being a core part of the story. And then we have Salem here, who's just like like yes, my plans like like like. I think his name is Emperor Palpatine's like good good like she's just this like her plans are just fucking falling into her lap and you know she basically is in control of a maiden which is probably something she's never had before so she has like a huge huge piece of like an advantage in this war with Ozpin 
and on top of that, looking for the relics, so... I can only fucking imagine, like, how, how things are gonna work towards the end with her, and, like, this whole plan. Like, right now, we didn't really get a forwarding of that plan, aside from learning about the relics, and that not only does Salem want the four maiden powers, but she also wants the four relic powers as well. And you just add all that shit together, and it's just, like, OP mega hacks, essentially. On a scale of 1 to 10, how bad would you want a Team Stark flashback? I'd probably say, like, 8. Uh, I'm not gonna be one to, like, beat down the door of Rooster Teeth and be like, Can we get one, please? Like, I'm not gonna demand one, but if we were to get one, I would not be disappointed in the slightest. I would be ecstatic. The reason why I'm not saying 10 is because it's like, if that doesn't ever end up happening, I can understand why. Like, um, but I expect to get one just based on the fact that there's, a, there's too much history with Team Stark to not venture down that path. And based on the fact that we got a flashback of Amber losing her maiden powers, and especially, like, the definitive factor is getting a flashback of Ren and Nora, and, like, a backstory of, like, their village and everything like that. I have no doubts in my mind that we will not, that I have no doubts in my mind, like, that we'll absolutely get one uh, for Team Stark in due time. It's just a matter of patience and a matter of execution like when is the best time to reveal it <clears throat> strike down use your anger it gives you strength <laughs> i'm not a big star wars fan but i do remember that scene and i do remember like that moment in particular um so we've got maiden silver eyes relics what next i don't know uh i don't know if there's any other crucial like concepts in the world like we have to start explore i feel like now we i feel like now's a good point to start exploring those like exploring those concepts because we got reference of the spring maiden but we don't know where she is we know of other relics but we've never seen them do they all look the same uh where are they all kept um and, and you know and things of that nature and they can't find like i think it's funny how cinder can't fi salem can't find the 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 beacon relic and then no one can find the Spring Maiden. So, like, they're both missing at this point, which is pretty funny. Yeah, um, uh, Jingya Sun, I just mentioned that. What I wonder what the relics do look like, because they're physical manifest, like, they're relics of these concepts, like knowledge and, and stuff like that, but in physical form. So, do they look like an artifact? Uh, you know what I mean? Like, what do they look like in particular? So, there was that. And then, like, this is where, like, the speech kind of comes to a close, necessarily, for Ruby. She's realizing, like, all of this trauma and stuff is kind of getting to her. It, within the letter, obviously, reflecting everything, saying how much she misses uh, her sister, and how she hopes Team uh, Ruby can get back together, and they, they finally made it. And this is kind of, like, one of the first times we actually really see her willingly give in to that emotion, not as a direct result of something tragic. Like, obviously, she cried when Penny died. Obviously, she cried when Pyrrha died. But this is based on, like, a reflection of everything that's happened to her. And I really loved seeing that. I was glad to actually finally get something of that level uh, for Ruby, because that's something that I've been hoping for a long time. And, uh, obviously, she sees Uncle Crow waking up, which was great. Um, you know, he's gonna be great, he's gonna be fine, like I said, he's gonna kinda derail Salem too, because, as far as they know, Salem, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, Salem and Tyrion think that he's dead, and they also think that Ozpin's dead, based on Cinder's report, so, um, them two, like, Ozpin and, and, um, Ozpin and, and, and Crow definitely have a lot of leverage to work with now, of, kind of, dealing with things from behind the shadows especially ozpin because he can he he has perfect coverage like maintaining his his uh his new identity but still being an influence with trying to do things from behind the scenes that way <laughs> <clears throat> relics infinity stone chess pieces checker pieces my little pony stars re uh, sonic crystals <laughs> yeah yeah thank god crow's still alive i'm really really happy that he didn't die especially um and he's still around so hopefully this isn't hopefully lightning doesn't strike twice like hopefully like okay he dodged a bullet now maybe i hope that doesn't mean like he dodged a bullet now but next time, next time he's in danger, he's actually going to die. Same thing with Ren and Nora. Like, I hope these close calls weren't, like, a factor of, okay, these are close calls. It would be too much of a coincidence if they continued having close calls. So the next dire, severe moment is going to be, like, where it actually happens. So, 
Uh, hopefully we still have Crow for for a while, and then right here too we get his Ozpin's Kane and Crow's stat. Um, blah, 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 blah. Let me rephrase that. Ozpin Kane, Crow's uh, uh, weapon as well, his scythe sword, gun, which is pretty sick. I really hope we get to see the scythe in the future, especially uh, just because he didn't use it during the fight with Tyr. <clears throat> Excuse me. He didn't use it in the fight with Tyrion just because the sword was opted more for a defensive stance of fighting, which I know a lot of people were giving me shit for in my reaction because I, I wanted to see the scythe so bad just for the sake that you'd have two people using scythes, like being badasses. But obviously, Crow is way more experienced than Ruby, and Ruby only has the scythe. It can't turn into another melee weapon, so. <clears throat> yeah, it is 11.20 p.m. right now for me we're probably gonna go on for i have 20 more screenshots to show so take that for however you will for how long we're gonna be talking about stuff afterwards just by the end credit scene and the post end credit scene and the songs and stuff like that like the soundtrack and shit but absolutely without a doubt thank you all for everyone who stuck around for this for uh, uh three hours and 48 minutes we have 882 people still in here, and I know we've we reached like really like we reached like the mid 90s, or or like the the mid to low 90s, uh, 900. Sorry. So um, absolutely thankful for all of you guys sticking through this with me, especially since it's the last volume. I know a lot of you guys want the opinions and uh, you know my thoughts on it and stuff like that, and this is the last kind of drop of Ruby proper that I'm really gonna be doing aside from my reaction afterward when that comes up later this weekend. Uh, until volume five so uh, definitely appreciate it and um this right here back to yang it was so cool to kind of see this moment too just to see like she's actually she actually looks pretty awesome like she's riding her bike and that the bottom scene was super cool too because that was when like she was making her decision and um initially i didn't really know which one she was going to take uh you guys kind of convinced me to really apply it like when i asked uh, last weekend, or the weekend, no, no, chapter 10, when Tai Yang asked, like, where are you going, and she was like, oh, maybe it was last week, I think it was last week, um, when Tai Yang asked, where are you going, and she said, and she didn't give an answer, it was like, okay, what is more, not valuable, but what is she prioritizing, her sister's safety, and being by her sister's side, or her mother, and getting answers, and trying to figure out that part of her, uh, a part of her past that she's always been wondering, and I, I should have I should have suspected Ruby a lot sooner, because there are a lot of songs that can infer like Ruby and Yang's relationship, like Gold, and uh, parts of All of Our All Our Days. Um, those two songs, if you if you kind of look at them a certain angle, you could definitely infer that parts of those songs are dedications of Yang always being there for her sister, always you know, standing by her side, and whenever she needs someone, she'll always be there, she'll protect her no matter what, she'll do no matter what, she'll do, like, anything for Ruby, so I kind of, probably, I, I should have, like, I'm really glad that she ended up going for Ruby at the end of the day, and I'm pretty sure she'll come across or cross paths with, um, she'll cross paths with Raven in the future, especially if she hangs around Crow, so, um, <clears throat> Hey, Nicolette Roman, how's it going? Thank you for joining. Uh, we're at the very, we're, up, we're we're towards the tail end of the stream, so. Yeah, and she also says, like, you're in so much trouble when I find you, like, because <laughs> you've gone through all of this shit, and you didn't listen to me, and when I find you, you have to pay for it, because you've had, you, you probably had Yang worried sick, honestly. So I'm pretty sure that's what she was referring to as well. But, um... <clears throat> <clears throat> oh, Spencer, you're heading out, dude. Well, thank you for sticking around. Uh, you're leaving at 3 hours and 51 minutes, so if you want to come back and wrap up the last ends of the stream after it's uploaded, be sure to do that. Um, thank you for the support, and you have a good night, man. But yeah, so, really glad to see Yang go that way. Let's talk about this scene, please. <laughs> Let's absolutely talk about this scene. So... We found out, uh, last week, actually, that Leo is the, uh, <laughs> that Leo is the name of the headmaster of Mistral Academy, and that, um, 
Like that was the hunt. That was the headmaster that we figured out about. I had initially thought that, like I theorized, and a lot of you guys were in the chat. I don't. Do you guys remember what chapter I said it in? I think it was chapter ten. I think it was during in between a ramble because I do want to find it and use it for a video. The fact that I theorized, I was like, I had it set up perfectly, like perfectly. I was like, okay. This is my theory. I, I theorized that Watts would have been the headmaster, and that would have been a great thing to like realize at the end of the volume. They they flipped the script on me and changed it around a bit, and I was like, fuck, I was so close. So I theorized. I was like, okay, if somehow everyone manages to make it to Mistral, a cool way to end the scene is that like they get to Mistral, and you see the you know you see the large mahogany desk, you see the tea set, you see. Um, you know, you see them entering, you know, whatever, like, if, 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 it was a different setup, too, like, Crow and them reaching the headmaster, because Crow knows the headmaster, and he goes in, and he's like, hey, we finally, me we finally made it, and it reveals that Watts would, was the headmaster, I, that was my setup for it, I thought that would have been crazy, because he knows he's the headmaster, and he knows that he would have been in line with Salem, but they don't know that, so that way, it would have been super cool to play the, play off this cat and mouse diversion of how much can they get away with with information to Salem before they realize that Watts is a villain but they flip the fucking script first off it's Professor Leo Lionheart so it's obviously a reference to the Cowardly Lion uh, from the Wizard of Oz and this is kind of like a, an ongoing theme when it comes to Ozpin and his close circle along with the uh, along with the headmasters you have Ozpin Ozpin is a me is, is referenced Ozpin is inspired by the Wizard of Oz, Wizard of Ozpin, obviously. Salem is uh, the Wicked Witch of the West, I think. I think that's think that's what it's called. Glinda's the Good Witch of the East, if I'm not mistaken. Um, Ironwood is the Tin Man. Crow is the Scarecrow, and Leo Lionheart is the Cowardly Lion. So that's like a super cool concept that Monty kind of instilled in the show since the beginning. Like ever since Ruby's Ruby is Red Riding Hood, Blake is Beauty and the Beast, Weiss is Snow White, Yang is Goldilocks, stuff like that. So um, I never applied like what perfect like what stance would the Cowardly Lion apply in the show? We know that. In the in in the in the story of the Wizard of Oz, the cowardly lion—he was just a coward. He he was just very scared of everything, and he never kind of went along with everybody else because he was always afraid of stuff. And I was like, how would they apply that in the show? Like, in, in, obviously, he was looking for courage in the in the uh, yeah in Zwei's Toto. Um, you know, in the Wizard of Oz, he was trying to find a way to get courage and be brave. Never thought in a million years that it would be it would be applied this way because. I was also mentioning, I was like, where the fuck is Watts? You know, Tyrion went to and from his target. Uh, Hazel is taking his sweet time getting there. Cinder's training. So what is Watts up to? And I thought to myself, I thought, well, that'd be kind of a good way of explaining it. Like, Watts is just going back to his post as, in, like, the headmaster. So, um, turns out that's not the case. Uh, I love how also the, the, the description of the, of the headmaster's office was similar to how it was described in Ospin's memory, like, um, it's autumn colored with a large mahogany desk, there's a table and chairs in the corner for guests, and a tea set that I gave him, that was Oscar talking, remember, like, that was Oscar playing off of the memory of Ospin when it came to describing the headmaster's office in Mistral, so I thought that was also pretty cool too, so that's the tea set that Ospin gave to him after he helped build the school, the large mahogany desk, I'm assuming, is the teacher's desk and it's autumn colored so it's very like brown and like the books complement that color too but we're fucked this volume because watts isn't the headmaster but i think <laughs> leo is the informant that he went to go see that cinder should have been here instead because granted whatever anything else and Watts mentions too, he was like, Salem always said that you were so hospitable. So I think the cowardly lion is selling out Ozpin's plans, Ozpin, the other headmasters, everything, probably is going to give up the relic to Salem in exchange for his well-being and his safety because he's afraid, he's, he's a coward. Um, complete game changer now. Because now you have like a double agent. You have a guy that's playing both sides. 
I'm pretty sure when Crow in that, cause, and this is that this it wasn't what I theorized, but this was still what I was hoping. I was still hoping for a dynamic of, um, I was still hoping a dynamic of like they know something, we know something that they don't know. You know what I mean? We know Watts is evil. We know now that we know that uh, Leo is the informant. So essentially, he's a bad guy right now. Obviously, he's. I'm pretty sure down the line he's gonna be like, "Yo, I didn't mean to. I just tried to do it for this, this, and that." And that's just gonna divide the the trust even more because then the fucking the fucking people who come together, you know, these four huntsmen, these four uh, headmasters, their goal is to protect the world, and you have one who's like, "Fuck that! I'm trying to save myself." So that kind of makes it even harder to trust people, and that's Salem's whole thing: dividing people, and you're dividing like the core people that are supposed to be down to protect humanity and mankind like fucking like it's so fucking spineless of him you know what i mean and um so we know that leo is crooked nobody else does we know that he's in alliance he's in alliance with watts by proxy salem probably is giving them information on uh, you know, Ozpin's plans, or, you know, what they have to offer, or what they can expect for protection, if they're just gonna come in, and just destroy the school, or maybe they're not gonna destroy the school, maybe they were only destroying the school in Beacon to get the relic, so maybe he's just gonna give them the relic, or tell them where it is, and, um, it's pretty fucked up, because now we're gonna have a very cat and mouse aspect of, we know that, Leo is evil, but Crow and them don't, so how much information are they going to spill? When are they going to realize that Leo isn't the good guy? Who's going to slip up first? Who's going to catch on to the other person first? And, um, you know, at that point, leave things up to there. And then on top of that, Watts. Does Watts have a reputation of himself? Does Crow know what Watts looks like? You know, he didn't know Tyrion, he didn't know Cinder at the time, he didn't know any of Cinder's accomplices, so uh, at the end of the day, that also plays a fact. That plays a factor in um, that just plays a major factor in no one knows who's who, so <laughs> at this point, it's probably gonna be up to, I, I wouldn't be, the only person that I feel like really has an edge is Ospin right now, because he is in the body of a kid, you know, and that will play to his strengths immensely, just because he is himself, you know what I mean, like, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if, like, especially, if, like, because Ospin knows Hazel from his past, I wouldn't be surprised if he knows Watts, if, if, uh, what's his name, if Oscar's, like, walking through Mistral and he sees Watts and, and, um, what's his name realizes that, like, Ospin realizes that, he could easily, like, eavesdrop or try to get information out of him as, you know, playing off as a kid and not being played off as, hey, I'm actually Ospin inside this kid, but you don't know that, so, um, so yeah, <laughs> Oh my god, he's in alliance with Watts. Wow, that was a stretch, dude. Jesus Christ. Hey, Arnold, I gotta go. My phone's about to die. I gotta finish my homework, too. Don't procrastinate, kids. Oh, man, I feel so bad for you. Well, we just reached four hours and one minute. And I just have the end credit scene to talk about now. So, essentially... Hold on a second. Give me one second. So, essentially, for the most part, the stream is done. Um... The stream is done for the most part. The end credit. I lost my fucking mind after the end credits. So first off, let's talk about the credits really quick. So in the credits, we got the full name of Arthur Watts, which is Watts' first name, Arthur Watts. Um, we got Arthur Watts. We got uh, Tyrion Cowles. I think that's how you pronounce it. Or Callows. Yeah, Callows. Uh, Tyrion Callows. Um, Hazel Reinhardt and Oscar Pine, like, those are the official names of these characters, didn't do any research for them in terms of inspirations yet, but those are the official names of the characters, so, if you guys want, you guys can go back to the, 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 the end credits, and check the credit scene out, see how it's spelled, and see if there's any derivatives for that, um, and then the song that was playing is Armed and Ready, which essentially is, like, Yang's new theme of, like, her bouncing, her, it's kind of like her rebirth theme, of, like, armed and ready for anything, and she's back on the horse, and she's back in the fight, um, after kind of bouncing back from her depression, and I think it's an incredibly uplifting song that anyone can apply 
for being down in the dumps, whether you're getting over, uh, you know, whether you feel like you're at your lowest low, um, I feel like that song can just uplift anybody, and I've been listening to it non-stop since it came out, someone uploaded the song to YouTube, so, um, absolutely, absolutely love the song, and then we got a couple of other songs that we're gonna be getting from what we heard in Volume 4, uh, um, This Life Is Mine, Let's Just Live, um, like, like Morning Follows Night, that's the song that was playing, uh, for Blake and Son during their episode, um, what else was playing? There was one song that was playing. It was playing during the scene with Ruby walking into the like the little room with Crow sleeping. It said it, it was like, "When I'm with you, I'm at home." Um, and like it was like like Casey was like humming and stuff like that. That song didn't have a name, so I was I was wondering. I was like, "What song is that?" They didn't credit that song in the credits. So. Um, so yeah, I mean, if, if, if that is a song, unless it was just a sample that they put for that one scene. So, um, is it called Home? Was that in the credits? I, didn't, I don't think I saw it in the credits. Love that song, too. I said to myself, too, I was like, that's how I feel when I watch Ruby. I feel so at home when I'm watching it. So, uh... <laughs> oh, Casey tweeted it. Okay, okay, okay. All right, all right. I was unaware of that. Yeah, cause it just wasn't in the it wasn't in the credits, and that was a song I was looking forward to as well. Alrighty, so Casey Lee Williams did tweet that out. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Um. So yeah, we get into the post credit scene. Always look forward to these because it's like they always give you like a little tidbit. Like last volume, it was a uh, crow turning into a crow. Volume two's was I think retconned at some point. So it's not really relevant. And then Volume 1's was, like, learning about Cinder, M, and Mercury and, like, the workings with, uh, working with Torchwick and stuff. But as the volumes have progressed, pro pro as the volumes have progressed, uh, the end credit scenes have been a lot more nitty-gritty of giving us stuff to get really hyped and look forward to. So, for those of you, for those of you who don't know, um, these two characters right here are the voices of Edward Elric, obviously Vic Mignogna being the voice for Crow, and Alphonse Elric, uh, from the original Full Metal Alchemist, not Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood. So, this is essentially Edward and Al having a conversation together from, I guess you can go back to the original because Vic Mignogna played Edward in both of those. So, super fucking cool, and the first thing you hear is, excuse me, and I lost it. I was like, it's Ozpin! Like, Ozpin and Crow are back, like... And that's, like, the thing, too, because, like, that uh, Crow's his right-hand man. So I was like, oh, my God, Ozpin and Crow are fucking back. And then he immediately <laughs> he immediately says, I don't think, you, you know, kids are supposed to be in here, Pipsqueak. And he called Ruby a Pipsqueak in Volume 1. And Pipsqueak is a, is a Full Metal Alchemist reference, which is, again, where their voice actors come from, where, like, n like Edward was really short, and he never liked people commenting or, or making fun of his height. So... Uh, and then, and then Alphonse was always in the suit of armor, which was taller than him. And then when they grew up, Alphonse was still taller than him. So I think it was kind of like reverse funny how <laughs> basically if, if I take it in the context that I'm trying to explain it, Edward is telling Alphonse that he's a pipsqueak and that he's short because the character that he's portraying in this show is short, but it's kind of like a, it's an internal reference for the voice actors for the show that they previously worked on, which was super fucking cool. I absolutely loved it. Um, but I thought that was super cool. And then he's like having a dialogue in his head with Ospin. He's like, I'm getting to it. And he's trying to talk to them. He's like, <laughs> I'm here to tell you that I want my cane back. And coming from, uh, coming from, uh, <laughs> like the face that he says to, he's like, uh, whatever the hell that means he's like i'm here to tell you uh i can i have my cane back and like just the response for like just the expression on both of them like oscar doesn't know what the fuck he's saying and i think at first Oz like crow didn't initially like wait what oh that's right so it's you you're back one thing that's confusing about this is was crow waiting for him you know what i mean like did they ever have a code where it was like if something ever happens to me, if I ever go missing, wait for me at this location. Because Ospin knew that he wasn't going to die. But obviously he had to link up with his right-hand man. So essentially, 
I'm wondering if they met here on purpose because why else would Crow? Why would Oscar come? I'm sorry. Why would Ospin lead Oscar to this random bar? You know, obviously Crow's at every bar. I'm assuming, but it seems like that they were meeting here, and um, that would also lead me to believe, based on how, based on how Crow responded, he was like, "It's good to see you again, Oz." Threw him his cane, and it opened up. Honestly, I'm not gonna lie. The second he grabbed the cane, I thought like, <laughs> I thought. Oz, Ozpin was gonna like assume control and just like you'll slowly see like Oscar transform into the Ozpin that we know. Uh, I thought something crazy like that was gonna happen, and the cr and the staff is like almost as big as he is, which is kind of crazy. But uh, yeah, he's basically like Crow's Crow's basically pre gaming. He's bar hopping essentially. But yeah, um, it was just it was just curious. I was really curious about did Crow know this? Maybe he wasn't expecting it. Maybe Ospin, Ospin was like, meet me here if I'm ever missing. And it'll eventually be clear. And then when he's like, can I have my cane back? No one knows about that cane aside from Crow. So if Ospin knew that, there had to have been like a previous arrangement for this meeting. There had to have been. It doesn't make sense. It, it just personally doesn't make sense to me. So, um... <laughs> he's at every bar. Yeah, so... And, and it was just the fact that also he was confused initially. He was like, oh, okay, so welcome back. Good to see you again. And I love how his staff extends. Like, at first it looks like, I was like, what the hell is that thing? I was like, oh, it's his staff. And then the second he grabs it, it extends and opens up. So, um, we don't know what the properties of that thing is either. You know what I mean? Like, we don't know how how Ozpin came to be in this situation. We know that he activated his uh, his his cane during the fight with Salem. I'm sorry, Cinder. And that was it. But we didn't see the aftermath of how she killed him or how he got out of there or how he died or how his his you know his his aura and semblance found their way to Oscar. So I don't know, there's there may be some special properties within the cane that we don't know about yet either. <clears throat> Yeah, and I was I'm still suspicious on it being one of the relics especially. So, um So yeah, I mean <laughs> Believe it or not guys, 4 hours and 10 minutes. It took us 4 hours and 10 minutes. A lot shorter than I thought. I was banking on 5 hours, so even when I, you know, even when I kind of go over the limit of what I think, I'm still never right. Usually I'm like, yeah, we'll probably be doing this stream for about two hours. That two hours turns to four hours. So then I go big. I'm like, five hours and it's four hours. <sighs> I'm exhausted. I'll be completely real with you guys. Oh my god. So I clocked in a total of 31 hours of Ruby Volume 4 discussing. So I essentially talked... <laughs> Nearly, uh, 24, 25 to 6 to 7 to 8 to 9, 31. A day and 7 hours. A full 24 hours day, and then 7 extra hours of talking about Ruby. Um, so essentially, if you gave me a day and 7 hours, I can discuss all of Ruby Volume 4 for you. <laughs> My fucking ass is killing me, by the way. I'm sitting in this chair for, like, hours every week. Oh my gosh. It's over, guys. It's done. Ruby Volume 4 is officially finished. Well, granted, it'll be officially finished once my reaction for it comes out, but in terms of my own input on it, it's over. It's done. Um, Nick Roca. Uh, yes, Red vs. Blue will be returning on my channel in, in, uh, in March, so you can look forward to that. I have a few other miscellaneous videos planned out as well, so... Um, like I mentioned, I'm going to be doing more streaming. I'm going to be doing some, like, bite-sized streaming. Like, I'll... If I ever stream, I'll probably try to set a standard, like, streaming for only two hours. Because I don't want to stream for too long and, like, forego any YouTube stuff that I want to do. But I also want to make my, my Twitch presence known for people who want to catch me streaming whatever games that I'm doing at the time. Like, I did a stream for Ruby Grimmy Clips. Uh, that stream is no longer on Twitch, but I have downloaded it. I'm editing through it now, and it will be put up on YouTube in the future, the near future. Um, hopefully after, hopefully next week. Uh, I'm going through six hours of footage, so I have to edit six hour video and then render it and then put it out. So that's going to take a while. And, um, like I'm going to be doing, I did, King, I did, uh, Ruby Grim Eclipse. I'm going to be currently playing through Final Fantasy 15. I'm on chapter three right now. Uh, going into chapter 4, and then uh, in April, I'm going to be doing Kingdom Hearts. So for any of you guys who are interested in Kingdom Hearts, want to check that out, that's what I'm going to be doing too. 
Uh, my Twitch username, for those of you who don't know, is twitch.tv slash murder of birds. Uh, my Ruby Chibi reactions, episode 21 through 24, will be uploaded next weekend. So, essentially, you guys will have one more Ruby thing to look forward to on a Saturday. Uh, this Saturday will be the end of Ruby proper. Next Saturday will essentially be the last primary Ruby thing on my channel. Um, aside from reactions and reviews until Volume 5 uh, in the fall and until Ruby Chibi in May. So, yes, Ruby Chibi will be coming back episodes 21, 22, 23, and 24 in one video. I put it off for a while, like I already mentioned it, but that's already been done. Um, that's going to be uploaded next weekend. Uh, like I said, Kingdom Hearts is going to be on my channel, twitch.tv slash murder of birds. If any of you guys aren't following me there, if you guys want, uh, you know, to set up a Twitch account, be sure to follow me there. You guys will get a notification whenever I stream. Um, and that's kind of the plans that I have for Twitch. Uh, YouTube is going to be red versus blue reactions, um, miscellaneous videos here and there, vlogs, especially, um, primarily after I get my PC, I'm definitely, I, I want to do, I'm going to change up my room setup. So I'm going to have like another room setup tour. Uh, I'm going to do like a PC setup, like when it show when I actually get all my PC stuff to kind of show the support that you guys helped in helping me get it. Uh, and then I have a lot of other things in between, um, between now and then, like I'll probably be doing a couple more play of the game Ruby videos, a couple Ruby short videos. Um, I kind of want to get into red versus blue discussions when I catch up a bit more so I don't get spoiled. So it's kind of unfortunate that I can't get into those as soon as I want to. Um... What tips can you give for an 18-year-old on their on his first RTX? Whew! Okay, so based on my first experience, bring water. A uh, lot of water. Like, leave it in your hotel, but always bring water with you. Probably two to three bottles, depending on how much you're going to be outside. Uh, it's super fucking hot in Austin, so you absolutely want to do that. Um, make sure you have, like, markers and stuff on you and anything you want to get signed because you don't have to go to, like, a, to, like, a signing to get, like, pictures with Miles or, or, or signings with Miles or Barbara or whoever. If you see them on the show floor, chances are they're going to stop, they're going to hug you, they're going to, you're going to get a picture with them, you're going to be able to sign stuff. I saw Barbara the day before RTX started. And I already had a signing with her, so I didn't really ask her to sign anything. I got a picture with her, and I got another picture with her when I saw her. But chances are, if you ever see someone on the floor, they're super awesome. They're super nice if you want to stop them and um, and whatnot for, for, like, pictures or whatever. So be sure to have, like, markers or if you have, like, your VIP badge if you want them to sign that. Uh, or if you have any, like, apparel that you want them to sign. I don't know if they'll sign anything, but I know they'll sign, like, a badge if it's on you. Uh, so there's that. Um, make sure you bring extra money with you, like, so, <laughs> I'm so thankful that I brought money, extra money with me, because, uh, like, I, I had money for me for RTX, and then that weekend I got paid, I got direct deposit paid too, so I had money with me, and then I had extra money, so the extra money really helped, because I, I kind of splurged when I went, to, when you go to the exhibit hall, you want to buy everything, you want to see everything, you want to buy everything, I went to the RT store, I prioritized most of my spending in the RT store, but you're going to want enough money if you want to go out to eat with, you know, fans or with friends, you're going to want money if you want to uh, buy stuff in the exhibit hall or anything like that, if it's, if it's for panels, you definitely want to get to your panel early. If you don't have a VIP badge, uh, I can't speak on experience because my first RTX, I had a VIP pass. But if you are to go to RTX and you don't have a pass, you'll probably want to line up at least, at least, least, like earliest two hours before that panel starts if it's very high demand. Like if you're trying to get into, I can't even tell you about like a, if you're trying to get into the RT podcast, good luck with that. <clears throat> because even VIP sold out like of seats for for that uh, for that panel last year. But if you're trying to get into like RVB, Ruby, um, if you're trying to get into any like high volume, like you know, like that's like the if that if like those panels are like the flagship panels of of RTX or of Rooster Teeth, definitely get there like hours in advance. Make friends, talk to people in line. I've made so many friends. I talked, I met Dakota, I met Dakota and Justin the day I got my VIP badge. And ever since those days, I was hanging out with them every single day. Justin was kind of like my, like, <laughs> my guide to like RTX because he had been a few times. And when I met him, 
I wanted to get a picture with Barbara, but I was like, I was like, I don't know, I don't want to bother her. And then he was like, he broke the ice. Like he went up to her and he was like, hey, there's someone that wants to meet you. And she turned around and I was there. And if you guys saw my vlog, you guys have probably seen it already. But talk to people. Like people are there for the exact same reasons as you. And I can't tell you, like I met Chelsea, who I talked to on Facebook. I'm sorry, uh, who I talked to on Twitter prior to going to RTX. Um, I talked to, so let's see, uh, I went out for lunch with Ray. Uh, Justin, Dakota, uh, Chelsea, Derek, and Cameron. Six of us met all of them there for the first time. We had lunch. We were just talking. Like, just talking about Ruby, and everyone was on the same page. Everyone knew exactly what they were talking about. Everyone knew... We were just so linked up together, and I, I, I don't have that in my real life. Like, I'll talk to my friend, like, I don't know, my friend Lewis, for example, I'd be like, hey, did you watch the latest Ruby episode? He'd be like, yeah. And it's always me that has to drive a conversation with any of my friends who aren't on, like, who, like, Ruby isn't, like, a core aspect of their life like it is me. So, like, usually I'll be like, hey, did you see that Ruby episode? Yeah, what's up? Oh, what did you think of it? Oh, I thought it was cool. And then that's the extent of our conversation. It's never, and then if I ever want to go nitty gritty, I know they don't, they're not invested like that. They just watch it and that's, and that's it. You know, they watch it and then they come back for next week and they don't linger on it. So it was really refreshing to actually, and that's with anything. Like if you're into that with RBB or Camp Camp or Chibi or whatever, like anything that you're into, there's someone that's just as in it as you when you go to RTX. And um, I, I felt that very much when I went out to eat with people, when I was just talking and conversing. My, meetup were, my meetups were awesome too. I met even more people. Like I met, um, I met almost too many people to count. Uh... At, at, at my meetups i did a couple of meetups too because there was just so many people who wanted to meet me and i met even more people like on the show floor like walking and passing i i i met more people in the in the convention center like walking by people like hey are you murder of birds hey i, I want a picture or i want you to sign something or i want a hug or something like that so it's all about the experience like rooster teeth yeah they might make a convention to make money they might make a convention because it's in demand but the, it's a social event it's a social event before anything. Same thing with the Ruby tug screenings. Like when I went to the tug screenings, I didn't go to the tug screenings because, oh, I'm not, I'm seeing, like everyone who went to the tug screenings had already seen Ruby. Like 95% of people who went to volumes one, two or three tug screening, they weren't paying to see Ruby for the first time. They were paying to meet other fans. And while RTX is like a big promotional marketing thing that makes Rooster Teeth probably a lot of money and it gets more and more people going every year, it's first and foremost, in my opinion, a social event where it's the one time of the year that all the fans can come together and mingle with one another and make friends. You know what I mean? Like, I'm so looking forward to making, to, to, to seeing more people and to relinking up with people that I met last year, hanging out with them more, going out to eat at more places, learning from my first RTX and everything else. So, um, that's absolutely probably like the best fact I can, the, the best thing I can say more than anything is make friends. Like, come outside of your comfort zone like you're with family you really are so um so yeah i mean <laughs> i kind of just went in right there but that 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 that's like rooster t rtx is like my home away from home now like i went there for the first time leaving felt was so heartbreaking it really was and i i i i really didn't want to leave and then when i got home i felt so depressed and then i just said to myself i'm gonna work harder on youtube and then I, you know, the support of everyone that I met at RTX is what allowed me to build up the motivation and the confidence to start my Patreon because I met people that changed my perception of my videos. I didn't see what they saw and they really showed me that when, you know, people talking to me about how my videos have changed their lives and how it helped them get through tough times and how it gives them something to look forward to every week. And, um... You know, I, I didn't think my reactions as, as very low quality as I kind of consider them to be, I didn't realize how much I was doing for the community. And again, it goes back to the whole Ruby's letter thing. Like I felt like I was making an impact on the world, my small world that I call the RT family. So, um, you know, the community motivated me based on how they responded to me being at RTX, helping me get there on top of that, like with the GoFundMe and everything. It, uh, it showed that I, I, I knew what I had to do to kind of fulfill this kind of goal that I wanted, which was make videos that people love, that I love making, and it's based on something that I'm passionate about, 
and people loved it, and it's turned into this, and I, I, I only hope for it to grow bigger and better as I come up with more ideas. Like, this was, it, this was a product of, how can I do bigger this year than I did last year? These live stream discussions were literally like, huh, I did live stream discussions, I never did live stream discussions, and I only did reactions last year, so what can I do to push the envelope? I don't want to just do reactions, so let me do live stream discussions, and you guys fucking loved it, and this is a staple, I'm doing this every year now. So, um... Essentially, you guys have become my fuel. Like, as long as you guys watch, as long as you guys support it, as long as you guys, as long as there's a demand for it, I will do it. You know, and not just based on the fact that you guys want it, but especially if it's something that lines up perfectly with what I want to do. So, um, so yeah, <sighs> but yeah, that's everything, guys. That is the live stream discussion and the full wrap up of Ruby Volume Four finale. Uh, thank you guys so much for the support, for everything that you guys have done for me in 2016, what you guys continue to do for me in 2017. Um, this isn't goodbye, I feel like I'm kind of like saying goodbye to everybody. <laughs> and, um, I, I just am super thankful that you guys gave me a chance, that you guys really cared about me to the point of wanting to see what I have to say on a weekly basis, wanting to be involved on the videos that I'm in. Um, wanting to take part in a discussion with me on a weekly basis, which is even crazier. It's fucking midnight right now <laughs> and everything else. And I, I, I absolutely love you guys for that. I love that you guys gave me this opportunity. And so far, it seems like it's, you guys are enjoying it. And I'm, I'm, I'm just really happy that you guys care about me that much to, 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 to kind of want to do all of this for me. And it's going to suck. It really is going to suck that. Volume four is done, and you know I, I I like it's just it's just it's like I'm leave it's like I'm it's like a it's like I'm leaving home essentially, you know Ruby is home to me you know when I'm around Ruby I feel comfortable I feel happy I feel at peace I feel at home, and it's gonna be kind of like the whole RTX thing where I left RTX and it felt so bittersweet but I knew next year same old same old same time same place and. It's going to be the same way for Ruby, and we got Ruby Chibi Season 2, so we're going to get a lot more awesome stuff, probably new, newer characters, a lot more funnier skits. I'm going to be getting back into RVB and kind of building up that same love of RVB that I have. Hopefully I, 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 uh, uh, hopefully I build the same amount of love and passion for RVB as I have for Ruby, because I know a lot of people you know, swear by the show, and they grew up with it, and it means a lot to the community, especially since that's where Rooster Teeth started without RVB. I think there would be no rooster teeth, you know? So, um... So, yeah. And I, I, you know, I mean, I know the majority of people. I know there are some people that will probably only come back to my channel when Ruby's around. And that's completely fine, you know what I mean? Like, I have no ill will for anyone. If, like, if Ruby is your fill, and I'm able to fulfill that for you, then I've done my job, and I will gladly see you next volume. I would gladly see you guys in any other videos that I do in between then, since that's a really long time to wait before we get more Ruby info. But... Um, especially for those who support me on Patreon, for those who help me on YouTube, who watch my videos and allow me to continue to do the same thing that I love doing every single day. It's a lot of work, you know, I spend hours, hours, I clipped 150, I didn't get to bed until 7.30 this morning clipping these, these, uh, these uh, thumbnails for this, for this live stream discussion, and then I spent probably another two hours putting them in here in the right manner that I was going to discuss the episode, uh, you know, I feel more, I feel a lot more ownership in what I do on YouTube, it's not just turn on a camera, press play, and watch Ruby, it's like a lot of effort is going into it, and I, I feel proud of my stuff, uh, pr I feel really proud of what I do now, and you guys have been a big part of that, and I just really want to show that appreciation in everything that I do, you know, uh, like I said, RVB will be coming back in March, uh, this weekend will be my reaction f for the finale of Ruby Volume 4, next weekend will be the reaction to Ruby Chibi episode 21 to 24, between this week, like the weekdays, during the weekdays, I will be streaming on my channel, twitch.tv slash murder of birds, I'll be playing a variety of different games, uh, primarily getting back into Final Fantasy, like I said, um, Kingdom Hearts in the future, and I eventually want to play, uh, Halo Master Chief Collection, all of the games in order with people, especially since I didn't play Halo 1 or 2, so if you guys want to be a part of that, twitch.tv slash murder of birds, where you can follow me, uh, follow me on Twitter, that's when I let people know that I'm streaming if it's not impromptu, and, um, 
other videos will be coming out in between. Uh, I still have a, two more RTX vlog videos, the last bit of videos that'll be going up. I have a few unboxing videos, a community video that I'm gonna get a lot of people involved in myself, Jake One Man Band, uh, that Kaito Dan, Muffin Man Dan. I have a lot of people in I have a lot of people in mind for this really awesome community video that I want that I want everyone to be a part of. But um Thank you for everybody else. Thank you guys all for watching the reactions, for watching the, you know, the live stream discussions, for being here live and everything else. It really does mean a lot to me. And I will see you guys around. I can't really say I'll see you later or I'll see you guys in volume 5 because I'll still be making content. It's just based on what you guys prefer to watch on my channel. And the door will always be open for you guys. Um, hope you guys have a good night because it is midnight. It is literally 12 p.m. 12 a.m. on the dot. Uh, so hopefully you guys, this stream's total, we totaled the stream at 4 hours, 27 minutes, and 57 seconds as of right now. So 2 minutes, I'm sorry, so 4 hours, 28 minutes as of right now. So 4 and a half hours on the stream, which was incredible. Half an hour short of what I was expecting. But, um, you guys all have a good night. Thank you guys so much for everything. Uh, I hope you enjoyed Ruby Volume 4 along with me. I can't wait till Volume 5. I can't wait for everything else in between. And, um, I will, guys, I will see you guys in the next video. I, I can, I can probably, def I can definitively say I'll see you in the next video because I'll still be making the videos. Uh, but thank you guys so much. Have a good night. Thank you guys for everything. I love you guys so much. And, uh, take care.